round. So he's going to be playing Fabiano in round one and round eight. And as predicted, uh, Karuana opens with one E4. And I, what, what do you expect to see here from Hikaru? Yeah, I think he's just going to open up with, uh, you know, the Berlin. It's what he always does. I would be shocked if he does anything else like the Sicilian or the Karakan. So, yeah, I think he'll just play. He'll just stick to his guns. Um, I would be surprised. Well, I mean, maybe a Petrov or something, but I think he's just going to play the Berlin. What do you think? Yep. Yeah, I was looking through Hikaru's opening repertoire recently and definitely he's been quite loyal to the move 1e5. Um, hasn't really veered off into too much. But in, as an alternative, I have noticed he has been playing the Khan Sicilian recently as well. Um, it would be surprising if he went for the Khan Sicilian. This is also something that Caruana likes to do as black. But it would be a lot of fun if he decided uh, to surprise us. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised why he's already spending time here on the very first move. Uh, and there we have e5 on the board. I guess there was just a little bit of delay. Uh, we see right now that, uh, um, yeah, he made the move with, you know, it says 159 and 53 seconds. So I guess it took a little bit of time for the move to come through. And here we have knight of c6. Uh, yeah, no surprises there. And what do you think Fabian is going to do? Is he going to go? Well, there we have our answer. And I'm sure yeah. Ikaru is going to go knight of six, just going to the Berlin. That's right. Yeah, that's what Hikaru has been, uh, has been doing recently, the Berlin. Um, yeah, so, so far the opening is quite predictable. Uh, and is Fabi going to castle here or what's the other move? They can play D3 to protect the pawn. Uh, good question. Yeah, we see D3 on the board. So now I expect Bishop C5 by Hikaru. And then uh, white has a lot of options. White can trade on C6, go into this line uh, and go for knight BD2. That line has become very fashionable. C3 is also quite a challenging line. So I think one of those two moves is what, uh, oh, he trades on C6. And actually, Fabiano did win a, a quick game here against uh, Hikaru in the Rev Chess Championship uh, a couple months ago. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that game. So what is the idea here for White? Just a castle? Um, play like Knight D2, Knight C4, uh, perhaps... Play B3, Benjamin, to attack this E5 pawn? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense as well. Um, and yeah, we have here to move Knight BD2. Bishop B6 by Hikaru stopping Knight of C4. Now here, I've had some games here from the white and from the black side. Uh, the main move here is Knight of B3. And black here has two options. You can go Bishop B6. Um, no, wait, actually, sorry. I believe the main move is short castles. Because now you attack the pawn on e5. The problem is if you take an e5 right away, black has queen d4 and wins the game because you hit f2 and you hit the knight. So black just wins a piece. And we see short castles on the board by Fabiano. So now black has to defend this pawn on e5. If you play knight at d7, white goes knight b3, hitting the bishop. And if you go here, knight g5. And one way or another, white will get um, the bishop right back and then have a slightly better structure. So that's why we see Hikaru going bishop to d6. Aha, uh -huh. so the bishop already moves back from c5, getting ready for that attack. And yeah, I mean, knight c4 at the moment's not so dangerous. Like, yeah, like I said, you know, this b3 plan seems pretty logical to me. Um, but he goes knight b3 anyway. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So what is this knight uh, doing on b3 at this point? I mean, does he want to prepare the move d4? Yeah, it's a good question. I guess d4 or knight a5. But yeah, as you mentioned, the move b3, uh, that's actually the main line. White is preparing knight a c4 or bishop b2. So I'm sure that this move knight b3 came as a surprise to Hikaru, and that's why he's uh, thinking in the current position. Um, so let's see what he's going to do. I would think, you know, you can castle here, mm -hmm. but you can also make a move like queen e7 and consider long oh. castles on the next move. Oh, well, that would be exciting. Actually, it's a very interesting plan, right? With long castles and just, you know, starting like h6, g5 and starting an attack on the king side with opposite sides castling. Yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, so let's see yeah. what he's going to do. I, I think actually there's a, you know, a pretty good chance he will play queen e7 because I mean, it's a very typical plan in these positions as well, right? So I don't think uh, you got to think too much out of the box to find it, but and it gives you know it gives block an option to play more aggressively than just playing castles. Um, knight b3, I have to say to me, it seems like 
Uh, it's a, you know, a slightly strange square for the knights. I mean, because, yeah, I guess you can put it on a5. And now that's why another move for black in this position is a5, just keeping the knight on b3. Um, hard to see what that knight is really doing there other than trying to like help the move d4 happen. Indeed. Yeah. And actually, I was just reminded by someone in the chat that I had three games against Ray Robson in this line. Uh, we played a blitz match uh, online. Um, and yeah, I think Ray did play this move knight to b3. I think it was his preparation. And so once again, yeah, black has a lot of options here. You can even, like, if you don't want to allow knight a5, you could go a5 yourself. But then I think d4 definitely becomes an option. So let's see what he's going to do. Of course, as we mentioned, he could go queen e7 and then go for long castles, but this is going to become pretty sharp. And with Fabian and his preparation, the question is if you want to go into that. Yeah, so knight b3 is not a novelty, right? And uh, in that case, so of course, Caruana has prepared this. Um, so what, what else can black do here? I mean, the other move is just castles, right? Right, yeah. Castle, but then, and there's maybe a pin with bishop g5. That's right, yeah, bishop yeah. g5 is something you definitely have to take into consideration. And it's not that easy to break the pin because you don't really want to go g5. So this will always be kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, there's always the move knight a5 as well. And you cannot play b6 because then you hang this pawn over here and you actually lose another pawn, so you pretty much lose the game. And so you would have to play this, but it's always difficult to get rid of this knight. So it's it's always a little bit uh, annoying. Yeah. So what? Okay. Let's try the move a five and try to see what is uh what is White's idea after that. A four probably. So, well, I <laughs> guess if a four now we might uh, just be completely fine if we take here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You double the pawns, make them capture away from the center, right? Okay. So not a four. Uh, there's this move, queen e1. It's a pretty right, unusual yeah. move. Yeah, I remember looking at someone like this, like black goes a4 and at a5, queen c8 perhaps, and queen c3 followed by knight c4. You're also hitting this. Uh, but maybe black is just fine after, say, knight d7, knight c4, d5 and, and f6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Yeah, that's actually a very nice point. We can play the move d5 comfortably. Because after CD, this defended, and now all of our pawns are nicely connected. Yeah, it's a quite nice how Black has straightened out the pawn structure here. I mean, it's still, I mean, I guess, yeah, D4, you kind of feel, I think, like White has some initiative there, but maybe nothing, nothing special. Yeah, D4 doesn't even really make any threats. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, we just cancel, and Black should be um, completely fine. And I also wanted to remind you guys that if you do have an Amazon Prime, make sure to throw it in. Uh, if you throw in your Prime, you will get Hikaru's opponents low on time. And whoa, we see Benjamin Bach throwing in the Prime. Throw in your Prime to get Fabi low on time. It always works, you guys. So yeah, make sure to keep those Primes coming. Yeah. Uh, okay. But yeah, what were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, let, let, so, let, let, so Hikaru is still thinking after night B3. Right, yeah. So we go take a look at some of the other games. We got some yes. interesting action in, uh, I noticed we have one Sicilian, that's Duda versus Report. Oh, this one is looking very original, uh, straight yeah. off the bat. So I always thought against uh, Taimanov right after knight c6 that mm -hmm. the move knight c3 is sort of automatic, right? Yeah. yeah. But Duda goes for something very original, Right, uh, like Bishop four, Never move five, and also before. indeed, and and also like in the candidate sermon, you would expect people to play solid, but the report just plays the time on of, which is also to me quite surprising. But yeah, we see yeah, but not, not too surprising. I mean, if there's one person you can sort of count on to play the Sicilian in this tournament, <laughs> right. it is reports. Um, you know, I've seen him in action a lot last month. He was playing in the Superbet Chess Classic in Romania, and uh, later on in. Poland and I mean his games are really kind of impressed me just with like how he's always you know doing the maximum to set up a fight right from the opening so um not super surprising here interesting that so Duda's concept with bishop f4 is like to to trade on c6 help black with the center and then go in for bishop d3 and I guess he wants to put the pawn on c4 
in these positions, right? C4, knight, C3 should be the idea. Yeah, I think so. Um, and by I'm the way, curious. there's the move queen f6, right? Oh, yeah, there is a move queen f6. Yeah, hitting the bishop and hitting the pawn over here. I guess we can always play a move like bishop c1, but it's kind of passive. Or queen c1. So maybe if Duda is in prayer, maybe he has some sort of sacrifice in mind, like, I don't know, like bishop here and knight d2. But mm -hmm. I don't know if this works out. Yeah, because the queen has a nice square on c3 in these positions, right? So it doesn't look like the worst version of black taking this b2 pawn. Right, yeah. I would actually um, think that, you know, queen f6 is must be a serious move for him because it's a very unusual opportunity that you get for this double attack. I mean, normally, of course, you yeah. can play, you know, you can play knight f6. I mean, it's not a bad move. Yeah. Oh. Right, yeah, I was wondering if knight f6, if there's ever the possibility of going e5 and break up the structure. Mm -hmm. um, because of knight e5, there's still bishop g3. So perhaps this is a possibility. Um, you could also consider going knight e7 to g6, but I'm having a hard time seeing how white is ever better here. To me, it looks like black should be completely fine. I mean, the structure is, seems very nice for black, and I don't really see any problems, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, normally in the Sicilian black is quite happy when he gets this chance to capture towards the center with the B pawn. And it's like, it's a fairly typical structure, but it seems like not, not, a very, not, not so dangerous for black at this point. And he has a lot of things to choose here. Yeah, actually, even the move E5, right? It's, uh, E5 is also leading to a very normal kind of pawn structure for black. Right. Uh, E5, knight of six, bishop E7, bishop E6. I mean... So I, the only issue for black here is actually which nice move to choose from. Mm -hmm. um, so shall yeah, we no, take a sure. look at another game? We also got, how about we take a look at Ding versus Nepo? Yeah, let's have a look at that one. So um, yeah, let's jump right in. So this is an opening I played in the in the World Cup with, with black. Uh, so C4. E5, G3, C6, Knight of 3, pawn E4. So Black wants to build a big center with a pawn coming to D5. So why place Knight of 3 first? Because it's a little bit awkward to defend this pawn. Because if you go D6 and you give up on the move D5. So E4, Knight E4, D5, takes, takes, Knight C2, Knight of 6, Knight C3, Queen E5, Bishop G2, Knight A6, uh, cancels, Bishop B7, Knight E3, Castles and a3. So Ding's plan is to go for a quick b4, bishop b2, hit the screen over here. And also at a3, you take out the move knight b4. So now queen c2 becomes an option to put a lot of pressure on the spawn on e4. Aha. Uh -huh. So he needs to think about, yeah, queen c2 literally threatens to just win the pawn, doesn't it? I mean, I suppose then there's like knight c5, b4, knight e6. Maybe black has some ideas of getting that knight to d4. Um, you definitely feel like it's trickier to play for black, right? Like if I if I would be having to play this position without any preparation, like I would feel a lot more comfortable playing with white, who has a lot more obvious ideas, right? There's b4, there's d3, and there's f4 in the position, right? So white has a lot of pawn breaks to choose from. Yeah. And and yeah, there's also the move queens to, to, to just try to go after this pawn on e4. So let's say black plays something passive, right? Like rook to e8. Um, you know, queen c2, bishop, bishop f8, bishop f8. But yeah. yeah, I kind of agree with what you said. It feels like white's position is more pleasant after b4, bishop b2. Yeah, I mean, because black is actually very fixed in their pawn structure, they don't have any choices. So the choices are are for white. I guess the one pawn break black can do in this position is like knight c7 and a5, right? From this, from the flank, it's the main one, but. You know, white's going to have these two fianchettoed bishops. Um, and it, I mean, I actually think this plan with f3 can, can be quite interesting at some point, right? Open up the open up the f file once your bishop is already fianchettoed on b2. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I think Nepo definitely has some uh, some problems to solve here, and he's going for his first real think of the game. Um, let's have a look. There's also the game between Rajabov and Ali Reza, and that one is looking. Very interesting right off the bat. We saw d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, d5, knight c3. 
And Black has a lot of solid options here, but Ali Reza, he's making his intentions very clear with DTX C4, E4, and B5. So what is your impression of this line? I always felt like this line is a little bit dubious for Black. Yeah, right. It's so it's it's become kind of popular. Um, so this line is called the uh, the Vienna variation, right? With this early, mm -hmm. early DC four, and so I mean the main move here what is uh, is Bishop B four, right? But this B five move has gotten quite popular. I mean, I kind of know about it because one of um, my opponents in the U.S. Championships, uh, Tata Abrahamian, I noticed that she plays this line for Black. Um, has, was playing it recently, actually, at the American Cup. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it is it is a bit dubious. And, you know, White's pawn structure is definitely going to be better after E5. So let's take a look at how the game has gone. Right, yeah. E5, knight E5, take the pawn over here. Black goes knight B6 to defend C4. It reminds me of the line Benjamin and the queen's gambit accepted, right? It's super similar. I mean, it... Uh, Oh, super, you mean yeah, this, this one. line? Yes, knight of three. Uh, no, no, not this one. Not, not actually, not this one. It's funny. Oh. <laughs> uh, knight of three, knight of six, and knight c3. Is it like, is it like, it's almost like the same thing. And knight c3. And what do we do here? A6, uh, a6 I six, believe. Yes, a6, e4, b5, this one. Yes. Right, but I thought that this line is, is good for black, right? Because you get yeah. some sort of botvinic, but your pawn is on a6 and not on c6. So mm -hmm. you can play c5 and one go later on. Yeah, but it's very similar because white plays like e5, knight d5, and the knight gets into d5 and like a4, and then white winds up winning the b5 pawn. So in terms of structure, it actually, yeah, it's actually very similar. Um, you know, e6, a, b, and knight b6 is like the main line in this position. Black just gives right. back that pawn. So how does that compare to what we're seeing? Let's let's take a look at that game again. Uh -huh. Yeah, so... Um... So E5, 95. Yeah, so he takes... wins back the pawn without having to play like A4, A6. Got it. So there's no no tension on mm -hmm. the A file here. Knight B6, Bishop B3, C6, Bishop 2 Bishop B7, and short castles. And yeah, so it's pretty interesting in this line. I know that White can also go for a quick Queen D2 and Queen F4 to try to launch some sort of attack on the king side. But you can also just bring out the bishops with Bishop B3 and Bishop B2. And I always thought that white's a bit better here. Once again, like black's uh, pawn structure is, uh, you know, not the greatest. Yeah. So okay. I mean, is, is I guess in these lines, maybe sometimes black sacks this c4 pawn in order to get the light squared bishop and light squared compensation. I would think that would be an idea, right? And so the bishop will probably go to b7. Uh, perhaps the knight wants to go to b4. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. probably a big idea. Transfer the knight over to d5. Um, and, you know, if you have a chance, you'd like to play c5, but, you know, that's going to require some work. So I think that's the general plan for black. Right. Um, yeah, so let's see. But actually, we uh, thanks, Kanoda, for the five gift to the community. Appreciate it. But let's have a look at Hikaru's game because we have more moves. Hikaru did play the move queen e7, and now knight e5 by Fabiano. So now is the big moment to decide, do we go long castles, mm. which might be the best move, but once again, we do uh, risk you know, running into Fabiano's preparation, or do we go for something more solid, like rook b8 first? Yeah, I really hope he goes for the long castle, because when I look at rook b8 and I just like look at the future of that rook not being able to move and the knight, getting to stand nicely <clears throat> on a5 forever no real attack i have to say that I, you know I, I i prefer the move castles long and take my chances with the opposite sides castling and you know giving white some chance to attack but also getting a chance to attack yourself yeah uh so let's see Hikaru so let's see if he castles let's let's just like uh, see how the game can develop so you're gonna uh castles queen side right you're gonna go like a3 mm -hmm. So it's not like your attack develops very fast because even when you go b4, you're not quite threatening. So let me go h6. Okay, let's say I go b4. Yeah, g5. g5. So I can imagine that a move like bishop 3 is always annoying because if you go a6, you give white a, a, a hook, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happens if we slide the king over? I yeah, mean, you know what's interesting is you have c4, exactly. Yes, the c4... Right, yeah. Threatening to this... win my bishop with c5 and queen a4. It's actually 
quite a dangerous looking this, situation. This looks extremely nasty. I mean, Queen A4 is coming, C5 is a big threat. So I think it's a wise decision that Hikaru just played Rook B8. Hmm. Uh, and we'll just get a, you know, a, a typical game here in the Berlin, you know, where white, black has the bishop pair. White has the slightly better and slightly more flexible pawn structure. But it's always going to be extremely solid for Black. And it seems that Fabiano is out of his preparation here, which to me is quite surprising. Because if you go for this line, right, if you go into the Berlin, this is all the main line with bishop c5. You trade on c6, knight bd2, bishop b6 is one of the main moves. So he had this idea with knight b3 and to go knight a5, but then to be out of prep after rook b8, once again, to me, feels uh, surprising. Yeah, so rook b8, I mean... I was also thinking that black has an idea to go maybe wants to, if he wants to get rid of the knight, maybe bishop d7 and b6. But, you know, then, then you push the knight towards attacking e5. So that's like a little bit less than ideal because you're taking away the d7 square from the black knight. Um, b3, like, let's try a move like b3. I mean, I know I've been pressing for white to try to fianchetto that bishop. So uh, why, why not do that here? So we yeah, so I guess we home. castle. Mm -hmm. Bishop b2 and knight d7, right? So black holds right. pawn. All right. So I guess, and I guess a knight c4 just have six, right? That's the setup. Yeah, I agree. I think this looks uh, perfectly solid for black. We can always, once again, try to go for the move b5 mm -hmm. to uh, sort of fix our structure on the queen side in case white were to take. So yeah, black is generally extremely solid here. And if they go back to a5, how are we defending that pawn? Is like rook b6? Uh, yeah. And, and here you have to be careful because bishop b4 could trap your knight. Yeah, the rook on b6 is very unusual. But I guess if you have that idea of bishop b4, it all uh, makes sense. And yeah, you can go c5 at some point. You can actually kind of open that rook on the sixth rank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK, rook b8, I think, you know, uh, good practical decision, right? It's a much safer move, right? So I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the points of that uh, more as we go along. So, yeah, I mean, it, it looks yeah. better than the line we looked at where Black was getting mated in a couple of moves. Indeed, yeah. So I like this, uh, I like this option much more, and especially given the fact that Fabiano now seems to be out of prep. Uh, but I'm, you know, sort of wondering, like, what the point is of Queen E7 compared to Castle. Let's say castle in. Yeah. Right. And then root b8. Yeah. Is there a difference? Yeah, it doesn't feel like there is a big difference, right? Um, hmm. yeah. yeah. Doesn't doesn't yeah. feel like there's a big difference. I don't know. Uh, but queen e7, the, uh, the thing is queen e7 stands well though. That's it's a very normal square for the queen. And maybe, you know, maybe he wasn't entirely sure. I don't know when he, but it, he did play rook b8 pretty quickly, right? After yeah, after a, a little bit of thought, but Hikaru has already spent 17 minutes, so I definitely think he's out of prep. And uh, we got a question from someone in the chat. Why do we think that Fabiano is out of prep? Well, he was making all of his moves in like 10 seconds or so, but now he's already going for a real thing. He's already spending like four minutes or so on this move. So I think he's definitely out of, uh, out of prep here. Yeah, and it's very, very important psychologically to... Um, to take your opponent out of their preparation, right? Especially, you know, I mean, it's very clear when someone plays quickly that they're in their preparation and Hikaru knows that. So the first time they start thinking, you feel like a psychological victory, right, Benjamin? Like, good, now we're playing on equal terms. Right, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. It's always super annoying when your opponent is just, you know, blitzing out their prep. Uh, so it's definitely always a bit of a relief when, he, when your opponent doesn't, you know, blitz out anymore. And uh, yeah. As you said, you feel like you're on equal terms. You're not facing a computer anymore, but you. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. So so important to get to that moment. You finally slow them down and get make them take their first think of the game. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So basically, I think we understand uh, how this game might develop and how you know White's main ideas. Does White have any ideas of trying to like get this move f4 in, or is this, or is this too, too difficult? Um, huh. Well, like. I think so yeah yeah let's uh, actually let's okay so well, let's say we play um, you know what i'm curious about like let knight c4 knight d7 knight g5 what about that line oh okay this is interesting too and then oh, sorry knight 
Oh Wait, wait so, sorry. What did you say, knight? Knight uh, c4. Yeah, knight c4. c4. Although oh, I'm blundering here, a pawn here. Yeah, I'm blundering a pawn. Yeah. That's why we were preparing it with b3. Uh huh. Right, right. So you could go b3 and here knight c4. Knight c4, knight d7, and then maybe knight g5. Is that possible? Yeah, because here you. Although I think with black, black generally is always fine if he trades on c4. And in such a structure, like let's say we go f6, the knight jumps back, and let's say b5. I think black is generally doing pretty uh, pretty fine here in these uh, positions. But also I wanted to to just let everyone know in the chat, like if you guys have any questions about any of the games or you know about any of the players, feel free to post them in the chat and we'll try to address as many questions as possible. Yeah, like for example, there is a great question. Did Hikaru pre prepare a loan for this tournament or does he have a second now? That would be really interesting. I don't know if we have the answer to that question, Benjamin. You have any insight on that? Uh, well, I'm pretty sure he didn't prepare a loan. I mean, he's always had uh, Chris Liljohn as his longtime second. I don't know who else is on his team, but um, yeah, um, I, I'm sure he has seconds. Did anyone travel with him to Spain? I don't know. I think the players generally try to keep this uh, very, uh, very secret. Because, for example, Magnus had that... Uh, team of seconds that he sent to Thailand. Yeah. And I think Jordan in an interview said that at some point he and Dubov went out to eat and they were, uh, you know, just very careful that no one could, uh, could see them. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it, there, it, there is a point to be kind of secretive about who is helping you. Right. So it's makes right. it a little, a little bit, um, I mean, we would like to know, right. Cause it's actually very interesting information for, you know, the fans and the, and the, uh, the commentators, but um, but for the players, there's an incentive to not to reveal this kind of stuff because it gives away quite a bit of information. So, you know, maybe we'll find out along the way and we will let you guys know. Um, mm -hmm. So let's, uh, yeah, I agree with you, Benjamin, about this position. Um, I was a little sad to give up the light squared bishop in that line, you know, but oh, um, but you managed to navigate to, I think, <laughs> a pretty pretty solid position for black. Indeed. And yeah, white also has the move knight g5 to hit the bishop, but I think we always just go bishop g4. And white probably just has to retreat because if you go queen e1, there, well, there first of all, there's bishop b4, but h6. also h6, yeah. and you'll have to weaken your pawn structure and your uh, king side. But yeah, a very good example of why you want to keep your second secret is, for example, that on Magnus's, on Magnus's team is uh, Jan Gustafsson. And Jan Gustafsson, he's a big expert in the martial defense. So, um, like, by having him on his team, the, like, if people know he's on his team, people might think, like, hey, Magnus might play the marshal. Right? Yeah, or I thought he would, you know, uh, he would just be there to keep up Magnus' spirits, you know, because he has a great right. sense of humor, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So, yeah, sometimes, you know, you want to keep your seconds, uh, you want to keep your second secret because you might take over their openings, right? Yeah, that is right. Yes. Okay. So shall we go take a look, a little tour through the other games, Benjamin? I see some development in Duda versus Reports, and that's Sicilian. Mm -hmm. um, right. And White did play C4. I mean, actually, not a ton of development. You know, it's interesting. He played 97. I didn't think this was the most likely move, uh, but you mentioned it, and it, it got played. Um, it's like, so he's taking longer to develop the knight. So... Why, what is the advantage of this knight on e7 compared to f6? Just to, like, not walk into e5? Uh, yeah, I guess that's his point. But also, I feel like the knight on g6 would be sitting pretty nicely, and it's hitting the bishop. Uh, so c4, which signals that Duda is also out of his uh, prep. Because he spent, like, um, he spent a lot of time here. Yeah, so it's a very typical move. I mean... Knight g6, where is this bishop going to go? I guess I would say put him on e3 because we know that at some point black can put a pawn on e5, so there's no point keeping the bishop staring into it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in a way, you know, knight e7, well, you know, report is always going for this maximum complexity, right? So I can't say right. that like, I feel like this move is like, was clearly the best for black, but there is, mm -hmm. um, but you know, but it does, you know, leave more tension in the position, I guess. I mean, I, I'm a little concerned, to be honest, about putting that knight on g6, like, because where is it going to go after that? Like, if you go to e5, eventually you run into f4. If you leave it on g6, he's not that amazing from that square. So mm -hmm. uh, what other concepts does he have? I mean, I guess, okay, well, 
Oh, C5, C5, Knight C6. That's an interesting one. Oh, that one. Yeah, that's also. Yeah. Yeah. Positionally, that one makes makes more sense, right? Yeah, I think so. The knight is sitting very nicely on a C6 square. Could always go to D4, which be seven uh, as an extra black. And yeah, I don't think black really has anything to worry about here. Um, so, um, but then I could also go to G6. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, so, right? So he has two directions. He has two directions. Like I like to make little bets, Benjamin. I'm going to bet that he's going to go for C6. One dollar bet. Do you want to mm -hmm. uh, do you want to take the other sure, side? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I'm not actually going to take your dollar. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll bet a dollar that he's going to knight G6 then. There we go. There we go. Okay. Some suspense um, in store. Okay, so big. That's the that's Black's main decision, basically, which way he's going with his uh, with his knight. And now, sh shall we take a look at the game of Rajaba Ferruzio? Uh, yeah, let's have a look there. All right. So um, after Black castled, Rajaba went knight c three, rook b eight, and a three. So I wonder up to what point. Ferruja was in his preparation. Maybe it was up to this move. Right now he has 152 on the clock. Uh, he plays knight a5, but he's still playing pretty uh, pretty quickly. Ferruja is generally quite well prepared in the opening, right? It's hard to see him like with, with less time than his opponents. Um, so he went, ah, so Rajabov played a3 to stop this, uh, stop this knight b4 stuff. And right. the only problem is it weakens, yeah, it weakens the uh, B, B3 square a little bit. So Ferruzia mm -hmm. wants to go there, and that can actually help him play C5, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that makes sense. So what is White doing with this rook? Uh -huh. So it's going queen C2, rook AD1. That's the right way uh, to position that rook, at least it's somewhat productive. Mm -hmm. And now the question for Black is... How does he get the c5 move in? I mean, queen, queen e8 is there. Well, yeah, that move isn't great because it even allows like knight g5 ideas. You've got to watch out for your for your king side. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. I guess Blake generally, you know, uh, waits with an ib3 move because as we see, it kind of helps white, right? And, and for the moment, Black is really defending the pawn on c4. So maybe just bishop b7, you know, play on the light squares. A move like rook 81 is possible for white. And yeah, I would feel that maybe white is still a tiny bit better. Black is probably fine. Um, and I'm very curious whether, do you think Farouge is still in his preparation or not? Ah, uh, well, I, mean, I would say probably not. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there would be probably not so much reason for him to burn those eight minutes. Um, if he was, uh, if he was still in his preparation, they're actually playing without an increment uh, for most of the game. Did you know that Benjamin? There's a little bit of a specific time control here that maybe we should mention. Yeah. Um, the games can go on for a really long time, guys. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say there's a chance that we're going to see games that go on for longer than six hours with the time control that they have. So it is 120 minutes, so two hours for 40 moves. That mm -hmm. used to be the standard, you know, time control years ago. And normally these days we play with something called increments, right? Where you get like 30 seconds per move after every move, but they're not getting their 30 second increment until the very end of the game, right? Super right. unusual. They're only getting it on move 61. So if they reach the end game, they start getting 30 seconds per move once they have uh, they're in that final part where they also have 15 minutes. So after the first time control, there's a second time control. Then they get an extra hour for the next 20 moves, also without the increments. And so the increment kicks in in the third time control. It is quite an interesting idea. Uh, I guess it will make from interesting time scrambles as uh, players try to reach the time control and move 40 and move 60. Um, but the games can potentially go for a really long time here. Yeah, no, for sure. And yeah, as you mentioned, it's quite unusual these days that there's no increment, you know, only so far into the game. But yeah, the very first, uh, the first 40 moves can can take 40, can take four hours. Then to move 60, it's another uh, two hours, right? And mm -hmm. then the final time control. So we could be here for, for seven hours. So yeah, guys, uh, you know, make sure, make sure you're ready for that. Yeah. 
That's right. Um, so, by the way, maybe we should talk a little bit about the prize fund in this tournament. We haven't mentioned that. Prize, the first prize is 48,000 euros and a chance to play Magnus Carlsen. Although I would say there is some suspense now about the second place in this tournament, right? Because normally, you know, everyone who finishes in second place is very disappointed. But, you know, since Magnus has been talking about not playing um, in the World Championship anymore, uh, the second uh, place player would actually be playing that match against the person who finishes first for the world championship title. So, you know, the players kind of have that hanging over them as well, right, Benjamin? I mean, it's not an irrelevant factor and it's quite unusual to have the world champion say that he might not be playing, you know, the winner of this tournament. Indeed. And um, yeah, so if you come in second place, you still do have a chance to play the world championship match. However, Fabiana mentioned in an interview that, you know, you could be lucky, but it's not something you want to aim for. Yes. Uh, but also, I wanted to point out real quick. Uh, so the first prize is 48,000 euros, but the players also get 7,000 euros or 3,500 euros for every half point. So let's mm -hmm. say you come in first place with nine points out of 14 games, you do end up winning something like 110,000 uh, euros. Okay, so that's, that's much yeah. better because, you know, uh, that's a right. very important point because honestly, I was like, yeah, what uh, is this price fund? Yeah. Situation so bad. I know things are getting yeah. bad in the economy, but like forty-eight thousand euros for this tournament is not a lot of money. I mean, that's fourteen rounds of play, so much preparation. It's really the most serious tournament of the year. So I do think the players deserve um, a nice big prize fund. And mm -hmm, we got Rajabov sure. playing Queen C two, um, and so yeah, Bishop B seven or or Knight D five, right? So. 95 actually puts some ideas of taking the bishop on e3 on the board. Actually, mm -hmm. it's a much more specific move, right? So, like, yeah, what happens after knight d5? It's a good question. Yeah, like, how do we deal with the threat on the bishop on e3? Um, if we take, I guess, black, you know, could even consider taking with the e pawn. Mm -hmm. Once again, this pawn on b2 is quite weak, and I feel like black should be doing fine, especially if we can get bishop e6, queen e7, and bishop f5 in. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, just to come back to your, what you said earlier, we do have a command. Uh, it's the biggest prize one, and the candidates, the winner gets to play uh, a 14-game match for the World Championship, and then there's all the, the prize money that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course, the main prize is the prize that you're getting in the World Championship. That is going to come after this tournament, right? So, of course, the players are very motivated. Um and yeah, I mean, taking on D5 uh, definitely helps bla uh, black out, right? I can say his, his pawn structure is improved. The B file plays beautiful. So white, like, let's say white just, um, well, yeah, he can move the bishop away. Oh, we have a little bit of action. Should we go? Yeah, okay, I agree. I agree. Let's, let's take a look at Hikaru's game. Wow. I would say that's a lot of action. Like he basically... Is going for the kingside play and without having castle to queenside, so that is really aggressive. Let's let's see the last couple of moves, Benjamin. So after knight a five, rook b eight. Uh, do you hear me, Benjamin? Hmm. Oh, oh okay. guys. Uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, my, um, um, my, um, what was I gonna say? We were just uh, talking my about my headphones how... just died, so I have to uh, get something else real quick. But yeah, yeah we so... do have more moves here in this game between Hikaru and Fabiano. After Bishop G five, he played H six, Bishop four G five, and knight D seven to defend this pawn over here. Yeah. So this has been. Wait, what? Did anything happen? Uh, yeah, it's funny because, okay, I'll talk a little bit, guys, about this position while Benjamin fixes the headphones issue. I mean, I do find this to be a super interesting development, right? Yeah. Because Black, uh, it shows him like a really aggressive plan. Um, and the king is just being left in the center, but the center for the moment is closed. Now, we know there is a rule in chess that when the opponent's king is in the center, 
open the center. And the best way to react to an attack on the side of the board is to open the center. So I guess from White's point of view, uh, what that means is that the move D4 should be considered, right? Because that's the main way the center is opening up. Now on, like, yeah, I mean, that would be actually the first move I'd be looking here for white. Can you go D4? It makes a very specific threat to the pawn on E5. Um, and, you know, if black takes that pawn, then your queen comes to D4, attacking the rook on H8. Even knight takes D4 would actually be quite nice, right? So I think D4 is like a really major idea. Now, it's interesting, uh, what will black do on that move? Now, F6 is something that comes to mind. Maybe you just need to support the e5 pawn, um, hold the center as it is. The move d5 seems not so dangerous because then you can just take it and then move your bishop away. So d4, f6. And if they take, I suppose you could take with the pawn. One of the nice points for black on the move d4 is that the white can no longer bring their knight to c4, right? Because the pawn's not protecting it. So, I, you know, fortunately, for Hikaru, I think, you know, he's got that decent option. There might be others, but you can't really ignore the move D4, right? You can't answer it with like G4 because they simply take your pawn on E5. So, so I think this F6 move is what he's counting on. Um, incidentally, he just moved back his knight, right? So uh, knight D7, let me just check that out, was his last move. And he probably is, in fact, doing it to prepare for d4, right? Like, what, what are the points are there of the move knight d7? I mean, also to prepare h5, actually. So, um, yeah, h5 is coming up on the board. Certainly, black wants to pressure that bishop on g3. It's a really typical idea. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Hikaru has chosen a really interesting plan to, uh, to create a fighting game. So yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I'm on board with this idea. It's a little risky, like I said, you know, because the king is get getting left in the center, but it's also very interesting. And perhaps even the knight on a5 can sort of be left out of play if if things uh, start, you know, taking place on the king side. Benjamin, are yeah. you back? Yeah, no, I totally agree with everything uh, you just said there. So yeah, I think maybe Hikaru can go for h5, h4 in this position. Um, but let's see what Fabiano, what, what do you think Fabiano can do in the meantime? I think there might be two ideas. One is to go C3 and D4 in case Black goes H5 uh, to go for this. You could also go, but to go somewhere like Knight D2 to be able to go F3 and Bishop F2. Because actually Bishop F2 will be pretty annoying because you don't have an easy way to defend this pawn. Oh, you don't, but you don't, thankfully you don't have to defend it. Because they can't take it, right? Because you go rook eight, oh, true. And then you win the bishop. True. Like, let's say we castle, for example, and then rook a8, or even easier would be uh, bishop c5 check. And we would win the knight in the end. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I was pointing out, Benjamin, that I think like a really key point is that if white tries to open the center right away with d4, I think black is relying on this move f6. To hold things together mm -hmm. like if they play d4 immediately without any like c3 preparation uh, right because oh. that, that would be the move that i would be thinking about um yeah d4. that's a very good point yeah what do we do after d4 maybe just f6 i like that idea because there's nothing like if white takes it doesn't really concern us we just recapture yeah. If white goes d5, that also doesn't concern us. We just trade and go bishop f5 or f7 or g4. I think either way, black is completely fine. Um, so I think we're going to see a very fighting game early on here. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely, I think Hikaru, with this decision, is setting up like a good fight, right? Because there's once this is a situation on the board, once there's like, the expansion on the king side, the black king in the center, like white is really forced to do something, right? There's no, um, it's not, not going to be like a quiet maneuvering game at this point. So the fight is going to start very soon. For sure. Yeah. Um, Which is good for yeah, us. I, 
Yeah, no, but I do think that Fabian has got to go for d4 at some point. Yep. So let's say let's see how he's got to do it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I really like this move f6, you know, because it just keeps everything closed, right? Black has like black is very good centralization here. If you notice, like all the pieces are just uh you know planted right in the center, this little square from d7, e7, e6, d6, right? It gives him quite good control. He's got the two bishops, which is also nice. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so far in these close positions, you know, you can't really feel the power of the bishops, but that can change. And the knight on a5 is a little separated from white's army. That's also something to notice. And so if white runs out of ways to open the position, then I, I'm going to I'm going to start preferring black. Yeah. So I, I also had another idea. What if white goes knight c4? Because I think trading here doesn't, I mean, it's an option though, because actually the bishop on g3 is still kind of bad and we can still go for h5 so that's definitely an idea or mm -hmm. do we go for f6 to just yeah keep the structure because once again this trade doesn't really concern us it, it actually fixes our structure yeah so there they have this move 93 that we need to take a look at and figure out like how much of a problem is it that this f5 square is a bit weak right um Instead yeah so maybe 93 93 Oh, so, by the way, one of the chatters is saying that Duda already has a pretty big advantage here. Do you want to maybe have a quick look at that game? All right, let's do it. So, Rapport, we both lose a dollar, but we're not going to give it to the chat. Are you serious? Uh, Duda, oh, wow. Well, well, I think it's really six. hilarious because you see how difficult it is to predict his moves, right? I, I've, I've noticed this. Like, I can never predict any of his moves. I don't even know why I tried. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did not expect the move G6 to me. It looks, I mean, I guess he wants to go Bishop G7, then maybe go for C5, Knight C6 later on. But I think one of the chatters was saying that C5 could be a very strong move here for white. But the idea being that, I guess, if black takes, Bishop E5 is annoying. And look at, this looks gross, because how do you even get rid of this Bishop on E5? Like, let's say I go here, Castles, this, I mean, oh, you know, this is so, so terrible bad. for black, you know, especially the knight on e7, right? Just makes it such a bad impression. And the bishop on c8. Yeah, this is not going to happen, but this would be a dream for white. Right. But then the question is, what does black do after c5? You could yeah, play. So you can try d5. At least the pawn structure looks a little better. Bishop e5 still looks quite annoying. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Because um, you know, let's say you go here, yeah, let's say you go knight c3. Yeah, it's really bad. I mean, yeah, it doesn't look like fun for black at all. I mean, white just has yeah. such easy play, right? So I think, yes, yeah, c5, is he still thinking about it? He is, yeah? I mean, it's not a very difficult move to find in a way because it's literally like a two-move calculation based on this e5 square. Yeah, and oh. he has just played the move c4, so he might... Well, there's one question. Like, there is the move queen a5, but then I would think maybe just go knight d2. And if black takes knight c4 or rook c1, rook there's got to be... Yeah. All the moves come in with rook tempo, c1, maybe think. there's queen b4, but even then you have a lot of moves, right? Like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the yeah. knight c4 idea is quite powerful here. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so there is, yeah, you're right. Of course, there's queen a5 needs to be evaluated, right? Because other than that, it's like a very easy move to play. But even this, like, actually, if you just count the development, it's also not that hard to go for this, right? I mean, this level of development advantage for like a one pawn sacrifice, uh, usually, you know, top players are not going to hesitate about that. Yeah. What are you guys thinking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's see uh, what's going to happen. But yeah, c5 looks very tempting here. Let's see whether he will go for it. Um, what we do there have is this line that we can look at, right? So that like uh, I saw the computer mentioning this one. So c5, d5, bishop e5, and this very strange move, d takes e4. Yeah, I mean, uh, not so obvious, right? Like hanging your rook on h8. Like what mm -hmm. is that about? Like so, bishop takes h8. Where is the compensation? Well, that is a good question, but I guess the point is that. If white recaptures, now black can trade and go rook g8 and then followed up by quick knight d5. And this pawn on c5 is also a bit of a weakness. 
Right, and then the difference is that, you know, if y goes 92 first, let's say, then black is signed to bishop g7. Yeah, now that's much more reasonable, yeah, if black can get but to g7. But let's have a look at that line that you mentioned, right? So let's say black takes an e4, we take an h8, and how do you take on d3 with a pawn or with a queen? Uh, okay, well, I mean, let's try the pawn. Let's try the pawn. And so what is the seven pawns for black, six pawns for white? So black has a pawn for the exchange. He has a, a nice pass pawn, although the rest of his position isn't very good. So e takes the three castles. And mm -hmm. you can try like this. I mean, I, I mean, again, like it's a very complicated position. So knight d5 trying to trap the bishop with f6 or something must be the Yeah, and no, I think it's a nice point. So let, let's say... Like we could take, yeah, we can maybe take it to pawn and then the idea that you mentioned, knight d5 followed by quick f6. Quick, uh, and then like king f7 and, you know, get that bishop. Pretty funny. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean, so you don't want to let your bishop get trapped. So let's like, let's try to free him before this happens. Like, let's say go, we go, um, I don't know, bishop F e5 maybe? You're still going to go f6, right? That's the thing. So after bishop yeah. e5, you're going to go f6. I mean, it, it is a very crazy line. Like, I mean, that's the kind of stuff report actually calculates, I think. You know, I would never you know, go for this, but I think, you know, for him, this is uh, just kind of normal. Yeah, and the, yeah, Duda will have to consider this line. I mean, it's very difficult to evaluate what exactly is going on. I mean, if Black manages to consolidate, Black can also be better, right? As we mentioned, upon yeah. C5 this week, Black is potentially a big pawn center, you know, if he gets mm -hmm. E5 in. The king can always sit quite comfortably on the f7 square. Yeah. So it's very difficult to evaluate, I would say. Um, but then you could also play something like knight d2 first, right? But here, black does get bishop g7, and it looks like black is fine here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, okay. What if I just make like like absolutely standard moves like queen c2? At queen c2, you might have this e5 idea, right? You shut down my bishop. That actually starts to look pretty decent for you. Because once, mm -hmm. once your light squared bishop opens up and you got the center, then there's no problem. So I, I can see now, yeah, why the computer is giving this move bishop d6. Like, because uh, actually it's a prophylaxis against e5, right? It's not so much about the power of the bishop on d6, although he's good there. He's definitely nice. But you really got to stop black from playing e5. So let's try that move, bishop d6. Yeah, that's a nice idea because as you mentioned, yeah, I think if, if we just castle and black gets an e5, black should be completely fine, maybe even just better. I mean, look at this center. Uh, we can eventually, you know, strengthen it with moves like f6 or queen c7 later on, and there's no way white can ever break it up. So, yeah, let's say bishop d6. The bishop and d6 is a pawn sack, but of course, you know, b2 pawn, it costs you some time to take it. It also improves white's rook. Um, yeah, you know what's interesting? Let, let, let's look, look what happens, like, if you don't take the pawn. I'm just kind of curious, like, if, uh, if, like, you just castle, like, what is White's concept here? Does White want to play a move like e5, or, or that's just not really necessary? I think e5 also makes a lot of sense. I think Black's main problem is this knight in e7, which is now completely boxed in. But you can't even move for the moment, because then you hang the rook over here, so... I like this uh, idea, but but let's have a look. We get word that Fabiana has moved. He's played the move pawn d4, and he kind of responded quite quickly with the move f6. You know, just um, yep, keeping the the center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was thinking was you know quite likely. Um, I mean, you know, because Fabiano, you know, made a classical reaction, right? Trying to open the center. I mean, that's really what he's supposed to do. But now after F6, I have to say it is a lot harder for the next move to come, right? So, I mean, the knight on A5 is not doing so much, right? So there was this idea of queen D3 trying to get the knight back to C4. Maybe we can check that out because it makes sense. You're connecting your rooks. You want to go like... Rook a d1 and mm -hmm. pressuring e5. I think he has to do something like like that. Right. Um, yeah, it's actually. So I guess if white 
Uh, sorry, what was the move that you were suggesting? Uh, queen d3 to try to go knight c4. Uh -huh. And let's say I go, uh, I guess if we go h5, then you take a knight c4. Yeah, that could be annoying, yes. perhaps. Right, that's the idea. And also, like, or, you know, wait, never mind. One. We just, oh, we take and trap the bishop, huh? Yeah. Okay, I guess that's not My so bad. boring. Um, I wonder how huh. this. The move h4 always plays out because we don't really want to take then mm -hmm. white gets a lot of squares like he takes with the knight or with the bishop yeah and i mean g4 knight g5 also doesn't look great to me yes and um, yeah yeah g4 knight g5 is a problem okay so maybe this is a little too rash this h5 move maybe we need to do something more subtle but let's see what we can do mm -hmm. Um, all right yeah but yeah the difficult thing right now is that um after we've played rook b8 mm -hmm. we cannot go queenside castles anymore right and we we don't really want to go kingside castles after we pushed all these pawns over here and do we want to keep the king in the center forever that's also not quite what we want to do right yeah. So the problem is that, you know, you can never go G4 in these positions, right? Because the knight always goes to H4 and your attack is totally over. Mm -hmm. um, H5 is really the main, is really the main idea. Huh. Should we trade on, should we take an H5 and E5 with the knight? Is there any point to that at all? Like H5 uh -huh. and pawn takes and knight takes. Is there a point to that? Because our That's knight was amazing. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting idea because now h4 is out of the question. Ah, right? there that's you where go. It's covered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So white could, of course, decide to take with the bishop to make sure that the bishop never gets trapped. But if we do get in g4, then things do get pretty sharp anyway. But maybe white is in time with a move like knight c4. Yeah, rook d8, so it's a tricky way to defend that pawn. Right, and it's not so easy for white uh, uh, to decide where to go with the queen. Like if you go here, auto bishop b4 mm -hmm. is not an option right away. But I would think like if black takes and goes g4, this also looks quite fine for black because this knight is going to be pushed to an awkward square. Yep. Yeah, oh wow. This plan here of like king d7, king c8 is just amazing. I love that. Look at that. That yeah. is such an unusual plan, right? To like acquire king safety through that sort of <laughs> manual castling king. I mean, and then the king becomes beautifully safe on CA. That would be that would be brilliant, you know. And then we would have a bond cloud in the candidates. You know, who would have thought? Yeah, that would be so funny. So, mm -hmm. um, so let's tell our audience, Benjamin, about the the charity event that we have going on. Um, I think you know all about it. Games for uh, love. Yeah, so our uh, this is a charity stream for games uh, uh, games for love, and we're trying to raise some money. Uh, it's basically for um, you know kids all around the world who struggle you know with their their health and but also their mental health when they're in the hospital. So when they're in the hospital, you know this organization makes it possible possible for them. So they can uh, they can play some video games. They don't have to always think about their their illness because uh, that becomes very depressing after all. And yeah, health is something that affects all of us, you know. So I think it would be great if we can all come together and raise money for this uh, great organization that does so much for for kids all around the world. Um, so yeah, I think Wandering Bishop just put the link in uh, in in the chat. Yeah, that sounds good. So we will be letting you guys know about all the charity things we're doing, all these sweepstakes and everything that we're going to be having uh, during the candidates as the event goes on. So stay tuned for that. Um, and oh, there it is. I see I see the link. It is events.softgiving.com. So take a look at mm -hmm. that, guys. All right. So um I mean, this this line I really like. Let's go back a little bit because this this of course turned out quite favorably for Black, and I'm sure uh, Caruana is not gonna want to allow this. But I think we're on to something there with like Knight takes e5, right? It definitely makes sense uh, to trade the knights in order to stop White from going h4. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so let's say we go h5. I think white has to take, right? Because mm -hmm. h4 is a big threat. Now, if you go h4, we have g4, and this knight does not have this square. I wonder if now pawn takes could be an idea uh, to try to free up this, this square. But here, black could consider bishop b4, because now there are two knights on their attack. I guess this gets pretty wild in case white takes, and maybe here, but I doubt that it's going to work out. I feel like it's just, like it's just uh, winning somehow. Um, wow yeah that's a pretty crazy line i have to say like um getting the rook captured on b8 and yeah i mean i guess you're just winning even in a simple way right like even if you just took the knight on a5 after rook g8 like okay you have two pieces for the rook i mean you're going to be winning even quite prosaically here yeah um so let's see what other what other moves could be considered for Fabiano in this uh, position? Yeah. So, oh, by the way, you know, Duda did play c five. Mm -hmm. So, and Fabi, he's thinking. Okay. So, I let's go to this queen d three move again because I do rather like it. It makes sense to me. So, queen d three, uh, h five. So, pawn takes. I think there was something, some way there we could have improved that line with pawn takes. And wait, you said so. You said bishop b four, right? Like. That that's an actually an option there for black. Uh, yeah, bishop b4 is always an option to to hit this knight with a tempo. Yeah, so queen d3 h5. Let's let's just go mm -hmm. through that line again. Pawn takes, and so here you're saying right here bishop b4. Is that where we looked at this line? Uh, no, it no. was when white goes h4. Ah, okay. G4, and uh -huh. then if white takes, because Got here, if we take with the pawn, then white gets this square, and this looks. Pretty good for white. Um, and so we could take with the knight, but then white has a couple options. Um, now, if you just take over here, white's king side is actually completely safe. And after knight c4, white is quite a bit of annoying pressure in the center, I would think. Yeah, the hair block doesn't have any compensation any longer, right? For like the not being castled and the defects in the pawn structure. Okay, so there was the line after pawn takes e5 immediately so after h5 pawn takes e5 knight takes e5 mm -hmm. and then the knight trade right so right uh-huh uh without um without h4 yeah this one knight takes knight takes pawn takes right and so this queen c3 move let's take a look at that like what is that about you want to win my pawn yes and you also mm -hmm. so why can't i go ah benjamin i found a little tactic uh huh. My question was like, why can't I go bishop f7? Isn't it going to be the same? But then there's knight takes b7. It's my Ooh, first tactic of the day. <laughs> that's a nasty move, yeah. Because, yeah, if we take, there's this. But actually, after knight takes b7, there is still yeah, there's move h4. Four. Yeah, that's right. It's funny like that. The black <laughs> can just give, give up two pawns in a row, right? But like trap the bishop. Okay, so it seems like black is doing fine here. So what, what happens on bishop f7 then? Yeah, I think here things probably become pretty tricky because let's say you go f3. Right here, we might be in time to go h4. The bishop drops back and now bishop b4. Here we do hit the queen and the knight, which looks winning for black, but white still has a funny move, queen e3, with the point being if you take them, white has this. Right. Yeah, okay. But I can tell you, like, it does seem like... Uh... I feel like it is, it's harder to play this position for white than for black. What do you think? I mean, like, just practically speaking, what's, what's, what's your impression? Like, I mean, black has some quite clear ideas, right, of what they want to do. White has to be quite subtle about their mm -hmm. plan. So I'm not, like, surprised that Fabi is taking, you know, quite a bit of time here. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's... Yeah, it's, it's definitely very complicated. But I would think bishop f7 looks like a clever move. White can also go h3 to keep this bishop on a diagonal, right? Because now bishop b4 doesn't work for more obvious reasons. White can take here, and then the rook on h8 will always um, be hanging. Mm -hmm. So bishop f7, so h3, let's take a look at that. h3, so yeah, I can't go g4 because you go h4. So h3, I, h4 doesn't have too much of a point. Yeah, like just to point out, like if I go h h3, h4, bishop h2, 
The thing is, I'm not really in time to play G4 here because you're probably going to be playing F3 soon, right? Like if I go Rook G8, right. you're probably just going to play F3. Or, Ru yeah, Ooh. we see that tactic. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, yeah, this looks problematic for Black, I would say. If White gets in F3, followed by Knight C4, you know, E5 is weak. Uh, all of our pawns are fixed on a, on a dark squares. Mm -hmm. And this bishop for now, it looks passive, but white can always try to bring it back later. But let's say we get something like this, right? And these bishops get traded. Yeah. Although it's a long plan, but white can go here and then here in bishop g1, and that solves the, the problem to bishop. Yeah, we have a lot of pawns on the same color as our bishop. So we definitely, you know, you know we're definitely worse. I mean, can we hold on just because maybe white doesn't have any obvious pawn breaks, maybe. But I mean, I agree that it's not a lot of fun to get your pawn structure fixed in a way that you can no longer have any breaks, uh, any play on the king side. So let's go back and see if what, if we don't play h4 and we castle there. Mm -hmm. um, how does that make a difference? Does that leave us with more play if we just castle right here? That's right. a good question. And this right. is more and flexible, I... right? It's a more flexible mm -hmm. way of playing because like you're you're it's not so easy for white to like play f3 here because then g4 can happen at some point yeah no i agree and also now bishop b4 is a real threat because there's no rook hanging in the in the corner so we can just trade and take the knight so white would have to address that one way or another you can go knight c4 but then i think i'm going bishop b4 again and here you have to it, it looks like you're losing the knight but you can still hang on with queen d3 and queen e2 but i would feel that black has so much activity here that he should be fine here one way or another maybe yeah. um, but actually as we speak fabiano has moves he, he has, has played, played queen d3 queen d3 there we go yeah because it's a very like uh very human move you know like it just feels like very natural to try to get the knight back to c4 connecting the rooks right so okay um that makes sense so duda played c5 report is still thinking interestingly so it seems like report was not even you know ready to instantly reply to c5 it's possible i guess that he uh overlooked it i mean he, yeah he seems deep in thought actually we see him um we see him just kind of thinking and calculating so maybe that move actually took him by surprise um mm -hmm. in terms of other interesting games i mean there's we can take a quick look at Rajab of Ferruzia. I mean, there's not like a ton of action from when we last saw it. Uh, yeah, so let's have a look at that game. So Ferruzia did go for this move, knight at d5, rook 81 by Rajabov. And now bishop a6 to hang on to this pawn. And after bishop d2, he played knight to b3. So black actually had the option to take on e3. This does, you know, fix the problem of the d4 pawn. But if black can manage to open up the position later on with a move like c5, I feel like black has chances of, of getting the advantage. Yeah, that was definitely a big uh, opportunity for him to consider. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess other, well, you know, the move f6 in these positions may be not so productive, right? Because, I mean, you're not really threatening to take on e5. But yeah, c5 is the main break to play for if you get that in you know your position will be quite good and as long as you don't let that knight into g5 um i don't really see how white is able to get an attack using the f file here so um it's interesting that he didn't go for that so he played mm -hmm. uh he said bishop a6 yeah so bishop a6 was played bishop d2 and now knight b3 yeah and so this one was always annoying it's putting some pressure on d4 perhaps taking the bishop um I mean, and c5 but, is it on the agenda already like is he like if it was just black's turn can he just play c5 um i kind of don't see why he can't yeah no that's a good point but actually look at the time for is up 45 minutes on the clock rajav is down to an hour here that's still you know quite a bit of time but there's no increment so he has to speed up at one point we saw in norway chess he got into a lot of time pressure, so he definitely cannot do that here in, in the first round against Ferrugia. 
Yeah, it's really dangerous to get into like such uh, a time differential with your opponent, right? Like close to an hour. And I mean, they just started the game. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I mean, they're on move 16. So I wouldn't say this is like the worst time trouble ever looming for Rajabo, but they don't have any increments. So he needs to keep that in mind. But I think overall, it's just like he's kind of struggling with the position a bit, right? Um, like what to do at this point for white. I guess we can look at this move knight e4, trying to win the c4 pawn. Yeah, I like knight e4, it stops us, and now we're hitting the pawn on c4. So you'll have to make a backwards move with maybe knight b6, but yeah, that does give me some time. You could also take on d2. Yeah, let's, let's, let's... take, because I, I kind of like the idea of getting that bishop off the board to take the bishop here. So like rook takes d2, and then you have only one real way to protect that pawn, right? So, right. Mm -hmm. Knight b6. There is a really interesting idea there, Benjamin, with like rook mm -hmm. b3 and trying to stop this the bishop c4 by like this maybe rook takes f3 sacrifice. I mean, is that uh you trade and then you sack the exchange or something like that? Yeah, I was um yeah. I, <laughs> I'm having a hard yeah, I don't think it works out, but it's definitely something to to consider, and actually, as we speak, 94 by Rajabov is on the board. Yeah, so I mean, it's a it's a definitely a decent option for him. He, he needs to kind of force the play at some point. Um, okay, so if you don't like rook b3, let's go to knight b6 mm -hmm. and let's just take maybe, a look at this position. Maybe knight c5 here because you cannot take because then I recapture and I hit your knight and your I queen. Uh huh. You went. You win a pawn, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you still have this, but then we just win the pawn. So you would have to go here, I'd imagine. And mm -hmm. can we take? Can we go a four here? Yeah. yeah. But then black Although, is the very typical compensation that they're always looking for. Like, like I would say here, like even if there was no bishop takes f three, like even if I just had to take your bishop and go bishop d five, like even that must be like a lot of compensation. Right, but actually, um, black has a win here because black can take on f3 and take on c5 and go like queen g5. Yeah, Indeed. yep, opening up the king yep. is, is better. Indeed, but luckily, these are not our pieces. Um, so it feels like black is still holding on, you know, move by move. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I think it's really quite good that, well, he hasn't taken, the, oh, he has taken the bishop just now. Yeah, he took the bishop on d2. I like that decision. Um, it's just important to get the bishop pair because this is a pretty open game. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, even if you lose the c4 pawn, you are going to have a lot of compensation. Although it's interesting, he went for knight f4. Knight so. f4. Mm. But what is his idea if white takes here, I wonder? So I think he has to go for this because if you take on c4, this just looks borderline lost to me. You're just down a pawn. Um, yeah. But black has this move, root takes b2. So let's have a look. Let's say we take. Yeah. Black takes here. Quite a fancy and... idea, isn't it? This exchange. Indeed, time. yeah. So let's see. Like if we go rook c1, I guess black has knight d3. Knight d3, yeah. You get the exchange back immediately. Mm -hmm. But what if we go, okay, so root b1, I guess if bishop d3, we go, or actually here we might have this and queen d2 because your knight is trapped. Mm -hmm. But maybe black can just play normal moves like bishop d5. Yeah. Hit this knight and queen a8 perhaps. I, I don't know. Do you think black is enough compensation here or no? You know, I mean, I have to say, like, you know, this move, well, nine of four was a bit surprising. He did it very quickly, right? I mean, it's surprising just because he had this, like, quite calm alternative in knight b6, and there didn't seem to be any real issues with that move. So he's basically, with his knight of four move, he's basically going for this exchange sack, mm -hmm. um, like, which... You don't really feel like, oh, well, first of all, when you go for an exchange sack, you want your opponent's rooks to be like quite bad, right? Or, yeah. and you want your opponent's pawn structure to be damaged. In this case, it's not terrible for white. Like the rooks are, you know, there are open files on the board and the king is fairly safe. So of course, black is a super strong bishop on d5, but to say that like black's, uh, you know, pieces are clearly dominating whites, you really can't, right? 
I mean, yeah, we go like, let's say we go like rookie one, you defend the night, like at some point, well, I don't know if I want to go G3, maybe, um, maybe put a knight on G5, actually. Um, you know, you, yeah. have some, you have some issues with your king as well. You know, I can provoke Indeed. you to play G6 and then maybe go back with the knight, try to get into F6. Um, mm-hmm. So I did find that like to be a little bit of a, you know, a strange decision by Feruzia. Maybe just not like, I don't know. He went for this very confidently though. Yeah. And yeah, Black can also take this pawn on A3 and go for a quick bishop before, but there are more moves in Hikoro's game after the move Queen D3. He has played the move H5, trying to trap this bishop. So we've already discussed this position in a lot of depth, and we thought that Fabiano has to take on E5. As you mentioned before, it's nice to get a get a time differential on the clock, and Hikaru is up 15 minutes here. Do you think that is going to play a factor in this game? Yeah, I think 15 minutes is not a ton yet for this stage in the game. Like, I don't feel like – I mean, I think it's nice to get that time advantage. I don't think it's too bad for Fabi yet. He's, you know, they're in a pretty critical place in the middle game. So I just think it makes sense for Fabi to take his time here because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not the kind of position where you can just coast by with, you know, with uh, natural moves, right? At some point there's going to be in the next like five moves, there are going to be some really critical decisions. So I, I do understand his time usage at this point. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I was actually just curious, when was the last time you played a tournament that had a time control, like two hours for 40 moves. Uh, so yeah, so no increment in the beginning. Wow. Well, I was that uh, years ago. I mean, right. Cause I mean, it's been years, I would say more than a decade, maybe 15 years, maybe more than that. I mean, certainly I've played that before, but it's been a really long time since increment has been around. And that just seems to be the standard in tournaments for a long time already. Yeah, no, for sure. I think the real reason why they have this increment and not the, let's say, two hours for 40 moves is because um, with, with two, if there's no increment, at some point the players can stop. They don't have to keep scoring any more of the moves and things can become very messy. And then you'll need arbiters in any you know time, uh, uh, time trouble phase. So I think it's just much more practical to have an increment than no increment. And pieces start flying. In the time scramble, right? Oh yeah, no. I mean, I think increments is the is the right way for the game of chess to go. Um, I mean, I think it's taken away a lot of the controversy, right? Of that, of those like time scrambles in the end, and you don't really want it to be about. I don't know. Um, I just I just think back to like Wesley So like bleeding from his hands as he was like playing some games, <laughs> yeah. right? I heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't really want games to end in that with people like smashing the pieces, uh, the clock, and the pieces falling. Um, so I think they're hoping this is. I mean, I don't I don't think they want this to happen at the candidates either. I think you know, forty moves in two hours is reasonable to expect that the players are not going to be like having to do anything chaotic. You know. Right. Um, you know, chaos yeah. is interesting, but I just feel like, you no, know, I feel like the game of chess has gone in a better direction without mm-hmm. that. No, for sure. And I th- I think you, didn't you also have a game like that against Anna Satonsky? Or- yeah, I, was, I yeah. did remember that. I didn't really want to bring it up myself. But- <laughs> yeah, okay, my bad, my bad. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, well, sure, my, my game, I mean, back in, that was in 2008, and the way that playoff ended with like a mad time scramble with a few seconds left, you know, um, like that, I think that helped, you know, along the issue of that, like, yes, we need increments. Like we don't really right, yeah. want this to happen again. Yeah. Um, and there was, there was definitely times where it was like they, around that period, there were other games, like in other tie breaks that also had similar problems. So my, my game was not the only one. Um, but yeah, ever since then it's basically changed. And certainly for the U S championships, like we haven't had that issue anymore. Right. So uh, it was just a playoff with no increment or, or was that an Armageddon? Cause I remember, there was an Armageddon, you know, years ago in the World Cup where someone got flagged in a night versus night endgame, which yeah, is pretty funny. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking yeah, about. I think, yeah, you know, we're th- th- thinking about the same game. I think it's the game Monica yeah. Sachko versus Sabina Faishor. Um, right. And that definitely, you know, got the attention of the chess world too, right? Because it was kind of a ridiculous result, right? That, 
you know, night versus night. And yet, you know, someone just like losing on time and that, that, that result stood. Um, yeah. So yeah, my game was an Armageddon game. That's right. I, we played a ton of already blitz already, and then we got down to the Armageddon and it had no increments. And these days, you know, um, there's like, even in Armageddon games, I think there's like at least a one second increment at some point, like after move right. 60. Yeah. Sense. So, you know, like, let's say, let's say you're playing with the black pieces, you only need a draw and then you make it to move 60 that the increment kicks in. Then, you know, you're not going to lose on time anymore. And that's usually like, if the other players lost where they just resigned because they know like, okay, I can't win on time anymore. It's uh, yeah. There's nothing I can do. Yeah. So we got, uh, we got Hikaru playing H five and Fabi thinking again. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I think overall, like we can be pretty happy with how this game is developing for Hikaru. I mean, um, certainly, certainly I am. And, you know, from an, E4, E5 opening like a Berlin, I think we got like a very, one of the interesting scenarios, right? Indeed, yeah. So let's see, we said that Fabiano probably has to take on E5. I think we were advocating for the move knight takes E5 because after pawn takes H4, it doesn't seem like there's an easy way to solve the problems. Although, you know, this probably also remains very complicated. So let's say we take with the knight, mm -hmm. right? And we were looking at this and maybe queen C3. Right, like let's say we, yeah, I think we're looking at castles to bring this into the position. Uh, so on bishop e5, there's bishop b4, yeah, winning, yeah, winning the knight. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, also for me, I don't remember the last time I played without an uh increment. Uh, yeah, usually there, yeah, it's probably years and years ago. Or actually, I think there, there was this tournament in Germany. So it was a, a tournament with two rounds a day. And they figured like, okay, we want to make sure that the round ends in time. So it was just two hours for the first 40 moves, then followed by an hour or half an hour. So people r legitimately run out of time. But the thing is, I think in classical, when you're low on the clock, you can request um, a delay time control. But then if you do that, you, you cannot win the game anymore. I think that was a thing. Yeah, you know, we have a lot of interesting developments in these games. Um, you know, so Feruzia sacked the exchange, like as we were looking at. Um, I would also say that like Ding Nipomnishi, which we haven't taken a look at in a while, uh, might be worth a look just to see how that game is developing. We got the number one Chinese player against uh, against the former world championship candidate mm -hmm. uh yeah. so let's see we left off after this move a3 yeah. rookie eight actually the move that we were discussing was played by nepo b4 mm -hmm. knight g4 bishop b2 and queen h5 so he goes for a very direct assault on the white king i wonder actually do you think white could have taken this pawn on e4 maybe right yeah yeah and i mean actually doesn't look so bad, but what stopped him? I mean, this line, is there like H, H4 ideas? Is that what he didn't like? I don't know, yeah, but let's... You know, there's a very interesting maneuver, like queen E1, queen F2, to kind of defend the king side, bishop B2. I mean, honestly, doesn't look doesn't look that bad for white. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so bishop B2 was played, queen H5. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is if we take the knight, then black brings out his bishop immediately. So h4 was played, bishop f6 now, queen c2, and now he took. And e4 looks like a real problem to me. So I guess bishop f5 is pretty much forced. I mean, bishop takes c3 looks a little bit sad, right? I mean, here you're just resigning yourself yeah, to a worse more, position. More I than think. a little bad, I, a little bit. Yeah. Like I would, I would cry, at, you know at this position for black yeah. <laughs> i'll be honest yeah. I, mean, I like the bishop pair too much indeed so i think it's probably better to hang on to it for the moment the bishop five because we defend the pawn on e4 by tactical means all right um but a lot of people are saying we should go to the game between dura and report what has happened here so after g6 c5 was played richard played e5 
bishop g5 now. Now the problem is if you take that we get this position that we discussed before, but you're not even up a pawn. So this just looks gross. So bishop g7 was played, but this looks terrible for black. I mean, let's say we take here. Yeah. Right? This knight on e7 is still just terrible because it's not going anywhere. And your pawn structure is bad. This bishop on g7 is bad. Like maybe knight a3 to c4 already comes to mind. I mean, what is this opening by report? Well, it's it's a pretty it's pretty disastrous. It has not worked out because, like you know, normally you're already better once you get black to have those separated pawns on a seven and c six, right? So like you're even if like black's position otherwise was normal, like white would have the edge just based on that. But to top it off, black has a completely misplaced bishop on g seven, just like staring into the e five pawn, and you know, okay, the knight on e seven it protects the pawn on c six, but it's very passive, so it's like uh. It's it's a disastrous actually for your first game in the candidates tournament. Um, it's not, you know, not a good outcome. But essentially, his move G six was just a blunder, wasn't it? Yeah, no, I have no idea what he had in mind. Um, it's very odd to me. Like he should have considered a move C five for yeah, white, I mean, especially because C five for white it, it is a very normal idea, right? It's not like right. you know, it's not like something you know unusual where white tries to break up the pawns. So you know, to go G six, it, it feels like you know, okay, yes, you want to get your bishop to G seven, but like, will you have the time to do so? It does feel dubious, right? Like C five really lock, would have locked down the structure for black, so they don't have to worry about these breaks. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. Very odd. What's been happening here? But we do have more moves. Um, so let's have a look. So after bishop g7, a trade happened on d6. And yeah, once again, this just looks terrible for black. I mean, I would just castle here, I think, followed by quick queen c2 and rook d1. And it becomes very quickly difficult to move, I would think. Yeah. No, I mean, now it's basically a matter of Duda's technique, right? I mean, I, even for such a creative player like Report, it's going to be quite difficult to get out of this position mm -hmm. because there's not so much room for creativity when you just have a bunch of weaknesses and, and bad pieces um so hikaru's game uh it's going along you know the way we discussed white took on e5 and uh hikaru now has this major decision about how to recapture and i think he'll make the right one and he's now more, like 20 minutes up on the clock so his time advantage mm -hmm. is growing that's a good yeah. sign Indeed. Yeah, I would say, I mean, uh, one hour is still fine for Fabiano, but he's got to be careful. As we mentioned before, there is no increment. Uh, so let's see what he is going to do. Um, and uh, uh, But yeah, he's going to take... Yeah, we're expecting, you know, knight takes e5 here. Right. Um, and, you know, there's probably going to be a trade on e5 we're going to head towards that position that we you know already spent a lot of time talking about um so guys we are going to take a short five minute break um but when we come back we're going to do a giveaway of a ps5 so just uh get your money ready for the giveaway i think there's going to be some kind of donation involved to take part in that right benjamin yeah no the people who will donate will be entered into a raffle so um definitely yeah you don't want to miss out on that and there we will be doing some huge giveaways you guys we're not you know revealing anything just yet but uh it's all for charity it's really a win-win win situation you know you're supporting a good good cause and you can uh win huge prizes so uh definitely make sure to make sure to stick around for that and we'll see you guys right after the break
and welcome back everyone to the FIDE Candidate Tournament 2022 and we have more moves in this game between Fabiana Caruana and Hikaru Nakamura. Arena, after knight c5, which was the move that we were expecting, Fabiana took with the bishop and played knight c4. What do you make of these two moves? Yeah, well, I can understand why he ultimately decided to just get rid of the bishop on g3, which was a problem for him with so many lines, and you don't really like the look of the pawn coming to h4 attacking the bishop, so I understand it. You know, at the same time, now Hikaru has two bishops against two knights. We briefly talked about this move, knight c4, um, and actually Black has like some nice choices. I guess Hikaru here, I mean, he can take on c4 and play g4, and he can also play rook d8 for the moment, maybe just improving the rook and maybe even later going. Yeah, this is actually where I think we had that fancy <laughs> line, Benjamin, with king d7 to king c8, right? I mean, that would be kind of amazing if that happened in this game, like right here, yeah. king d7. I mean, it actually has a chance of appearing on the board. Yeah, no, for sure. Um Because, yeah, rook d8, I think, is definitely the more ambitious move because already here... What black could decide to take on c4 and go g4, which looks kind of fine, but you know, white goes 92. So with the move rook d8, we could win a tempo. But then the question is after rook d8, is there something white can do? Like white can play, let's take on d6 first, but I think black should be doing completely uh, completely fine here. Yeah, I mean he still even has here that king d7 idea if he needs it, but like you know, the center now is very stable for black and he's just free to go, you know, g4, h4. You know, maybe G3. Um, so I kind of like how this is going for Black. And this is what I meant, Benjamin, a, a while ago when I said that I felt that this position is practically harder to play for White, right? More difficult mm -hmm. decisions, right? I mean, Hikaru had like a more clear plan of playing on the king side. And now this decision, Bishop takes E5. Like, I understand Karuana um, for doing that move, right? It's, you know, you can, because he's under some pressure with the with the king side pawns, but at the same time, it probably wasn't uh, the optimal solution for him. Yeah, no, for sure. And yeah, we saw that Bishop was getting trapped in a lot of lines, so it's very understandable that he gave it up, but now he's giving Black the long-term advantage of the two bishops. But also, guys, I wanted to remind you, we are doing the giveaway for a PlayStation 5 and a $250 chess house gift card. And the giveaway starts now and runs for 10 minutes. So whoever donates now, once again, you are donating money towards a charity, towards a good cause. You will be entered into a giveaway. So yeah, everyone, uh, you know, make sure to jump in. It's a really a win-win situation. And there will be more giving, uh, there will be more uh, giving ways coming soon. Yeah, there is a link in the chat, guys. Uh, you can see it is events.softgiving.com slash donate slash Team Hikaru. And that is where you go to make the donation. So hopefully, uh, well, mm -hmm. one of you will win the uh, PlayStation 5 and the gift card. Indeed. So type in, type in the chat, exclamation mark charity. That will bring you to the link. And yeah, I was talking to, uh, to Hikaru and I asked him, you know, what makes him the most passionate about streaming? And he said that's really the, the charities, you know, what the, the, the fact that he can use his platform for a good cause that, that really makes him the, the proudest. Uh, so you're not making, uh, you're not only helping yourself, but you're also helping in a way your favorite streamer. Like that's what he, he likes the most about streaming. So make sure to, to donate towards charity because you can win uh, the PlayStation 5 or the, and, uh, um, $250 chess house gift card. Yeah, we're going to play a video for you guys right now about uh, about the charity. So we'll see you on the other end of it. Thank you. 
But yeah, as you guys saw, it's all going to charity. It's going to all these kids who are, you know, struggling in the hospital. Um, so yeah, guys, it's all, it's all for a good cause. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite Hikaru charities was, um, I think he teamed up with chess.com to raise money for Ukraine, uh, for, I think it was Ukrainian, Ukrainian, uh, children, and um, yeah, the, the stream raised so much money. It was really impressive to be able to make that much of an impact. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, so, I have yeah. to say, Benjamin, I really like the way you say indeed. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what, about, what about it? I don't know. Well, you, you know, you, you, it's like, you know, how everyone has their favorite. You know, it sounds nice. Yeah, that's what I heard from a lot of people um wait yeah there there are people in the chat who after a while of watching chess they just i guess you know the chess um like at, at some point they start noticing it as well and i think people said yeah well we're gonna do a drinking game every time i say indeed oh that's funny that is funny yeah yeah all righty so um Let's let's move on and to see. So is Hikaru okay? So Hikaru is still thinking. He hasn't played Rook D8 yet. Mm -hmm. I really would like to see him play that move. I want to see that Rook improves. I want to get that free tempo. Um, and we got six minutes left. Yeah, to make those donations, guys, and yeah. uh, and be entered in the raffle. Wow, we're over twelve hundred people already. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, very good stuff, you guys. Uh, yeah, it's it's going great. Yeah, make sure to donate. We only have five minutes of 45 seconds on the clock. And yeah, you, you just have to donate now to be entered into the giveaway for the PlayStation 5 and the $250 gift card. But let's see, what, what do you think Ikara should do here after this move, Knight C4? Yeah, so Rook D8, I mean, it does appear to be like a free tempo for Black, right? Because while well, you're defending the E5 pawn that way, the white queen can't mm -hmm. really feel too comfortable. And then you just want to play G4 next. So you're kind of saying, okay, to the white queen, you got to move. And then you can make that capture on C4 for free. Um, so, I mean, I just like Black's position. And he did just play Rook D8. Yeah, Rook D8 looks like a nice move. So now Fabiano has a decision to make. Like, is he going to uh, let Black gain a tempo by going queen C3? No, we trade. And then I like the line that you suggested with G4 and King D7 to C8. Or is he going to uh, trade on D6? Yeah, trading on D6, I mean, you know, not, neither of these options is particularly mm -hmm. inspiring, right, for mm -hmm. white. So he kind of just has to choose. Like, I think he already knows that Black has, you know, gained the initiative that he's been outplayed a mm -hmm. bit as white, and then he's going to try to steer the game to some safety. I mean, you know what I'm curious about? Like, like let's say C takes D6. Can you go queen, I don't know, queen A3 attacking the A7 pawn? Is that right. even even worth looking at? I mean, how would, I'm just curious how black is going to defend that pawn. Wait, so queen A3 or queen E3? Yeah, queen A3. So I guess, actually, Maybe queen just e A6. Yeah, A6. I guess it's not a not like a big weakness. Yeah, you can still like put your king somewhere on c7 later. Yeah, you can put the king here or on f7, I would think. Although, like let's say uh something like this happens, we should be reluctant with putting the king on f7 because then f3 will be annoying. So I, I like the plan that you suggested. Maybe again the bond cloud in the candidates in coming to c7 or c8. Yeah, so we're going to show you guys one more uh, video related to the giveaway. So just uh, stay tuned for a second and, and we will see you on the other side of it. What was your first memory playing a game? At least for me, it was those long car rides, being able to pull out the Game Boy and just have a chance to escape for a little bit and be a kid. How much more impactful is it for kids that are in hospitals that are going through isolation and oppression to be able to just be kids, play games, have some distraction therapy, and not worry about their next treatment 
or the next surgery. And really that is the power of distraction therapy and why it's so important in today's hospital environments for kids. See right now with COVID happening, uh, they're not allowed to see their grandparents. Um, they're locked down in their rooms and can only have one parent at a time in the room. So they're not able to see the other as well and no siblings either. So gaming is incredibly important. It allows them to connect to the outside world and experience amazing things. Help us to provide that experience for more kids in hospitals around the nation and around the world. And welcome back everyone to the Feed of Candidates. So yeah, you guys just saw the video. Make sure to contribute to, uh, to the charity. Uh, as you guys saw, they, those kids in hospitals, they are struggling and those donations will make it, uh, they'll make it easier for them to have a you know, more pleasant experience in a hospital. So definitely make sure to contribute. You will also be entered into a giveaway. It's all for charity. It's all you know, good stuff. We already raised almost $2,250. So yeah, just make sure to follow the link and donate over there. Yeah, guys, thank you for your donations. We got $2,500 donated. Saima just donated $5. Thank you for that. And we are going to try to get to $3,500 in the next 10 minutes. Let's see if we can do it. Yeah. Oh, we are already over $2,500. So let's try to push for $3,500 in the next 10 minutes. That'd be awesome, you guys. Games for Love has helped uh, more than 1 million children so far with their programs. Um, and we got XWU donated $25. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was also uh, a lot of you guys who donated a uh, uh, hundred bucks. I see that he car stepfather donated a hundred bucks. That's very much appreciated. Uh, Roy Crip 83 M strong and Miami Mark. All of you, the, the generosity of you guys is really appreciated. And I'm sure that those kids will benefit from it a lot. And if you haven't donated yet, go to events.softgiving.com slash donate slash Team Hikaru for love and click fundra fundraisers. Indeed. Just, uh, uh, yeah, just uh, use exclamation mark charity or exclamation mark uh, donate and they'll bring you there. Okay, yes. Right, so very oh, cool that Hikaru's, uh, Hikaru's uh, dad, Sunil, is in, is in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Watching what's oh, going it? on. Yeah, big <laughs> shout out to uh, to your step uh, stepfather. Yeah, hello, Sunil. Good to see you. And you know, we're here rooting for Hikaru. Thankfully, he's doing pretty well. I mean, I can't, you know, uh, I can't overstate how important it would be for him to, you know, like get a win in this game if he could do that uh, with the black pieces. Would give him so much confidence for this tournament and beating, you know, one of the. Top rivals, really, because I think everyone sees uh, Caruana as a very strong contender, you know, in any mm -hmm. tournament that he plays. Um, so it's uh, it would be a, just amazing if he could get off to a win. But of course, there's a lot of work to be done, right? The game's going quite well for him, but, um, you know, it doesn't mean that White isn't any serious trouble yet. So Caruana uh, did play Queen E3, attacking those two pawns. and. Hikaru responded with G4. That's quite expected. Uh, it's a big question where he's going to move the knight, right? Like knight e1 to go to d3 or just knight d2 and then and then stay there. Yeah, I like your suggestion with, with knight e1, the knight can come back to d3. Um, but also I think that Fabiano played this quite accurately not to get into any real trouble, right? Actually, we have to move knight d2. Now Hikaru will have to address the attack on opponent a7. I think just the move a6 looks completely fine. And I still think, you know, your idea of king d7 to c7 or c8 looks uh, like the way to go. Um, I'm sorry, Benjamin. I just found oh. the funniest uh, comment in the chat. It was, sorry if this is wrong, but the commentator is Hammer's girlfriend, right? I don't know. It's, I mean, he's not talking about you, so he must be talking about no. me. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. just to um, just to disappoint you, uh, Fab Julo. Uh, no, no, I'm not uh, Jan Ludwig Hammer's girlfriend. Um, although we have co-commentated on Chess.com numerous times, 
and uh, and uh, had had some fun together. But yeah, that's that's the extent of that of that relationship. Yeah, very. Uh, that's the first weird chatter of today, I guess. Um, but yeah. Anyway. Uh, oh, but just by the way, no, I know why he thought so. It's because our names go so well together. Oh, you crush know, and hammer, hammer and crush. Yeah, people have noticed that there is a lot of compatibility there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. So I guess whenever you would beat your opponents really bad, you you would say like, "Oh, I crushed them." Yeah. yeah. And hammer would say, "I I, I, I <laughs> hammered them." Hammered them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, he has a really good name uh, for chess as well, of course. Um, so, all right, let's get back to our position. Um, mm -hmm. So Hikaru is thinking now, okay, he actually moved to D2, uh, Fabi. Moved to D2. Yeah, he moved and, to D2. Oh. Um, and it's not clear exactly where the knight is going from there. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I kind of wonder, okay, and so, so yeah, Hikaru played a6, right? So I, I do wonder, like, where Black wants to put the king, because I think he's going to have to make this decision shortly, and I don't really see him going to f7 anymore, just because, you know, it's too easy to open up that part of the board, white will just play f3 or f4. So I actually think that um, the king d7 is like a very real possibility mm -hmm. uh, for for Hikaru in this position. And he, I don't know if he just made a move. Um, I'm seeing him on the video camera. He played a move, maybe it was A6, because I don't see any yeah. units coming in. Yeah, he played the move A6, making sure that pawn is not hanging. I think it's a good move. And now it's up to uh, Fabiano to decide. I think sooner or later, White will have to play F4. I think like, let's say we make a couple of normal moves, right? Like, let's say you go Rook 81, then I, I like your idea, yeah. King D7. Um, and I think black definitely has a slightly better position here. Maybe question is though, how do we make progress on the king side? Uh, how do we make progress on the king side? Yeah, well, so like if we go king d7, what happens after that? Let's secure the king first. Uh, you want to go c5, like Duda. Right, but I guess it's, we can just capture for the moment. Maybe D4 first. I don't know. It's a it's a good uh, it's a good question. H4, C5, and then I guess I can ignore C5. Right? I don't have to actually or, do anything. Hey, it is a free pawn. Yeah, yeah, that is a free pawn. By the way, guys, uh, thank you to everyone for their donations. Uh, you can keep supporting the charity and supporting Team Hikaru's efforts by using. Uh, exclam mark charity at any point during the stream and there will be more giveaways later. So thank you for your generosity and for your support. Um, now uh, let's get back to the game, right? So a6, yeah, you're saying like, okay, rook a d1. And then there's also like the more direct move f4, which forces black to take some action against that pawn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah. Black, white could also go, let's say, a four year, and then black has to make a decision. Do we take? Yeah, I think you gotta seven? take it because you can't really let white take an e5. If you let white take an e5, I feel like it opens up too much. And you know, given where your king is, it's a bit dangerous. So you need to keep the d pawn in place. Mm -hmm. And so the only question is actually, will which way to take the f pawn? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I would think maybe with the e pawn, because if we take yeah. with this pawn, then maybe this knight comes back to life. So yeah, let's say we take with the e pawn, right? I guess white takes with the rook. Yeah, so they you have can to watch out up. a little bit for e5, but I suppose on e5, you always go d5 to just close things up. Right, but then of course you do have to be worried about stuff like knight b3 to c5, but let's say here we go maybe rook f8, although- Rook hmm, f1 maybe. maybe. Yeah. Or even King takes an f8, yeah. Maybe takes an f8 and then rook f1. Yeah, let's win a tempo. I yeah, that looks annoying. But I guess I have everything covered with queen g7, right? And if I get king e7 or rook f8, I think black has potential to be better in the end game, right? Because these pawns mm -hmm. are also still hanging and it's, it's well, a little bit annoying. To yeah, like let's say we go, you know what's interesting? Like, I mean, if white goes, the concept is to go c3, knight b3, 
knight d4, but, you know, because as we spoke about, you know, Fabi had that big decision about where to move his knight. He chose d2. The knight's not great there, but he certainly will think about improving it. So one way to improve it is uh, knight b3 to d4. And I almost wonder, yeah, if he can just do it right away, because if you take on b2, well, you know, queen h6, I mean, it does look dangerous somewhat you have to at least calculate what happens if white invades over there right i, I was wondering what happens after knight d4 but i mean maybe this, this would be the definition of greed you know taking these pawns on b2 yeah and i mean it looks absolutely insane it really does like i can't imagine a person you know playing this yeah. way you know looks super super risky but um yeah i don't know i wouldn't feel comfortable playing like that as black no, but I mean, if it works, like if black adds two moves, yeah, let's say king d7 and c8, black might just be winning. Yeah, I guess it helps you that white's queen can't really move because she's tied down to the knight, right? So that is a big yeah. help. And your bishop and then, is still covering f7. Indeed, that's super important because let's say we have a look at this line like e5. We have the move king d7 and there's no rook f7 because that's where it's covered. And once again, black only needs one move. The king is safe and you're up two pawns. And in the end game, this pawn is going to start running down the board. Yeah, you kind of kept it together. And if you get your king to c8, you know, obviously black will have a good position with uh, all of their pieces kind of working well. Um, so f4, it's interesting, yeah, because in a way, like I would have liked to play g takes f3, right? Like I, taking mm -hmm. on croissant. Right. Um... Yeah, and, that's also definitely you know, Yeah, you know, because it opens up the G file. And so let's take a look at that for a second, because a knight takes F3, right? So there's knight G5. Well, let's say we play rook G8. How big of a problem is, I don't know, queen H6 maybe? Uh-huh. Yeah, like rook G8. I mean, this actually seems quite normal for black, right? So so let's say we go H4 and, uh, uh, and knight G5 after that. But yeah, yeah we that's all... that's a powerful idea to establish the knight on the G5 outpost. Yeah, that definitely looks annoying. But yeah, we just wanted to thank everyone for their donations. And you all can keep supporting the charity and supporting Team Hikar's efforts to support worthy causes by using exclamation mark charity in the chat at any moment during the stream. And we'll be giving away more stuff later. So uh, yeah, make sure to check it out, you guys. Uh, but yeah, let's get back to the to the chess. I think that this is the drawback of taking on a three, this knight coming to G5. Yeah, well, that is, you know, not the most obvious idea, H4, right? Like pushing pawns in front of your king, but it is a very effective one because G5 will really be a very nice square for that knight and totally blocking black's play on the G file. So I agree, you know, um, my, my idea runs into this H4 thing. So let's go back there. I mean, the reason I, I guess I didn't like E takes F4 as much instinctively was just because it gives white this E5 idea kind of opening the center but, um, but you know, perhaps it is the right way to go for black. Yeah, I mean, we could go h4 here to take white's h4 completely out of the equation, but I mean, now white gets knight g5 right away, so I don't know if that's really what we want to do either. But I, I think taking with the e pawn is maybe the way to go because now the knight stays dominated, right? It cannot go to c4, it cannot go to f3. Like all of Black's pieces do a pretty good job. The only problem is like Black's king. I think if we can get king d7, let's say followed by rook f8, get some rook trades in, then I really started like Black's position. You know, maybe the queen coming to g7, hit this, control the e5 square. Um, but of course, white does have this e5 push, as you mentioned. Yeah, so, you know, we have a couple of our audience members asking about that position after h4, like why not rook to g4? So let's quickly take a look at that because we always... I appreciate your chess questions, guys. And just for our viewers who are used to Hikaru playing online, this is actually an over-the-board tournament. Uh, there are not going to be any mouse lips, and we're not going to have Hikaru talking. This is going to be <laughs> me and Benjamin, because um, it is an over-the-board tournament that they're playing in Madrid for the next few weeks. Um, so rook g4 to stop knight g5 actually makes a mm -hmm. lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Um... But yeah, we will probably we will most likely have Hikaru after the game for an interview. 
So make sure to, to stick around even when the games are over. And we have a winner of the raffle. His name or his or, or her name is It's Freel Real Estate. So congratulations. You have won the PlayStation 5 and a $250 gift card. Yeah, so the it's did you say the winner of the raffle is is free real estate? Benjamin? It's free real estate, yeah. yeah. And they've won a $250 gift card to a chess house. So nice. I mean, Congratulations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I like your name. It's free real estate. Yeah. Who wouldn't want that <laughs> these days? Yeah, no, indeed. Uh, I wonder who, who that is in, in, uh, in the chat. But we do have another move by Fabiano. He's played the move B3, perhaps preparing the move knight C4, but it does feel a little bit slow. And does White really want to go knight C4 and double his pawn structure? Mm. As they, so not only they won the $250 gift card, they also won the PlayStation 5 which apparently is a lot more valuable. Now, I honestly didn't know that, Benjamin, because I'm not a video game player. Do you do you play video games? I used to play when I was younger, but then I figured like, hey, I should probably, you know, spend more time studying chess and, you know, uh, other th other things. So uh, I haven't played uh, in, a, in a long time, really. Yeah, but th it's very cool. So congratulations to It's Free Real Estate and... Uh, we will be doing more raffles along the way, guys. So stay tuned for that. All right. So uh, Caruana played B3. Wow. That's yeah. interesting move, right? Because the idea, I think, is to try to get the knight to C4. Um, mm -hmm. and he doesn't, maybe, maybe he doesn't even mind the ugly pawn structure, although you would think he would because it's not like a beautiful, but I, he does get the open B file in case black takes that knight. So Let's take a look at our preferred idea here, which is King D7. I mean, I guess it's running into this Knight C4 move. Indeed, yes. So, so let's have a look. So King D7. Uh, White could, of course, also still go for this B4 and C4 push, which is pretty an annoying. But yeah, Knight C4, I mean, we can even just ignore it, right? Because mm -hmm. this Knight is not going anywhere, right? So what is, I mean, you have one check, but that's not a big problem, I would think. Knight a5 uh, and then rook and what rook c8 or knight a5 rook c8. Right, but I would think even Seven, the end yeah. game mm -hmm. looks yeah. quite promising for black. I mean, I, I really like the fact that black has this really flexible pawn structure. The knight is now also a problem. B6 could be a threat, and then in the end game, the the weak the, the double pawns could be a bigger problem. And I don't know if you can get away with moves like b4. Yeah, so trying to just protect the knight, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, you know, black has the bishop, has a lot of space. I mean, white's rooks are not particularly active. So you can see that black is doing quite well here. I mean, the c5, it's an interesting move. I guess like c5, and what is the main idea of it? c5, a3? I mean, do we want to just go b6 at some point? Oh, actually, you know what I think the idea is? Yeah, it's C5, A3, C4. <laughs> oh, that's a going. nice plan, yeah. Yeah, and then trap the knight. Indeed. Because, yeah, now the knight is simply getting trapped with B6 on the next move. So why does the decision to make here? Like, if you take on C5 first, now the rook is ready to come into action. And C4 is still a big threat if white were to go here. C4 pretty much wins the game. Um, so let's see what Icaro is going to do. Fabiano already... Out of 50 minutes for 90 more moves is, you know, still completely fine. So King D7 is definitely a move Black can consider. Or, you know, a move like H4 or Rook F8 to really discourage this F4 push by Black. Yeah. H4 is interesting. So let's take a look at that. Like, H4, the question is, well, what are you exactly doing with that move? Are you trying to play G3? I don't think you are. I don't think you're no, trying for to do it yet. Yeah, for the moment, it feels like it's just giving away a pawn. So let's say white brings this rook into the game. Right? Yeah, like, if you go h3, they're going to go g3. I don't see a huge benefit to that for black. No. I mean, you know, it's possible, but you're kind of like stopped on the king side now. Um, so king d7 still seems to be like an important part of black's plans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, well, we have like, let's let me let's do a brief overview of what we're seeing in the other games. Actually, Duda Report is already in an end game, um, mm-hmm. which is still looking nice for white, but I wouldn't say it's like completely dominating, to be honest. Um, I kind of felt like the advantage was bigger earlier. And it looks nice now, but not uh, not resignable for black. Um, no, definitely not. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in fact, like I, I do, I do feel it's a lot less bad for black than it used to be. I like the black king on c7. Um, you know, he's holding the weaknesses. It's not fun, right? It's not a fun position for black, but it seems like it seems playable. Um, you know, you can look at rookie eight here. Yeah, you can trade on c4, play f6, try to play, uh, you know, maybe rook d8 even, I would say. Okay, just, yeah, rook d8 is, looks interesting. So now we can trade. Do you think, what, what do you think about that endgame? Do you think white has a good winning chance or do you think black is able to hold? I mean, it's a, like, like it doesn't look that bad for black right it doesn't look right. horrendous for black like i can see how he can go king c7 knight b6 i mean yes he has even weaknesses even with the dark squared pawns and f6 and e5 right so i see that yeah. but at the same time it doesn't feel like i mean that you know when white goes for this end game he's guaranteed to win right yeah that's a good point but but white could also play rook c1 with a quick 95 coming and this uh Actually, that this looks more really annoying. Tough. Yeah, I think yeah. White actually wants to keep the rooks on the board. Yeah, indeed. Uh, but we have a move by Richie. He played the move Bishop G four. But now, what is, what is his idea? I guess after F three, he wants to go F six to solve his problems tactically. But it's looking like he wants to go Bishop D seven back. It looks tough. Yeah, interesting that he decided to keep the bishop on the board. Um, F three. Bishop d7. I guess he doesn't, he don't want to help the knight come to c4, right? He prefers to keep that knight on the side of the board for as long as possible. I would say that that makes sense, actually. I mean, his light squared bishop is not a bad piece, so I can see why he didn't want to trade it. Um, you know, you know, to be honest, my feeling is that black will make a draw in this game. Uh, just judging by the dynamics, right? Because like, if you, uh, if you kind of think that white's advantage was almost twice as big when we started this position, and like now where it is, I mean, the trend is going in Black's favor. And I mean, I know he's very resourceful, right? So even though, let's say, he might not be enjoying this position so much, but I know that's just my feeling that where this game is going is in a pretty decent direction for Richard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And we have another move in um, um, the, the game of Hikaru, not a move I am... A- Big fan of to be honest. After b3, Ooh. he castled kingside, and now Fabiano played f3, trying to open up uh, wow. that side of the board. Interesting. You know, we basically never looked at castling at all because we we're always looking at black running king d7 to c7. Um, so the king on the king on g8, of course, is very open. Um, but you know, I guess he's gonna be protecting it with his queen, so he might even. Play a move like queen g7 just to cover all the squares around the king. I rather like that move. I like the protection it gives to the king. And then um, in mm-hmm. case white takes, do we take with the h-bomb or do we take with the bishop or with the queen? Or the queen, yeah. That's a good question. I mean, h-pawn makes a certain amount of sense. It keeps the knight out from f3, but it also sort of completely closes the g-file for any play. Queen g4 might allow the white queen in to h6. Um, that actually looks a bit annoying. Um, yeah. On the other hand, yeah, you have some rook f4 ideas that you can consider, but probably you don't want that queen in. So I guess, yeah. So I guess we can play bishop takes g4, keep the g file open for some counterplay, you know, having h4, h3 ideas. Um, in the position he played queen g7 okay good uh-huh. okay so queen g7 played but yeah to me it, it seemed quite weird to castle king side because this is really the side that's going to open up and like with king g7 and king c7 it felt like the king was sitting a lot safer um yeah. so let's see i do expect fabiano to take 
and then you're uh, advocating for Bishop Takes, I believe? Yeah, Bishop Takes. I mean, I guess ideally you could go King H7, Queen H6, and I think we would like a queen trade in these positions. But yeah, you know, what I liked about the king being on D7 is that it was also like protecting those center pawns in a way, right? In case there's any end game, the king would be well placed. Like here, you always have to watch out for like knight C4, but yeah, it looks like things, things are under control for the most part. But yeah, the king's safety could be an issue for black here. Yeah. Um... Right, because the problem is like, let's say white makes a move like rook 81, right? If we go king h7, now white can play knight f3 because there's no bishop takes h3 due to a uh, knight g5 check, which uh, is a problem. Um, and yeah, if if the knight lands on g5, it's always super annoying because opponent d6 is under attack. So let's see how Fabiano is going to proceed here, but there might be some, some problems if white takes on g4. Yeah, by the way, we have a new giveaway, guys. Uh, if you go to X Clan Mark Hawaii, it is live right now. And um, you, if you donate to, um, uh, if you donate uh, for the Games of Love charity, um, they will be, um, well, they will be donating $10 <laughs> when you install the free extension. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is this is the Capital One shopping extension, which actually I use, uh, you know, to get get discount uh, offers and make sure I get the best price on my purchases. So yeah, this is a quite a special giveaway. I mean, I would love a trip to Hawaii. Yeah, indeed, for sure. Make sure to uh, to join in for this one. So type in exclamation mark Hawaii. They will bring you there, and you can win a. Uh, a you can win a trip to Hawaii, hotel flights, and more. All of that is covered, even a trip to a pineapple farm. Um, but if you add the extension, uh, Capital One, uh, there will be a $10 donation made for you. So that's a way to, to enter into the raffle for free. And as you mentioned, that extension will tell you, like, let's say you're about to check out. It will tell you, like, hey, you can get a better deal here. So it's literally win, 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 right? You get an extension that will tell you about discounts you get into you get entered into a huge raffle to win a trip to hawaii and once again it all supports charity so definitely make sure to check that check out that extension you guys and uh, make sure to enter into this one because you can win a free trip to hawaii yeah that would be pretty amazing um so good luck to you guys i hope whoever uh needs this trip the most will be able to win it and uh, let's take a look. So yeah, Caruana has taken on G4 and we're now waiting for Hikaru's response. So um, we're not thrilled with where he put his king, right? Let's be honest about that. Um, you know, he's going to have to be a little careful here, mm, but I don't think anything, anything, uh, irretrievably bad has happened either. Mm-hmm. So bishop takes g4, and you said h3, and then rook ad1 is what we're looking at. Right. Um, so I guess, I guess... Know, he might want to get the rooks off the board. That's actually probably what Hikaru is going for. Um, and by the way, guys, in terms of what you can win is a trip to Hawaii for two for a week or $10,000. So you would have that choice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, indeed. So uh, uh, for sure. So even if you don't want to make the trip to Hawaii, then you can uh, take the ten thousand dollars. That's uh, that's possible as well. So make sure to check it out, you guys. Type in exclamation mark Hawaii. Oh, by the way, Benjamin, let's do a trivia mm -hmm. for the for the viewers. So, mm -hmm. in what year did I play my first game with Hikaru? Oh. I don't know if anyone's going to know this. This is a, this is pretty tough. The I guess it must be some sort of youth championship. Right? Okay, I'm going to give you a, t well, that, that's the thing. It's not because I'm a few years older than him. And um, I'll give you a really big clue. It actually took place in Hawaii. So that's a clue. I mean, there's almost no way you guys could have guessed it without that hint. But now to the Hawaii 2005? Hint, 2005. Yeah, you think so, right? No, I've already played him a bunch of times by 2005, you know? um 99 
99. You're getting very close. Very, very close, guys. I see some 99s in there. 2001. 2001, I think I played him for my second time. It was actually a game where I made my first GM norm in a tournament we played in in New York. But in fact, okay, yeah, it was 1998, guys, and it was at the U.S. Uh, I don't, don't remember if it's the U.S. Open or the U.S. Masters because it was two consecutive events in Hawaii that year in the summer of 1998. And Hikaru was very young back then. I mean, uh, I guess he must have been around master level already. Yeah, that he, he was, mm -hmm. right, because he became a, a master around uh, age 10. I think, and um, and it was a uh, it was a Richter Rouser, and I was black, and uh, and uh, I lost that game. <laughs> so <No. laughs> yeah, was, uh, unfortunately, after all the good story, the ending was was a little bit sad for me. You know, it's like in that game, I actually forgot about what the time control was. So I, I guess I thought there was a second time control. There wasn't. I got into time trouble, and I wound up losing. And um, you know. Yeah, and after that, he got, you know, a lot, a lot better very fast. So, um, so yeah, that's just a fun memory. So, like, can you imagine, guys, 1998, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> almost 25 years ago that I was playing Hikaru for the first time? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so, I was just wondering, we can also take with, uh, with the pawn, and we're already at almost $3,000 raise. So, you guys are doing great stuff over here. Yeah, awesome, guys. Um, and you're wondering what books I have. Well, we got 100 Endgames, You Must Know, uh, Lessons from a Grandmaster by Boris Gulko, Essence of Chess Strategy by uh, a guy who I'm not so familiar with, Latanovich, and The King's Indian Warfare by Ilya Smirin. Mm -hmm, so, nice. uh, you know, I have, I have a big collection of chess books, but um, these are the ones that are like close to me right now. Right. Um, Benjamin, yeah, some, when, some nice moves. have you played Hikaru? Yeah, I've played him twice. So the first time I played him, or, I mean, or do we want to let the people guess again? Uh, let's say, let, let's see. Well, let me, um, tell, tell us how old you are, Benjamin, and I'm going to try to guess the year. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> then it will be too easy. You can just do the math. Well, no, it's still a challenge, but make it a little easier for us. Um... It was. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, not put it this that, way. I'm not saying how old you were then. I'm saying how old you are now. Tell us how old you are now, so I can like make an okay. approximate. Yeah. Guess. Uh, I'm 27 years old. All right. So how old could you have been when you played Hikaru? Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. I'm gonna make a guess that you played him 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like you were, you were like 17. How's that? Am I close? Uh, no. Okay. No. No, no but you're not too far off. Let's try again. You played him seven years ago when you were 20. No. No. So I, I played him. I played him in Gibraltar. Ah, Gibraltar. Okay. Well, that doesn't help very much, Benjamin, because, you know, those I think, tournaments were every single although, year. I, I think um, this might give it away, but I think you were also there. During that okay, time. that's that gives it away a little bit because I think my last time in Gibraltar, it was actually a little while ago. It might have been like 2016 or 2015. Uh, I haven't been there in a while, um, and there was a time I was going there every year. So, well, I guess I would guess like 2015. No, no. Else, I didn't play him that year, but that, that was a year he won uh, with a, quite a dominant performance. I think he scored like eight and a half out of ten. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hikaru was doing really well in Gibraltar. He won several times there. Yeah. Oh, by the way, guys, um, in order to give away the trip to Hawaii, we need to reach twenty five hundred installations. Um, but if we get to five thousand installations, we're able to give away a paid trip to the world chess championship with like vip tickets to the games and the hotel and spending money so mm -hmm. um 
that's some incentive. So yeah. we got either we need 2,500 installations or 5,000 installations. So uh, just keep that in mind um, yeah. if you're interested in those prizes. Yeah, so definitely make sure to check it out, you guys, because if you install the extension, $10 will be donated for you. So you're basically donating money for charity for free. And uh, you will be entered into the raffle. So it's basically like a free lottery ticket. So uh, type an exclamation mark extension, get it. And by getting the extension, you will be offered better deals when you're about to check out. I think you you mentioned, right, Arena, how you uh, use it. Yeah, I do use it. Yeah, somehow I... I, I downloaded it a little while ago and, you know, everything's been fine. <laughs> you know, I know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. And, you know, Capital One checks in with me sometimes and tells me, yes, you've gotten the best price on this on this product. So where sometimes it has some other ideas uh, for where you can get it a little bit cheaper. Um, mm -hmm. So. So let's uh, let's see where we are in the position. He took with the H pawn, Benjamin. Um, and that surprises us a little bit, doesn't it? Because it kind of closes right. out the G file play. I'm really a little concerned about, you know, where this is going uh, for Hikaru. Um, I think he, you know, because I would even say, you know what I'm concerned about that even if he gets the rooks off the board, like both pairs, right? and gets to relative safety for his king, I'm still kind of concerned about this pawn on g4. I'm concerned about one day, in case there's a queen trade, the king coming out to f2 and g3 and attacking the pawn really easily, um, about a knight coming to f1 and e3, attacking the pawn. I'm actually kind of concerned about that g4 pawn because it's kind of a closer to white's, white's position can be more of a target. Yeah, and um, yeah, just as... Someone pointed out in the chat that just typing exclamation mark extension or exclamation mark Y does not enter you into the raffle. You will uh, have to install the the uh, the giveaway by by installing the extension. And once again, it's free. You get yeah. automatic. It's interesting in the chat. We're asked uh, why are the commentators, why are the casters so biased towards Hikaru? Well, I mean, obviously, we were you know we were invited to commentate on his channel and we're, we're here to support him. I mean, um, so I'm really excited that he qualified for this tournament that we got, you know, two Americans in the candidates tournament. Um, I think it'd be pretty cool if they finished like one and two and maybe there was a match between them in the end to play, uh, to play for the world championship if Carlson do doesn't want to. Um, but yeah, I mean, mm, this is a pretty big game, you know, because how you start a tournament is very important, right? Like it gives you, can either give you confidence or set you back. Um, and the way this game was going, I was really quite pleased with how he handles everything. But the last couple of moves make me a little bit, you know, more nervous as it does feel like his initiative on the king side <clears throat> is not really there anymore. And it's more right. like, how does Black liquidate things and get to some sort of relative safety where his weakened king is not going to be so much of a problem? Yeah. And I was wondering, like, can we try to trade everything down? But I think the problem is White is going to take with the knight. And knight can jump to g3 to five. There's also c4 to really climb down on the d5 break. So some problems to solve here for Hikar, and they don't seem to be uh, you know it's not easy to solve. So them. very interesting, Benjamin, that like, Literally, Black's problems stem from the position of his king. Like everything that he has would actually be okay. Like even a G4 pawn, but just put the king on C7 or B8. And then everything is beautiful. You got protection for D6. You can even play Rook H8 and play on the, on, on the H file. It's really the position of the king on G8 that is like so unfortunate for Black at this point. Yeah. Um, all right. So. Uh, a lot of people are asking for the game of Ding. So a lot of moves have been played here. Let's have a, a look. So we thought that White should have a, quite a comfortable advantage. I'm not sure how I feel about this 94 move because, I don't know, now it looks like Black should be doing um, fine rook d4, h6 was played. 
22 and rook a8 but this could actually be pretty dangerous for ding because let's say you make a move like rook d1 right it looks very logical black is going to go g5 and if you take then with rook h6 you're getting checkmated really easily the queen coming to h2 bishop h3 how do you deal with all of this if you're white yeah, well, this actually looks like a really big problem because what's going on is uh, that black is starting an attack on the flank and the center is under control, right? This is a very important ingredient in a successful attack is that, you know, the, um, you have control over the center. And in this position, you know, the knight on d5 basically blocks like uh, blocks uh, three of white's pieces, right? So that's, th you know, uh, almost 20 points of material that is currently not able to do much on the d file, you know, by one knight. And uh, white's doubled pawn on e3, also, you know, not helping out very much in terms of opening up any sort of counterplay for white. And even if white plays b5, you know, black just ignores it. So I actually think that Ding is in some serious trouble. Uh, white has, black has like very easy moves to make. He's already completely prepared his pieces for this move g5. Yeah. And, and it's uh, it's quite interesting. Like in this position, you know what is coming. Right? You know that the move g5 is coming, but uh, what do we do against it, right? Yeah, I mean, it looks like White is just going to have to sack the exchange on d5 to open up that center at some point. He just has to time it. So, like, let's say we look at like rook c1, right? So that mm -hmm. way, when you sack the exchange, your rook will be on an open file. So g5 and. I don't know. We can take immediately, but then when they just take an h4, it doesn't look that appealing. Yeah, this does seem... There's always this knight d6 jump, though, which, you know, hits a lot of stuff. But yeah. I don't know if it really uh, works out. Is there a better way to do this than taking on h4 as a bishop g4 to just protect your queen, threats in e2, and threaten pawn takes h4? Yeah, that might be a nice move, yeah, because then knight c6 just runs into rook to d8 and white's in a world of trouble and still your king side is just getting uh, ripped open. Um, so looking tough for Ding and maybe Nepo can get off to a hot start again. I mean, we know that last year he won the candidates. He won in the very first game with a black piece against Anish Giri and he, that gave him the momentum to... Well, it, it's kind of interesting. He started off the first half really well then he lost that game to MVL, right? And that's when the candidates was postponed. And later on, I heard Anish Giri say in an interview that that was taken into consideration by the Russians to postpone it. Because like Nepo, he's known to tilt, right? After a loss. So they were like, okay, let's give him a year to come back from that. And he did. Wow. Yeah, uh, it's true. It was quite clear at the end of that tournament, that first half that, I mean, the break was coming at a good time for him. You know, after you lose a game, uh, what's better than like, you know, one year break to recover from it right. when and he starts the tournament as the leader again? Yeah. And actually, he was also getting sick around that time. Uh, so it, maybe it was um, taken yeah. into uh, consideration. Yeah. Well, you know, overall, I mean, that whole tournament was, I mean, it was held at a very chaotic time. And so... Um, you know, you can't blame the organizers either way, I think. Um, but yeah, it worked out for him, you know, and he was able to capitalize on that break. Um, so right now, it looks like he's just doing very nicely against Ding. Yeah, th this has worked out in the worst possible way for Ding, because like just letting Black's pieces gather on the king side, not really any major counterplay for him in the center or on the queen side. Um, in terms of other interesting games, I suppose we can take a look at the game Rajaba Feruzia, which we haven't seen in a while. Um, this is where Feruzia sacked the exchange on with rook takes b2. Right, yeah. So we left off after rook takes b2. White took, takes c4, rooks. Wait, huh? Why did he not go knight to d3? I mean, this wins back the exchange. I could imagine that maybe he was worried about, let's say, queen c2. And queen c4. And yeah. He right. didn't like that. Huh. But queen d5, and then he kind of manages to escape with his knight, yeah? Or bishop takes a3 to defend the knight over here. But I can imagine... Wait, what is that turtle? And <laughs> But I can imagine if he was scared of this one. <laughs> of which one? That turtle in the chat. <laughs> the turtle in the chat, I was like, I didn't notice it. 
I didn't really wait. Do you have BTTV installed? No, I don't. I don't. Um, maybe so, it's better that way. So, I guess yeah. you just see a ha in all caps. Oh, that's right. I see ha in all caps. And is there, is there in fact, a turtle there? <laughs> uh, there's a turtle. <laughs> yeah. Like, look at the, look at the, look at the stream. That's, that's how it looks like if you have BTTV installed. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see but a turtle. Yeah. But it's I probably better for your own sanity. Like, what, what do the chatters think? It probably is better for your own sanity not to in install BTTV. Yeah, right. So I can just see a bunch of letters coming up on the screen and not really. Yeah, you'll, <laughs> right now you'll just see a bunch of tur uh, like a bunch of letters and also probably you see people saying like CAC W or like or like Monka. Yeah, it's exactly Monka. what I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. that, that's also when I got into Twitch, I was like, what are these degenerates saying? Like, what what are these words? Yeah. I mean, why don't they just speak normal English? But it's this uh, stuff, yeah, the BTTV. All right, so maybe maybe you can show me how to install that later. Uh, BTTV? Uh, yeah, let me, I think you'd get it if you go to better yeah. TTV. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> we'll do that later. Uh, yeah. Okay, so queen, um, queen D5 would have been okay for black. So yeah, surprisingly, he didn't try to win the exchange back. So let's see what he did. Uh, all right, so... After bishop d5, Rajal played rook e1. So it's it's just a transposition, right? We looked at rook b1, and now the rook swings back to e1. So it's basically the same position, rook e1, queen a and queen c2. And so we looked at this a while ago. We thought that maybe black should take on a3. But does black have enough compensation? Like, let's say you take here. What is going to happen? Especially before is a threat. Uh -huh. So he's thinking about this move right now. Should he take that pawn? So... All right, we actually looked at something like almost exactly like this, didn't we? So knight of g5, or actually, why not knight eg5? Because that's sort of the obvious one. Knight eg5, let's try that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So knight. let's say g6. G6, yeah. And so basically, I mean, what do you want to do here? You want to play h6 at some point or... Maybe you want to, no, you can't play, take on g2 yet. Maybe one day. You want to play bishop b4. Yeah, you want to win the exchange. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm kind of thinking that he actually wants this complexity in the position to play for a win for Ruzio. Yeah, I think so too. I think definitely his, his opening choice signals that he just wants to go all out to try and beat Rajab with the black pieces. I guess he just feels like, you know, this is a tournament where only first place counts. Rajab played pretty badly in Norway, just so I think that's why he's just going for it. And actually, he has just captured a pawn on a three. Now, white could also move this knight here, because now g6 is kind of out of the question, right? Because it allows knight yeah. of six. Mm -hmm. So I assume you have to go knight g6, because just to illustrate our threat, we want to go knight of six check and queen h7. Nice line. So he has to go knight g6. Mm -hmm. Knight g6, and then and then h4. So getting some sort of initiative. Okay, you can't take the pawn. Um, hmm. But what if you do this? This should be. Yeah, five. but he might be this happy to give back the exchange, right? Just go h5, keep going, and. Um, uh, we can just. Queen takes. Oh, and now there's no threat h7, but I guess this h6 and yeah. with these knights and queen f4 should be pretty strong. coming in uh-huh so yeah okay white needs to like create some initiative here for sure because i mean he can't just sit with this in kind of a passive position and it's interesting huh so like knight fg5 is just a way better move than knight eg5 because of the right. way that there is no g6 move uh-huh yeah, so let's see what black should do after h4. It's looking pretty tough. I think if you go h6, we just go h5. And it takes... Yeah. We take over here. This also yeah. looks quite problematic. I mean, Actually, you know, now that I'm looking at this more, I mean, I, I, I see the problems up ahead for black, which were not obvious in the beginning. Uh, someone in the chat, by the way, asked, how do you know if you're going to Hawaii? I mean, 
You don't know. You're at, you're entering into a raffle, but as we said before, you can enter into the raffle for free by getting the extension. So type in exclamation mark extension. They will provide you guys with a link. Uh, $10 will be donated for you. And uh, that way you enter into the raffle. And you can win an amazing prize. You can win a trip to Hawaii. You can also opt out of that and just claim uh, uh, $10,000. Yeah, and when are we going to announce who wins? I think we announce at the end, Benjamin, right? At the mm -hmm. end of the event, we will uh, figure out who won that trip. Right. The plane and will say Hawaii on it, yeah. Uh, and just to remind you guys, just typing in exclamation mark extension does not enter. You have to follow that link. Mm -hmm. right? Let me post it here in the chat. And Clef just subscribed for 17 months. So thank you, Clef. And Follow that link, and then you will be entered into, uh, into the raffle. So what do we have on the board? He's still thinking what to do after Bishop A3. How is his time situation? It's not too bad. So actually, um, wow, Ferruzia has used up a lot of time because he had a huge time edge, and now it is pretty close yeah um so i would say rajabov is coming out of this just fine as long as he finds this knight fg5 move he's gonna have an initiative so i i mean i hope he finds it because his position needs it for sure yeah i think if you make a slow move here well first of all bishop before is a threat but let's say we would play this position you know let's say we go rook d1 right so if bishop before we have rook e3. Well, here, black can play, let's say, something like h6, making sure knight g5 is never prone. And I think here, black's doing great. He's got the two bishops really controlling the board. This knight is super annoying. And, you know, we can always play move like a5, bring the rook into the game. And here, black is doing great, I would uh, think. But actually, as we speak, Hikaru has, uh, has moved. Yes, I was just going to say, let's take a look at his game because he played d5. Mm -hmm. Um interesting move okay so his intentions are clear he wants to play you know d4 yes and get like improve his situation with the pawns mm -hmm. so basically we're expecting white to take and then he's going to take with the pawn but that pawn can get attacked on e5 and then like uh, well how does it get attacked if he goes rook f e1 we might be able to play rook f5 right yeah but of course, here there's always knight up on a g3, which is super annoying. Um, yeah, so how can he protect that pawn? Um, e4, I mean, yeah, e4 is what white is trying to provoke to make all of white black's pawns go to these light squares. It's getting a little tricky, right? And, yeah. and yeah, sometimes there's this move c4, which just kind of, I mean, it's a simple move to breaking up those pawns, but he's kind of get, getting left with a lot of weaknesses. Yeah. Um, the position looks a little concerning, says uh, KEB03. There will probably be a long end game with a lot of suffering. Well, um, yeah, I agree. I agree that the position is looking concerning as uh, Black has a lot of things to try to hold on to in this position. You know, the king, the pawns in the center, the G4 pawn, and White's position is more compact, right? So that's what's going on. Uh, Bobby did take the pawn on d5. And so now if we take on f1, it's just knight takes f1, right? Yeah. Uh, and we have more moves. Fabiana did trade on d5. So now, yeah, rook d1 is a move. And as you mentioned, if we take, then white's going to take with the knight. I can come always out of g3. Or, you know, the queen can move somewhere let's say here, and then I can come out of E3. So it's already looking a bit tough, I would say, for three car. Let's see what right. Fabiana's going to do. So after Rook D E1, I mean, yeah, there is some move like Queen B6, but I don't really see White doing that. I don't see, okay, it's like a double attack. There's Queen E7. It doesn't look like necessarily a great path for White. So... Rook d1 makes a lot of sense. It's like a very simple move. I think it's going to be his choice. So rook d1. Um, mm -hmm. And okay, let's say we play, well, e4, we already know there's a c4 idea, right? Right. 
Man, it's so concerning, yeah, what's going on with the Black King, you know, because there's lots of heavy pieces on the board. You know, the white white bishop on e6 is not the best. Um, so, okay, after rook takes f1 here. Mm -hmm. So what if I play, I don't know, rook takes f1. Right, but here maybe I mean, we can get it. You know, maybe we can take on c4 and yeah. a quick queen d4 could solve the problems here. Yeah. That's right. So actually, Black would love that queen trade. Um, right. He put it on the board, yeah, or d1. All right, so now maybe e4, but why can they be take here first? Because then if we take with the rook, why go c4? And we can never get this queen d4 idea. And actually, if we take here, the problem is white takes an e4, hits the bishop. And in other positions, our rook is on d8, so we always had this queen d4 move. But here it seems quite problematic. We can play something like queen f6, with the idea being that if you take everything, then we have queen f2 and queen f1 in the end. Mm -hmm. But it looks really loose. Like g4 is loose, e4 is loose. Doesn't feel that convincing to me. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's getting kind of miserable. Like even the simple idea of like knight f1 to g3 and just getting the knight, inching him closer to the king side. The, the bishop on d5 is quite poor. So um, I think at this point, if Hikaru can get a draw from this position, he will be extremely happy. Um, you know, and of course, it is a little sad that, you know, he had a quite nice opening and middle game there, and it, it is going downhill for the moment. So um, I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but, you know, at the moment, things are not going super well. So we got to hope that he's just going to hold on here. Yeah. But let's say we don't play E4, right? I mean, what else can we really do here? It feels like pretty much anything else loses material. Because I, I think in E4 is probably first you have to try to hang on to yeah. this pawn. And as we mentioned, taking here doesn't solve the problems at all with this knight come to G3. Yeah. No, I think, okay, E4... So it's e4 is a normal move. So we're very likely to see this line, right? e4 and rook takes f8. That's basically what Fabi needs to find is that he needs to make that rook trade. That's the only right. difficult part. And so now, well, okay, what else do we have? Like, so there's queen f6. Yeah, queen e5. Is there any point to that? I think I can just take. Because if rook e8, there's knight of 6 Knight of six. Yeah, you have a little tactic. Um... But I mean, after queen of six, uh, it's not great. But maybe for the moment we can hang on, right? Yeah. We defend most of the pe most of the weak points in our position. And if rook f one, I guess we just go here. And mm -hmm. I mean, it is also a pass pawn, so it's something White has to take into consideration. Yeah, I wonder. So, like, if there's a rook trade, does that at least make Black's life? Easier, I guess it does. I mean, there's still, you know, there's still knight f1. Let's let's try that. I'm just kind of curious as in like, I guess the issue here for white is it's hard for them to secure their king because they can't really play h3. So when they put their knight on g3, there's always this queen a1 check, right? That's right. the problem. And they can't really move their queen from e3 because then the pawn get, gets going and it's actually good for black. So here, you know, yeah, here black can hold. So basically black needs to get the rook off the board. That is going to be important for him. Yeah, and as we speak, we now also have Hikaru in the live feed. He's on the left of you, Arena. So just keep sending him your energy, you guys. That, that's really what he needs right now because the position is not looking easy. Yeah, but I'm sure if we collectively root for him, <laughs> but, you know, he's going to be able to pull this out and we're going to have a, a good ending to this game. Um, yeah. Is putting the bishop in f5 an advantage to black after the rook trade? Ah, you know, the bishop is all right on the diagonal he's on. So basically, yeah, Hikaru is thinking now, but he's gonna realize he doesn't have a whole lot of choices. It's getting a little lower on the clock, which you can mm -hmm. also, you can see um, is a sign that he's experiencing some difficulties because he was quite a bit ahead on the clock at some point by like 20 minutes. Um, and, and then we're going to head to this position where like one pair of rooks is going to get traded and he's going to have to figure out like a second 
way to get the rooks off the board. We can play a few more moves, like to see how this is going to go. So e4, mm -hmm. rook f8, uh, rook takes f8 and c4, queen f6. Like, yeah, pawn takes d5, bishop d5. Okay, so now we let's think about how white can improve this position. Um, I would say knight f1 maybe. is a very reasonable move. Right, so let's say I just wait. Yeah, knight g3. Uh -huh. so now you, you can't wait with like you know moves like king g7 or king h7 right because then you always let's say i go rook f7 is that mm. i mean hmm, it looks tough yeah but that's the it's a crazy idea there yeah with knight h1 to f2 to try to win this ball right. and like Actually, and also to attack g4, I guess, and maybe have queen g3 ideas. Interesting. Yeah, that's a nasty idea, yeah. The knight coming to... Um, the problem with black's two. position is the passivity. It's actually that it's very difficult for black to really improve beyond, you know, what he has. Yeah. Um, all right. So we also yeah. got word that Nepo apparently is doing very well. So king h2 was the move that Ding played. Um, I wonder what the idea is if black goes g aha uh -huh. is that is to go rook h1 and if you take king g1 and solve the problems that way but Nepo just played bishop g4 which seems to be a clever move because normally you would play rook e1 right but now we go g5 and now if you go rook h1 then you leave this pawn hanging over here and Nepo is also building up a big time advantage just 45 minutes against 25 and that's when Nepo is the most dangerous, you know, when he's playing quickly, when he is the initiative. Yep. So it's looking really tough for Dane. Yeah, Nepo is definitely a really good attacking player. Like, I feel like he's he's going to be very comfortable in this position. And, um, I mean, yeah, attacking the E2 pawn, what are we even supposed to do on that? Like, it is a nice pawn, and Black wouldn't mind taking it. Um, you know, rookie one is super passive. Yeah, rook f6 ideas, g5 ideas. So difficult to play this position for Ding. But so he played knight a5, which seems to be a clever move because he's hitting the pawn on b7. He's basically giving up this one. I guess if g5, he still wants to go rook h1 and takes uh, king g1. And you're sort of hold, holding on for the moment. And if black plays b6, then he has this tactic with knight takes c6 and rook takes d4. Five. So, what if Black just goes Rook here? Well, yeah, maybe D five then. Uh -huh. The same so he idea. To do the same tactic. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So maybe Black has to actually act quickly, and maybe he doesn't have time to mess around with um, with Rook E seven. So what is his like fastest move that he can play? There's no way he's going to give up the uh, like take on E two and give up the B seven pawn. Is there? Right, because I mean, the knight's swing back to c5. Uh, so I feel like you're, you know, the white should be doing more or less okay. Yeah, okay. So let's let's not do that. So knight a5. Okay, well, rook f6 is actually very interesting, right? Because it's a very big question to white. How do you want to protect the f2 pawn? Right. It's a good question. By the way, in the meantime, Hikaru has moved. Uh, he played the move e4, which we consider to be uh, the best defensive move. So let's see what uh, Fabiano is going to do here. Also, Hikaru now is down almost 10 minutes on the clock, which isn't problematic for the moment. He only needs to make 14 more moves to reach the time control. But, you know, it's uh, something to, to keep in mind, especially since there's no increment. And in that game between Rajabov and Furusha, they're going the down the line that we mentioned. Yeah, that is good news for Rajabov because now he has seized the initiative. Right, so do you think, I mean, it seems that he is doing well, right, in this very first game against Ferruja. Do you think he's capable of literally surprising everyone and maybe uh, having a good showing in this tournament? Yeah, you're right with that first part. It would surprise, <laughs> <laughs> it would surprise everyone, Benjamin, yeah. I mean, because, you know, Rajabov is not, you know, the most active player these days. Um, I think he recently got, you know, 
got remarried uh, sometime this year. So there was some, some uh, changes in his, uh, in his life. Maybe that's going to give him some extra inspiration, but you know, he hasn't been super active over the board uh, for the last couple of years, really. I guess he's played online. I'm trying to remember his last tournament. Uh, and I feel, oh yeah, I'll tell you his last tournaments. I researched this. It was, um, it was a Norway chess that just ended, you know, a few days ago. And actually he had a quite a, you know, poor event, right? Like finishing at the bottom of the tournament, um, which, you know, is not the best way to enter the candidates, I think, but, you know, would it surprise me if he did really well? I mean, yeah, with all of those factors, um, you know, playing less often than the other players, um, you know, he, I don't think he's played in a candidates tournament previously as well, right? Wait, sorry, who? Rajabov. Oh, no, Rajabov has played in 2013 and he had a, also Rajabov played in 2011. Oh, yeah. oh wow. When it was a Three knockout event. Yeah. And uh, he lost in the quarterfinals to Kramnik. And in 2013, he had a really tough uh, tournament. Yeah. He came in last place with four that's, points out of 14 games. Wow, that's why I can't remember it. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. He did play that. That was the key tournament. Actually, I, I, I should remember that because there's a well-known game, Magnus Carlsen versus Rajabov and some nice, uh, in some Nimzo, in fact, I think from that candidate right. tournament. Right, so of course he was there. Um, and that was an important game that Magnus, you know, I think wound up winning and you know, eventually qualified to play a non from that candidates. So, right. But he hasn't played in a while. Right. So it's been like, you know, almost 10 years since he's played a candidates, um, you know, surprises are possible, but, um, but it certainly would be, you know, somewhat of a surprise, but so far this game is going well for him. I mean, you know, sometimes the most solid player winds up winning these things, right. Maybe not the most spectacular, not the most, uh, not the fan favorite necessarily. I remember talking to Kasparov some years ago. He asked me who I thought was going to win the candidates. And it was the candidates that Karyakin wound up winning. Right. And, you know, I was like, well, Gary, you're, you're the expert. Why don't you tell me? You know, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> and he actually said, you know, he actually said that he thinks Karyakin is a strong possibility. You know, and I think that was like right. when Aronian was maybe ranked like number two in the world or like very high up. But he put, you know, and, you know, to me, it wasn't obvious that Karyakin had good chances. But, you know, Gary's experience, you know, intuition proves correct, right? That, like, just someone who's, like, very steady actually has the best chances. And, you know, Rajabov, I don't know. I mean, I think he can be very steady. Um, he has that element, you know, that kind of element of solidity to his play. Um, and maybe if his opponents see him as a bit of a target that he can actually use that to his advantage. And like, like, you know, like Feruzia, you know, Feruzia is certainly taking some risks against him and maybe he can, um, he can use that. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, just in the candidates, it's a long tournament. It's 14 rounds. So you just have to keep it together, so to speak. And even if you lose a game early on, you just have to keep playing solid games, right? Like, like, let's say you lose a game early on, then it might be very easy. Like, Oh, now I have to win games. Right. So you might take risks, when you're black, but generally the strategy that you have to adopt is just, you know, still be solid with black. Uh, if the game ends in a draw, it's fine. Then you try to press again with white and chances will come later on. Generally, the winning score is only something like plus three. So if you stick around 50% for a long time, it's not a problem. Like you just have to win a game, of course, at some point, And then all of a sudden you're uh, very much in it. Yeah, I agree. You know, you need, you need like, to be in it for the long race, you know, it definitely requires a lot of stamina. And just to remember that, you know, one game is not uh, the end of the world. Um, and by the way, you know, Nepo has actually found that move Rook F6 and G5, right? So like uh -huh. kind of confirming our uh, understanding of him as like a very good player in these positions with the initiative, finds this very precise move Rook F6 sends the king back to g1 so there's no more rook h1 idea and then goes g5 so it's brilliant right yeah no, he's playing this really well like rook f6 was, was such a well-timed move and now g5 and i don't really see how ding can keep this together i mean politics uh h4 is coming once again if you trade on g5 you're opening yourself up for a disaster with the rook coming to h6 
uh, and you're just getting check managers. Illustrator Black is going to give a check over here. This bishop is defending your king for now, but we just go bishop h3, trade off the bishops, and it's just going to be checkmate. So really tough for Ding, who's also getting down to 20 minutes at this point. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty tough when you're just facing the move G takes H4. And I mean, I guess then H takes G3 and then just Queen G5, maybe just attacking E3 would be like the ultimate goal. Um, but, you know, there's but actually, some, yeah. Actually, there might be another idea. Can we? Yeah, H3. Yeah, can we right? H3? Right. Because if you step the bishop back, there's H2. And amongst and, others, oh, there, I, yeah. there's this funny idea of going bishop h3 and bishop g2. Because if you take, there's... Uh, that is very <laughs> funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that move has a lot of humor to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's going to be having, of course, lots of fancy ways to win this if he's just allowed to break in like that. But I don't exactly understand... Uh, Okay, so let, like let's let's try the b5 move, right? Like so white just desperately going for counterplay. You let me take an h4 and I take on c6. And now so I take throw in that. Uh -huh. Because the problem is if you stop to take my c6 pawn, I mean knight d5 is annoying, right? I mean knight c6. Yeah, and all of a sudden, you know, if this knight collapses, uh, as you mentioned before. Black is losing the stability in the center, and that's sort of his main ingredient for the successful attack. And white starts uh, annoying him. Rook takes d5, hitting the queen. So what do you do in... Oh, this might... Queen e5 might be a nasty move, because you cannot take, because your rook on a1 is hanging. Mm, wow, okay. That's a tricky move, right? Queen e5. Yeah. And if I take on... I don't know, B7, am I just getting mated? It's that bad. I rook F2 think so, bad. yeah. Or rook F2, yeah. 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 Well, it looks very dangerous for Ding. We're going to see what he does. Guys, we're going to take a break for a few short minutes. Hikaru, uh, Hikaru is um, has played E4 against Fabiano, and Fabi's in the, in the tank thinking about what to do there. Uh, Nepo is attacking, Report is surviving, and Rajabov has some initiative. And we will see you guys in a couple of minutes.
and welcome back everyone to the FIDE candidate tournament in Madrid. And we have more moves in the game between Fabiano Caruana and Hikaru Nakamura. After the move E4, Fabiano traded on F8. And after C4, we thought that Queen F6 was the move here, but Hikaru's played Rook to E8. What do you think, Irina? Yeah, I mean, it might not make a totally huge difference. I mean, yeah, it's a little sad to get off the open file. Um, doesn't make a huge difference for the uh, the direction of the game. Maybe not. Um, but yeah, I guess it gives White an extra opportunity to play Rook F1. Maybe even, um, maybe even Rook F4 at some point. So you kind of wonder, so Bishop takes D5, yeah, Rook F1. And rook f4, and then you can bring the knight to f1 if you get checked on a1. So, you know, rook e8, you know, is a little bit unfortunate because it gives white this extra idea. And at the same time, white can just go knight f1 to g3 like we talked about. Right, and, um, yeah. It's not the funnest position, yeah, because, you know, when we think about, like, what black used to have, like, beautiful pawns in the center like the center was closed there was an option of playing on the king side and when we compare it to this position you know king is really weak queens and rooks are still on the board bishop is bad pawn weaknesses i mean it's 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 a tough spot that he's in right now for sure and uh he's gonna need you know a lot of resourcefulness to, to hold this together yeah and fabiana just played the move knight of one now he has a couple ideas he can bring the knight of g3 to try to hop to the h5 or f5 square but he can also let's say move this queen out of the way and then go for 93 because how are you actually going to defend this pawn on g4 i like that even more that's very clever right we know that knights love those outpost squares in front of past pawns and it's actually really effective and this is, this is a chance for white to activate their queen as well right uh so yeah looking to for for hikaru and i don't see an easy way here to uh to hold it together um let's see we also have more moves in the game between ding loren and nepo they're going down that line that we actually mentioned ding took a b7 politics h4 knight c5 and h3 and we thought that white is just getting crushed here oh this is already on the board yeah we looked at all of yeah. this right so uh you can't go bishop f1 and you can't go bishop h1 so what are you left doing? Well, what happens on bishop e4, I guess, h2 anyway, and queen is coming to h3, so rook is coming to f2. Yeah, and now rook takes e4 and bishop f3 is a big threat, so I don't nice see it. I think you're just getting absolutely crushed here. Yeah. Wow, so beating Dingley Ren with the black pieces is going to be a really good start for Nepo. Yeah, that's going to be yeah. quite a shocker indeed. I mean, because it's not just like winning, but he kind of crushed him, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> kind of crushed him from an opening that wasn't looking that amazing for him. But, you know, the middle game went really well for him. Right. So I was just wondering, right? So Ding, he had, like, he played those tournaments in China, right? But aside from that, he had not played any over the board classical chess since the candidates from last year. Do you think he's maybe lacking? Do you think he's maybe a little bit rusty, or what do you what do you think? Oh, what do I think? Yeah, I mean, it could be that. It could be, you know, it could be karma, right? <laughs> like, I mean, you know, there is some controversy about him getting into the candidates, you know, based on these, you know, tournaments that were set up for him at the last minute to get the requisite number of games in, and they're. You know, the American players, I think they actually submitted some kind of protest to FIDE. Of course, nothing happens with that. But, you know, um, you know, there was definitely a feeling like it's not quite fair that, you know, in order to satisfy his requirements, you know, he could just set up tournaments. And, you know, who knows? Uh, he won those tournaments with very big scores. And I mean, when when you're um, playing, you know, like when it's set up like that, you know, there are concerns that, you know, his opponents were were ordered, you know, to give certain results like, uh, you know, happened to the old Soviet Union times, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's been seen in chess before. So, I mean, these are just, you know, um, you know, you, you can't really prove things like that, but there are some concerns about that, right? So, I mean, um, 
it, it could it could be like partially sometimes it works like that you know okay you get into the candidates but uh will you do your best if this was the way is if this was the way in right so right um yeah yeah, no, you raise a very good point because, yeah, those tournaments seemed very artificial. I think they were all like quadruple round robins. And the th so he played, it was a four player quadruple round robin. So he played three opponents four times. Yeah. And against all of them, he scored three and a half out of four. So it did seem a little bit, you know, weird how it all uh, got together. How it was uh, so perfect. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, like, I mean, I talked to, you know, so, I mean, I, I heard that like the, the American players who otherwise would have gotten the spot by rating, you know, definitely thought that this was not so fair and, um, and, you know, submitted a protest, not in the hopes that anything would be changed because, you know, in this, this point, like, you know, unless, you know, you have like hard proof, no one's going to change anything, but just to kind of have it on record that, you know, they did not agree with this kind of last minute tournament organization. So Anyway, yeah. but I mean, that's not, I mean, this is nothing against Ding because I, I have a lot of respect for him as a player. This is more like the context in which you find yourself. Sometimes you don't have a lot of control over these things. So I'm not saying that he's, uh, you know, in any way involved in anything like that. No, but the, um, but still how, how he qualified definitely raised a few question marks. Um, it is probably something FIDE will want to address in the future to, make sure people, you know, can't just organize last minute tournaments like that um, in their own country. So, um, um, you know, but in, in this game, yeah, certainly it has, it's not working out so well for him, you know, the first round. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I think especially Aronian and um, Wesley were affected by this because they were the, the yes. next two players in line who would otherwise get the spot. Yeah. So, it's interesting. Um, Random twenty five seventy eight is saying, "Is it fair that he can't travel anywhere to play, so he times out as an active player?" And is that fair? Well, it's not uh, necessarily fair for him, but I mean, it's this. This is not like a forced policy, right? Like no one says you you need to have a uh, you know zero COVID policy and like lock down cities for months on end. Um, you know, that's that's a choice, right? So, is it fair to him? I would say no. It's not. You know. And not for millions of other people either, but, you know, um, but in terms of like sports, of course, you know, the fair thing is that, you know, people have to, you know, play tournaments and, you know, keep their rating up like in uh, tournaments that are kind of well advertised, you know, ahead of time. Right. And like, that would be better. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, anyway, but yeah, it seems that he, I think he's just going to lose here. I don't see a way to keep it together. I mean, maybe he can sec over here on E4 and then take an F6 and he can still take on G2, but Bishop takes E2 and followed by Bishop F3 looks quite tough to deal with because if you go Rook H4, Black gives a check and then after Queen G, Knight G4, uh, it looks like Black is just crushing. Like, how do you defend this? Yeah, you can go rook f1, but I mean, you're going to be down a piece, right? So. <clears throat> and the, the attack just rages on. And if you go queen e1, then a nice move is bishop d3 followed by bishop e4. Yeah. And well, what are the threats here? Do we have any threats of like knight takes e3? Not yet, right? Knight e3, mm -hmm. rook e3, but there's queen f2, so it doesn't quite work. But bishop e4. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to make me go to F1 and then you can play like 93 queen G3, right? So, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Right. Um, so let's see. So Ding has moved. He's played rook takes E4. All right. So, uh, no, but wait, isn't this just allowing the four? No, this is just allowing the first checkmate pretty much. So like you can take over here. Mm -hmm. You take an e8, we go king up, and you cannot take over Ooh. here because Is there then f2, yeah, nice check, yeah. Mate. and check. And if you go back, you get check and made it. Um, and so, what else can you do? You can push this f bomb, but then we can just uh give a check, collect this rook over here, and then I would think maybe bishop h3. Oh, but you can see, I mean, yeah, but this has got to be winning for black. 
but uh, Hikaru made a move. We'll go there shortly. But I think I think the, uh, Nepo is just gonna win. And yeah, as you said before, maybe you can just get a streak, get on a streak again, and uh, and win that way. Maiden one, there was no maiden one. But let's have a look at what happened in Hikaru's game. He played queen to e5 to centralize the queen. Queen, queen of one, very good job. Very good job. Queen of one, queen of one is, oh, sorry, I missed that. Queen of one is checkmate. Queen of one is checkmate, right, Arena? We, we all missed wait, that. Wait, wait, wait. How, how is this checkmate? There's because people in, the people in the chat said oh. it, and people in the chat always know better. <laughs> Okay, you scared me there. I was like, yeah, I don't see that checkmate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, no, we all missed that. Yeah, sorry. Um, but let's have a look. Right, so uh, Hikaru played queen e5, probably a good move, but it's still tough. If white can somehow put this down in e3, I mean... Maybe queen h6 followed by knight e3? Or what do you think is the way to go here? Yeah, so queen f2, there's rook f8, right? So interesting. What about queen c5, actually? Queen c5, it seems like pretty obvious move, right? I guess, yeah. I mean, I guess black can try to trade going bishop c6. I mean, I would say black should be happy for a queen trade, even if the end game here is still quite miserable. Yeah. Um, but a queen trade at least ensures that his king is going to be safe, right? So this is not the worst, I think, for black. No, I agree. Mm -hmm. You can give away the g3 uh, pawn. Apparently, pawn there's a tweet that mm -hmm. people want us to show. Oh, yeah? Um, I don't know what, uh, what tweet they're talking about. Magnus tweeted about Hikaru. Is that the one you guys are referring to? Um, okay. where is it? Can you look at this tweet on screen? What, what tweet is that? Maybe you guys can tell us. Uh, da, da, da. go to it in the tab. Oh, there is, there is there something, there is something there. Maybe, oh, wait. Oh, in your browser, maybe it's Team Hikaru for love. Maybe it's there. No, it's not. It's not where the tweet is. All right. Uh, See, so yeah, there was a tweet about Magnus. Oh, show it. Let's see if we can pull it up. Always interesting to hear what the world champion oh, has to say. Oh, no, he literally doesn't care about king safety. Hmm. Well, Magnus, that's one way to put it. <laughs> um, let me see if I can find it. Um, but... Yeah. Yeah. So I think people have, have found out by now. But once again, I'm really surprised by uh, Kingside Castles by Hikaru. I think there was a mistake. Mm. And this move also looks unpleasant because now Queen G6 is a threat, which needs to be addressed. And if you go Rook E6, there's Queen H4. And if you defend like this, there's Knight E3. But there's Bishop B6 you're holding on for now, but there's always Queen D8 you have to take into consideration. And altogether, it just looks really nasty. Oh, I'm just going through Magnus's tweets. He's got some. Uh, he's got a tweet recently uh, addressed to the Chess Federations of the Americas. Can one of you pledge your support to the British Police Nielsen ticket so Nielsen can focus on prep instead? It's a pretty funny one. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So Magnus is watching the game. So now we know that. Um, well, oh, here no. we have the tweet of, from Magnus. I literally does not care about King's safety. Yeah, I, I do think it was a weird decision. Yeah, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a harsh way to put it, but you know he's giving his chess assessments there. Um, and 
And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's tough being in Hikaru's shoes here. You know, things have gone downhill quite a bit, but okay, he, there's been a couple of moves, right? Played, um, yeah, we got a few things on the board. He played queen h6, actually. He played queen h6. Mm-hmm. And so queen h6 is now a threat, I guess, also 93. Um, so yeah, maybe rook six kind of needs to be played, doesn't it? But then queen h4. You need to go rook g6 and then just knight e3. And then there's still bishop e6. Yeah, it's so and tough with that king on g8. I mean, yeah, if we could get in g3, that would be nice because then if I goes h3, there's always the possibility of somehow the screen landing on f2. Yeah. Um, but uh, queen g7 has been played by Hikaru. Okay, so what do you. Mm, this looks, I mean, this looks pretty nasty. Oh, he played queen g7. Yeah, so he wants that queen trade and queen d6, bishop c6. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and that knight could come to f5 at some point. Yeah. To e3. Man. Um, the thing is that we know what also worries me is that Fabi is quite good in these positions. I mean, he's a good technical player. I remember watching his recent game with Mamed Yarov, and I think in the Super Bet Chess Classic in Romania last month. And he just, you know, when, once he has that advantage, like he's he's willing to grind it out, and he's quite good at it. Right. By the way, I want to say, you know, remember I told you. A long time ago, my uh, my feeling about the Duda report game, mm -hmm. right? Then I said, I think Richard is going to be able to get a draw in this game from the way it's going. And right now, like, I think in their current position, it's not looking too bad for him at all. Um, yeah, he's like completely improved his pieces. <laughs> I mean, his C6 pawn doesn't even look like a weakness. Uh, very much at this point, and uh, rook d8, you said, just happened, right? Ooh, yeah, which to me is, like, why did he not go king c6, right? I mean, you hit the knight, and yeah. now you can go rook b8, and, I mean, who knows, maybe even black can be better here, just to, like, let's say you go knight d5, right? Let's say we take, yeah, and then let's say we go rook b8, we hit this pawn, mm -hmm. and after bishop c3, maybe, you know, bishop e3 followed by should be four. Yeah, I mean, that's a really nice idea. And somehow white's bishops can't really do anything here. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, but yeah, I see that you all of you guys are spamming the flower to give Hikar your power. He needs your uh, support right now. Yeah. We have more moves in the meantime in this game between Ding and Nepo. But Ding might even get... He played F4, but now I guess, I mean, just... The queen h1 and just captures rook in the corner and it's time to resign i think because if you take here you're also getting uh, checkmate oh that's a pretty checkmate yeah and backing the bishop and checkmating with a uh with actually what is going to be the final piece of checkmate one second hold on let me figure this out oh. <laughs> one second if you take the bishop uh, uh -huh. which piece is, delivers the checkmate so after king takes h3 queen h1 King G4. Uh, yeah, it's, well, hold on. I haven't found the checkmate yet. King G4. If I go H5, I guess after King G5, I can go Queen G4, right? And you kind of like, I Queen H3 and Queen G4. That might be it. What yeah, that's a really nice line indeed. We give a check on H1. King is forced up. We give a check. And then Queen H3. And then Queen G4 is a threat as well as Rook G6. And so Rook F5. And Rook F5. So it's either going to be the rook or the queen, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, either way, uh, yeah, Ding with two minutes on the clock, he's just going to lose. I just had a quick look uh, at the live feed. He's just sitting with his hand in his hair, you know. I, and yeah. it's still a long tournament, but starting with a loss is not what you want. Yeah, I know, right? He looks miserable and Nepo looking confident. It is painful to, you know, see the body language for sure. Um, yeah. And well.
see that checkmate on the board. Like Bishop H3, I'm sure Nepo, it's not a difficult move for him to find. I mean, he's already up a piece and uh, yeah, Bishop H3 is quite simple. So he put it yeah. on the board immediately. Yeah, and there we have Bishop H3. I wonder what Ding is going to do. Maybe he's going to take and get his king checkmated over there. I mean, King H2, Queen of One is quite trivial, uh, but actually, yeah, he has just resigned. So Nepo starts off with a win again with the black pieces. So let's see whether he can, you know, get on a streak and, you know, uh, yeah. let's see what he's going to do. I mean, pretty quick win, right? Like three and a half hours. Um, he had still a lot of time left. So we are really confident. I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I like all the players. So it's like, I'm happy for the ones that win and I sympathize for the ones that lose, you know? Um, uh, that's how it goes. But um, Caruana played Queen D6. Yeah, so he's like, you don't want to get caught in his clutches in this type of position. Um, and by the way, so Duda has played knight d5 and he's, he's got the bishop here. So this is basically Benjamin, like a, a worse version of right. uh, what we talked about. Because when we talked about the king was on c6 and the rook was activated on b8, this time the rook is kind of passive on d8, but is it really like a big advantage? Let's take a look. Like, can you just move your knight to b7 or f7 or something and trade the rooks? And um, like, how bad is that endgame? It doesn't seem terrible. Yeah, I mean, you can and sort of pray that you will not lose. But it's looking uh, pretty tough, I would say, because also what you have to take yeah. into consideration after this trade is that why can always try to go bishop c4 yeah. and bishop f7 if your knight ever were to the move. So like these pawns... On the king side are kind of are kind of loose. These pawns on the yeah. queen side are kind of soft. So altogether, it, it makes for a really tough endgame. And also, report he's down to ten minutes, and um, yeah, that's not easy uh, for you know another nine moves with no increments. Yeah, no, I agree that he definitely missed a better chance. And having to play knight b seven is rather miserable. But does he have choices here? Well, maybe he does actually. What about right. the move bishop e3? Right. I mean, what if we try to put the bishop on d4? Why is that, you know, so bad? Yeah, that's a good idea. Right. Put no, the bishop I mean, before on the d4. rook trade, before the rook oh, trade. My. Yeah, right here. Uh, let's see, with the bishop going to d4. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. The one problem could be that hmm. if, let's say, we put our pawns on a4. And b3 to now the bishop, it's nice, but it's not doing much. And in the meantime, I can still try to create something on the king side. And black is just really stuck defending everything. As we showed yeah. before, if black trades, I think here black can easily end up in a zoot zone. You cannot move the knight and you allow bishop seven. You cannot move the king. You have to keep defending this. And if you give white a couple moves, what he could do is go h4, g4. Uh, actually, I, I even have trouble making a move here. But white can go h4 g4 and then create another passer with h5 why just might might just be winning here yeah i mean it's like the very unusual position of the rook on uh on d5 but really it's pretty effective because it's just pinning black completely and the king on b6 turns into a pretty passive piece just defending the a5 pawn it's unfortunate yeah he made a big oversight i was i was all happy to tell you that like my prediction was coming true and then uh, suddenly he plays his bad move and, and, you know, he's still struggling in the end game, but he was yeah, close. He, yeah. yeah. And did he made so many good moves to come back into the game, but this Rook D8 move, I just don't understand because he was forced to give the Bishop for the Knight. So why not King C6 first? You prepared him of Rook B8. Yeah. It's um, really hard to understand. I mean, cause he's not hanging the A5 pawn, the Knight on E3 is hanging, right? It's like Knight D5, Bishop takes, like E takes is not dangerous. So mm -hmm. just a better version, right? It really is a hard thing to uh, to understand. Like, why such a passive move, you know? Yeah. Uh, anyway, we also have more moves in Hikaru's game. So after queen g7, Fabiano played queen the d6, hitting this bishop over here. So now maybe bishop c6, but then knight e3 will come. You know, if the knight jumps to f5, that would be nasty. Maybe the rook is sliding over to f1. And I don't see how you're keeping everything together. If you go rook f8, white gives a check over here. And that's looking like a really tough endgame. 
Shall we take a look at Rajabo versus Ferruzia? Because uh, that has seen some action. Yeah, so after h4, bishop d4 was played, h5, takes on d2, queen takes, and h6. So now it's probably a good time for white to take, black takes. And right. I guess we throw in this, because if we take on g5, this seems fine for black, or it would have g. He has, he has an extra pawn, yeah. Right, so I'm going to take here, you take with the rook, I suppose, and then we take here. Mm. And I guess it's nasty, because queen c2 is always coming. Yep, queen c2, queen d3, and on rook f5, very important move, g4. Right, so it's actually it's actually interesting. Right, like in a lot of tournaments, uh, I think before Norway chess, uh, mm -hmm. Rego had, had just drawn all of his games in his last two tournaments. He drew all the games in the Super Bet Classic in Romania in 2021. And mm -hmm. in the European Team Championship, he played eight games, eight draws. Wow. But in this tournament, he's, he's forced to go for it. Right. So do you think that helps him to do well? Yeah, I think it also helps him that his opponents are forced to go for it too. Right. right? <laughs> you know, maybe a combination of both of those things. I mean, we're, we'll see. Like one game is, is too early, but I think it's like, I mean, it's obviously a great thing to start off by beating Ferruzia. And, you know, people were, you know, really curious about how Ferruzia would fare in his first uh, candidate's appearance. I mean, he's still very young, right? He's still, is he still just 18? He's 18, but he's turning 19, I believe, tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, I mean, this was like a really big question, right? Like, I mean, he climbed to number two in the world in the ratings, uh, had a really hot streak last summer. But like, how would he um, how would he fare in this uh, first candidates tournament, you know, against more experienced players? Right. So, yeah, I mean, uh it's uh, still early to say, right? But experience does count for a lot and it's definitely not easy to win the candidates like at your first attempt. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see. It might be more like of a learning uh, kind of experience for him. And, you know, in a couple of years, he'll come back uh, stronger. People are saying it's a spicy round. Yeah, it is true for round one. I mean, we're already got one decisive result. You know, you know, Benjamin, we might have four decisive results. I think so too, yeah. I mean, right now it is looking tough for Hikaru. Uh, it looks good for Rajabov. And it's also looking really good for Duda. Yeah. And, okay, so Rajabov is still thinking. I mean, yeah, he took an F7. It was about time because he needs to hurry up. They actually have 12 moves to make, so they have about one minute. Uh, one minute per move. You know what Farusha could also do? He could also consider taking with the king if he's worried about getting checkmated over here. Mm -hmm. and Going to the eight, like kind of like Hikaru's king. Um, right, and actually that's what he that's what he's done. Wow, he's done that. That is a yeah. That's I mean that's interesting. Um, it's like I don't feel like the king is highly safe there, but I guess it's trying to run away from the knight and maybe get to d seven. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Maybe he'll put the king on d7 that Hikaru didn't put on d7. Would yeah. be pretty funny. And we have knight c5 by Rajabov, and he goes to e8. All right, so let's see how this one is going to go. Um, for now, black is hitting this pawn on g2, so perhaps we should spend a move on, a, on something like f3 to make sure that that is not hanging. And yeah, I would, I would say that white's king is definitely safer than black's king. The bishop on d5 is doing a nice job of controlling a lot of squares, but if white yeah. can get the knight jumping, then uh, that'd be also tough for... Yeah, uh, well, for okay. I mean, it. how exactly does he get that knight involved? Like, once the king's on d7 and you go knight e4, like, I'm just going to take you, right? So, like, let's say f3, king d7, right? right. Uh, how are you improving this? That is a good question, yeah. I mean, maybe... Hmm. Rook a1 is nice because you do want to like stop that pawn. Maybe you just want to go, you know, queen a5. But still, you're going to play without the knight, right? Yeah, queen b7, rook a8. Yeah, because as Honestly, soon as we go knight e4, you're yeah. always going to take. It doesn't look that bad. Like, it doesn't look... Um, like, let's say I prefer this position, of course. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, like comparing it to what Hikaru has, and it's actually... A good comparison because it's the exact same 
makeup of the pieces, you know, Queen Knight and uh, Rook versus Queen Bishop and Rook. But it's a lot better, yeah. I think, for Black. Like this one, you actually have more play against White's King potentially. The Knight mm -hmm. on G5 is, you know, looking nice, but not like not a killer knight. And you have the outside pawn, like who knows? Like you, you, you know, one day that pawn might get to A2 if White's not careful. I mean, it's not likely, mm -hmm. but uh, there's more chances there. Yeah, in the meantime, Hikaru has moved his play bishop to c6, knight e3 quickly by Fabiano, and I just don't see it here, because rook f1 is a big problem, and a lot of the endgames are just going to be lost if you lose the pawn on g4, so it's looking tough. Yeah, so he just played knight e3, okay, and... Knight of five is coming. What else is coming? Queen, queen f four, I suppose, is an idea at some point. Rook f one. Yeah, okay, but also the time situation yeah. is a little bit tough now because he's getting below seven minutes for another uh, eight moves to make. And without yeah. increment, that's not uh, easy. Oh, he looks yeah. like he's about a move. He played. I don't know which move, or maybe just. No, you know, uh, it's like the moment of silence, you know. <laughs> oh, wait, the, the live feed was a little behind. It showed Bishop C6, that that was the move that he caught played in that 93. And yeah, I, I just have a tough time coming up with a move here. Because yeah. I feel like you would want to play rook f8, but then queen e6, you're just losing this pawn, and I feel like that end game is just gonna be lost. Yeah, yeah there's the two not outside passers. Yeah. Oh, this is tough. So definitely. Let's see. And definitely depressing for Hikaru. Um, well. Shall we take a look? Actually, I really think out of these three games that are left, the most interesting is Rajaba versus Feruzia. I don't always stick with that a little bit. And, you know, hopefully Karu can claw his way out of this. He just played G3, by the way, giving up a pawn. By the way, yeah, what is, what is that move about? I mean, he wants White to take with the queen just to trade the queen's um, makes sense. And something, yeah, he played that Muji three. We saw that on the, in the video feed. So yeah, I think it's a one? good try because I mean, I feel like these end games are never too bad, right? Cause we're down okay. a pawn, but now white has these double pawns over here. If this pawn is on the H fell, I mean, white can just start pushing these pawns forward very easily. But now, not, not so much. So I guess that's what he's hoping for. Same, like, what I can take with uh, the h pawn, so that, that's what he can do as well. But then, once again, White doesn't have that advantage in the endgame. So White could try to keep this pawn on the board, but he will have to pick up, he will have to pick it up at some point, right? Yep. Oh, by the way, Guys, we wanted to let you know that um, <clears throat> we're doing another charity giveaway. And the, um, the prize is a Nintendo Switch OLED, um, Apple AirPods, third generation, and a $250 Chess House gift card. And uh, in order to take part in this, uh, go to events.softgiving.com slash donate slash I think is team Hikaru or you can just go to exclam charity and it will take you to the right place um and so it's a raffle you uh you donate something and you get entered into the raffle for these great prizes so um oh yeah this is actually the one where you um you uh download the capital one shopping uh browser extension and you get entered also for a trip to Hawaii. Indeed, so make sure to check it out, you guys. Once again, if you uh, 
follow those steps. If you get the extension, $10 will be donated on your behalf. So you're supporting charity by getting the extension and uh, you will be entered into a raffle for which you can uh, win uh, big prizes. Uh, and yeah, the extension will tell you, will, will give you better deals. Like when you're about to check out, it will tell you like, hey, you can get a discount over there. So it's really a win-win-win situation. Yeah, okay. So we got uh, Caruana playing H3. Um, interesting. There was some apparently powerful move, Rook F1 there that he didn't pick. But I mean, his move H3 is very understandable, oh. right? Oh, wait, has he moved? Because this is uh, the analysis board. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the analysis board. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, hasn't, he hasn't played it yet. Yeah, so, so you're mentioning F1 Rook F1. Right, so let's say I take... I guess you go one. king over, right? And I Rook guess knight f6 is a threat, also. Rook f6, maybe. Yeah. So can uh, I mean four. I feel like this knight is going to jump. Whatever I do, like if we go bishop d7, I'm worried about stuff like knight d5 or rook f6. Also looks really tough to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rook f1 is a is a very powerful move. Yeah, just kind of ignoring the pawn offer and. Um, preparing to invade to the king. I mean, if he finds it, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be impressive. I think he has a chance of finding it because of course he understands that taking the pawn isn't his best shot. You know, h3 seems to be a fairly conservative move, you know, not bad, but um, and the question here is so why is like let's say knight f5 not good? Why do you need to play rook f1 first? I mean, knight f5. They'll take an H2 probably, um, or or what, Benjamin? Uh, yeah, I don't know what he should do in this position. Um, yeah, like let's say Knight F5 instead of uh, of any of these moves, like Rook F5. So Knight F5 here? Yeah, why is that bad? Okay, so let's say we take, you go King H1. over. Maybe. Uh-huh. But then... You hold yeah. everything and you start pushing like your e3 pawn. Uh huh. Oh, but Fabiano has taken on g3. He still has wow. an edge, but he wow. is still in the game here. I mean, after rook of one, maybe it was already uh, lighter, but it's still tough. Well, this is good though. I mean, this is good that Hikaru's concept is kind of working out. I mean, it's way better to lose that pawn and give white the doubled pawns, right? I mean, because there were real problems with just like losing end games and uh you know the queens off the board losing the g4 pawn so i like um i like that he managed to achieve this and now he goes for this right so that's his concept he wants the end game down a pawn mm -hmm. if the queen goes to g6 he's going to come back with his queen the rook is protected on e8 and big question for fabi right like trade queens or retreat and i think mm -hmm. okay he's so he put queen e5 on the board and fabi um where can he go with his queen if he doesn't want to trade also the g3 pawn is hanging let's not forget that it's actually yeah. a little hard to resist the trade um like right. okay let's say queen h6 why can't we just take that pawn well, I Fine. guess white goes rook f1. And once again, the threats are just going to be enormous. This knight is defended on e3. Um, so you could... Hmm. Yeah, this looks tough. Looks tough. Fabiano also getting low on the clock. He has eight minutes uh, for the, the next uh, six moves. So... Let's hope that maybe Hikaru cannot play him in the time uh, pressure. Yeah, he's got, he's under five minutes now and he's got, okay, he's, I wouldn't say he's in terrible time trouble. Like I'm definitely, I'm confident about that part. I'm not worried at all about his ability to like, um, you know, make decent moves in time trouble. It was more like the quality of his position, which, you know, it's not great, but um, slightly improving, right? Queen H6, Rook F8, and try to hold on there. I mean, you know, I feel like, okay, it's a positive sign for him that Fabi did not find the really powerful move Rook F1. It gives him, you know, more yeah. chances of survival. Indeed. And actually, like, 
if you go queen h6, right, how terrible is it if you go rook e6? Oh, but maybe now you can go queen f4. And this is kind of unpleasant because now you don't want to trade because white gets connected passers again. And I feel like here white is probably just winning. Um, so let's see what is going to happen. Fabiano down at 640 on the clock. Yeah, so he has to figure out where this queen is going. Well, I mean, I assume he knows that he doesn't want to trade the queens, right? Like he's going to be more ambitious than that for sure. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think I think queen h6 is reasonable. It's actually a very natural move, right? It maintains the queen in an active position, defends e3, and just hovers around the black king. So I do think we will be seeing that. Shall we go briefly take a look at Rajaba Feruzia? Mm -hmm. Because there are some changes there. Okay, so f3 was played, king d7 and knight e4. Bit surprising because now black takes and, I mean, how do you think he should take? Like with the rook or with the pawn? Like if you Yeah, the, the problem pawn, maybe... with the rook is that there's queen d5, right? And he just gets totally blocked. Um, and, yeah. you know, he has rook g4, rook f7. I don't know if that offers him very much, but the queen on d5 is definitely nicely placed um so he actually took with the rook interesting and look at the time right off getting down to two and a half minutes for eight more moves that's not an easy time situation especially against Ferruja, who also has seven also only has seven and a half minutes i have um, to tell you i am a little surprised you took with the rook i mean f take seems like a kind of a more interesting idea in order to play d5 like how would black even have stopped that yeah, and queen d5 on the board by Ferruja. Uh, queen b4 instantly, pretty much, by Rajabov. Uh -huh. So his idea is to go for queen a4. And I guess, you know, maybe it's not this curious, but at least, yeah, I guess queen a4 is his idea to try to pick with this pawn. Yeah, I think there's a possible line there with, let's say, ending in perpetuals, right? Like, let's say rook d8, queen a4. King e7. No, sorry, queen c6 is what I wanted to do. Queen c6 and like queen c1 or this oh, one. I, I don't know. I was thinking queen c1, like, isn't that going to end? Maybe not. Well, I guess... You hide your king on g3 and rook yeah, g4. Or... So maybe what you should do is rook a8 because the only square white has is to go to c5. And now you can take, and you would think that black should be able to hold, although there's rook g4. Yeah. And why are we not six. going? Why are we not going rook a1 and rook c1 there, Benjamin? Like, why are we going king c6? Is there a problem with rook a1? I don't know. Well, right. But then after rook g4, one. you cannot defend the pawn. Ah, that's the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But let's see. Fabiano is still thinking. He's getting down to three minutes and 50 seconds on the clock. Keep sending in your energy, you guys. Is, is he? to make Ikaro survive. He needs him more than ever now. Yeah. Okay. Fret Fret reminds me of a quote of mine, a very instructive one that says, if you're getting really depressed about your position, sack your queen, it always works. Yes, well, my best piece of chess instruction. <laughs> glad you remembered. Um, yeah, that, that was, that's pretty funny. Especially okay, queen g6, like... he's going to blitz out queen g7, I imagine. And there it is. Uh -huh. So that's what I expected. I expected Fabian to just repeat the moves. Hmm. Do you think Hikaru should just repeat as well? Uh, he also has this move queen c3, which looks interesting because you hit the rook mm -hmm. and the knight potentially. And if you go a rook here, but it doesn't matter. Hikaru has already played the move queen e5. Yeah, and and has... Uh huh, and, and Caruana is still thinking after that. Yeah. Well, Caruana still... is not going to take a draw. There's, mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to be happening. That would be extremely strange. But how many times have they repeated? So there was a check. He went there. That was twice. Okay. So at this point, he's thinking about where to move his queen. Yeah, queen e5 right. is only a twofold. But the thing is, he will he will get to move forty. Right. There's no yeah. doubt in my mind. But um, he might make some mistakes along the way because there are some lines you have to calculate, right? I mean, if you go queen h6, you are sacrificing this pawn. So let's see whether he'll be able to figure it out. I mean, yeah, two and a half minutes is not an easy spot here, I think. 
Did you know that um, Feruzia played a really weird move, Rook G8? Uh huh. I mean, not something we would have expected, right? Like, I mean, what does he want to do? Like G5, G4? I mean, that must be the idea. Yeah, so let's see. If Queen A4 is still the same line, right? And this is probably just a draw. Um, by the way, Fabiano did play Queen, Queen H6. H6 with two minutes on the clock for still three moves to be made. Let's see what Hikaru is going to do here. So three more moves. That is 40 seconds per move, right? Mm -hmm. Which is still not the end of the world. but So... What can he do? Maybe Rook F8 is the move that we were like thinking about, right? Right. Yeah, because we cannot take on G3. Rook F1 just yeah. looks really tough. Uh, the Rook swinging into F6. Um, mm -hmm. So let's see what he should do. Three and a half minutes for Karo. So three minutes. Yeah, it is a lot of time, actually. And Rook F8 is, you know, fortunately a pretty simple move. Actually, well, okay, knight g4 is not really a threat. I suppose there's still like check on d4, but I would say knight g4 does look like a bit of a threat, right? Like you don't really want to allow that knight to come to f6. So I think rook f8 back to the open file is kind of a natural thing to do. It's You can see that it doesn't damage your position in any way. So I, I, I predict that he's going to find that one. Mm -hmm. Still thinking. And the other option is rook e6, right? But then queen f4, because it's not really clear what your rook is doing on e6. Now, I like that rook coming to f8. If he yeah. could trade rooks or queens would be quite nice here. Right. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it's, I mean, maybe a rook f8, as we mentioned, is the move. But either way, it's looking really tough, especially if uh, Fabiano manages to safely reach the time control, then he gets another hour on the clock. That, that's going to be uh, really tough, I imagine. Um, in the meantime... Mm, he did grab that pawn. Wow. Uh -huh, he did take it. Uh -huh. So I guess after rook f1, we still have this move, queen g7. Right? Hmm. If we can then, but okay, you're going to keep the queens on the board, like maybe queen h5 followed by knight f5 looks tough too. And there we have rook of one, Fabiano, queen g7 instantly. So where should he go with the queen? He goes to h4, but what about bishop d7 now? Ooh. Can you stop knight of... That's a big, that's a big deal. Oh. I think you're going to have rook, well, what are you going to have in the end? Like rook e5? Is it rookie I guess rookie five, five yeah. yeah. And if check, king up. And it's just it's just like perpetual or something, or well, you can play for more. Yeah, but I mean, you don't. The rook of eight actually doesn't threaten anything. So let's. Okay, he uh, played queen h seven. He unfortunately did not play bishop d seven. Ooh, now the queen is a bit worse. And yeah, when queen f4 happened, okay, queen g3 happened. All right, he can still go queen g7, right? Unfortunately, yeah, he uh, reaches he the time, the time control, control, but yeah. But queen d6 now and rook f6 is a big threat. And it's actually very similar to that position we looked at before. Mm. Yeah, no, this is looking tough. Wow. So let's go back a couple of moves just to appreciate like the power of that bishop g6 move that he could have played. I'm um, bishop d7. Yeah. Like, why was that so much better? Because the queen was better placed on g6, right? Yeah, I mean, you stop knight of five, knight d5 is out of the equation because you have queen d4 check. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what else white. I mean, of course, there's always moves like rook of six or rook of four. Which are going to be annoying, but I think that really had to be stopped because now they'll just end up in a situation where White is going to go for a knight jump sooner or later, and you can't really stop it. Like after Queen D six, right? I mean, Knight of Five is a Knight of Five is a threat. Rook of Six is a threat, so it's looking tough. Well, let's check in in this game. They made a lot. Yeah, Rajabov didn't really make much of it. 
actually it went just exactly the way you were talking about but uh, this oh, looks wait. nasty wow, for weird. black no wait, he didn't protect his pawn wait wow. so if you take an e5 the first Okay, it what should is... be a it should be a draw, right? I think this is like, but okay, the, the position of the black king is a little unusual because normally he'd be like, you know, on f6 or g6. Um, how big of a problem is it? I mean, yeah, white is going to get that pawn to g4 at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah, rook f7, I think, is interesting. Yeah, the cut of the king, because I think if this king makes it back, it should be a draw. Yeah. So, like, let's say you go rook f7. What black should do is go king d6, e5, mm -hmm. king d6 quickly. Yeah. And I don't think you can do anything about it. Like, if white can get, let's say, g4 and king g3 and another move, then it might be winning. But black is just, we already wasted one move. Yeah. Black can just go, um, he has actually played rook f7. But um, I think. Just king d6 is a draw followed by e5 and king d6. You know, it's interesting that he decided to sack the pawn because he didn't have to, right? Like he had this rook g8 move. Can we go back to that for a second? Yeah. Uh, that was quite surprising to me. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a look. So I was quite surprised that after rook g4, he didn't go rook g8. It looked like the way to go to me. Then we thought rook g6, mm -hmm. but hmm. yeah, not that easy, but it feels like this would have been. Well, I guess it's probably going to be a trade of pawns, right? Like king c5, rook e6, king d5, and then like black pushes the c pawn, right? Like here and white probably. But okay, have, king, yeah. I mean, you do have two connected passers, so if white manages yeah. to stabilize, this will be uh, quite dangerous. But a g5. G5 could be a nice move because you stop yeah, you free F4. Free the rook also. And you free the rook, yeah. Yeah. So he had that option, but okay, I understand why he went for what he went for. He thinks he can hold it, and he's probably correct, you know, as long as he finds his king D6 plan that gets his king back, uh, to, you know, with by E6, I think he's going to be fine. Shouldn't have too much trouble. We can also check in with Duda and report. Right. Uh, yeah, let's have a look at that game. So last time we checked, we checked this position, which we three was played. And here we thought a4 followed by b3 is just winning. But Duda played rook d3 and check. He took the pawn, but black it now gets a lot of counterplay. Rook a8 followed by quick c4 to check and rook a6. So they trade the rooks, but now black takes his pawn on b2, gets a pass c pawn, and also the bishops are kind of misplaced. a4, c4, bishop b4, h4. Interesting move. So I guess he feels like this endgame should just be a draw. Yeah, he's, uh, he's getting out of it. So, I mean, um, it's been a tough game for Richard, for sure. I'm sure, you know, he really yeah. regrets that move in the opening. Uh, G6, because he's had to do a lot of suffering in this game, but you know, um, somehow he's hanging in there. And right now he just wants, just like, what, is, what does he want to do next? Does he want to play C3? I think he can, does he? Because like C3, Bishop D3, and then like what, like Knight C4 is a possible yeah. line. Like, let's say white plays, I'm curious, like, okay, if white plays King E2, what are you, what are you going to do? Well, I would think c3 does king d3, you know? Right. Yeah, you can't push the pawn anymore, so... But maybe you just sit with the bishop over here. You control a lot of squares, and what can white... So do? I see the issue. The issue is that white's bishop is trapped on a6. Like, he, can't, he just can't get it out without taking the knight on d6. Yeah, you make a good point, yeah. So that, that's where the draw is coming in. Right, and, and I guess black can go for a quick bishop c5 to try. You think so? Like, he, does he want to do that? Because, like, let's say white plays h3. Are you you're not scared bishop c5? Like, I'll I'll take well, king c3 and, um, like, well, you're not getting into Zugzwang there, right? I guess not. Because you have well, some Maybe moves. white... All the, oh, there might be f5, which is nice. Oh, you're going to put me into Zugzwang and, like, might play against my trapped bishop and try to promote that pawn, yeah? Exactly. And there's also... E4. Maybe you just push the pawns through. 
He's 394. Yeah. That's pretty nasty. Ah, so he really needs to be a little careful with that bishop on a6. Huh. So, I mean, okay, if he takes on d6, it's just a really easy draw. Most likely that's going to have to happen, though. And most likely it yeah. looks like there will be... Uh, um, well, there are not going to be four decisive games today for sure. We were kind of optimistic there, but um, this one's going to be a draw and probably the Rajabov game as well. So mm -hmm. depends on whether Hikaru can hold on or not. Yeah, looking tough for Hikaru. Fabiano is taking his time because they've just reached uh, move 40. So we're being asked to explain like why we don't like Hikaru's position so much. Well, basically it comes down to the safety of the black king, right? Um, that, you know, of course, if white trades the queens, then black is totally fine, right? In the end game, the king is not a problem, material is even. But the problem is that white's not going to trade queens. And black's king is more open than white's. What, black's bishop on c6 is also not the best. He's like being blocked by the pawn. And so, like, let's say white, well, well let's make a few moves. Let's go queen d6. Uh, uh -huh. He played, oh, he played queen h4. Okay. Well, Which queen h4 goes probably... back into that bishop d7 line, right? Doesn't it's exactly the same line. Yeah, so let's hope that Hikaru takes his time here, because if he goes queen h7, he's going into that line that uh, was probably not good, right? Apparently, the move queen f4 was extremely strong here, and then knight f5 is coming, knight g4, you just can hold the position together. And if you go bishop d7, there might be a knight d5 jump. Mm. But here, if he goes bishop d7, he prevents all the knight jumps. And of course, black is worse, but he's still very much in the game, I would say. Yeah, because the difference is that if knight d5, there's queen d4. So like your queen is better placed on g7 than it was on h7. Yeah, he should really take his time here and kind of finds this move so now like let, let, let's look at um let's look at rook f6 i mean not exactly sure what i'm trying to do with that move um <laughs> what is my threat actually so let's say i although with rookie six i'm it's trying to escape into a nasty end game yeah lose a pawn it's not fun wow i mean i wouldn't want to be black here but yeah but it's also not exactly i mean it's just a lesser evil yeah well do we okay what if we don't go for that what if we don't go for the rook trade how big of a threat is uh rook okay so let's rook. say i go yeah i mean but i don't i mean even if the rook comes to g5 i'm not threatening anything yeah yeah no i can see maybe it's trading let's say rook. i go although rook f8 then you take i cannot or can i recapture with king because of bishop e8. Yeah, let's take a rook f8, yeah? Yeah, so I'll... Okay, I'll take it. Okay, I'll take with the king. Yeah, queen d8 and bishop e8. I mean, it looks a yeah, little... Here, a little I mean, it's still uh, not fun, but yeah. I feel like Black's, you know, very much in the game. Yeah, you have some ideas of counterplay a1, h8 on that diagonal looking for checks. Yeah, like let's say white takes, and I think uh, this is a good move. And maybe we just take over here. But if white goes here, we can. Although I guess the king walks out of it. But maybe, you know, we put our bishop over here. We hit this. There's always still all these checks on this diagonal, which are annoying. So let's hope he finds bishop d7. Then he still has a real chance of hanging on in this game. Yeah, it could be one of those really long games that just uh, makes it into the third time control, right? I can see that happening for this one. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, Benjamin, yes. Do you want to let us know about our next giveaway? Uh, yeah, there is a, there, we are doing another um, giveaway. This time you guys can win um the Nintendo Switch, uh, you can win the Nintendo Switch and still the $250 Chess House gift card and the uh, Apple Airports, uh, Apple AirPods, um, three, um, what is it, three, uh, third generation. So we are going to start another giveaway, guys, right now. So if you, if you donate in the next, uh, in these next 10 minutes, then you will be entered into the raffle. And we are also, gonna be um playing another video very soon 
Um, so yeah, make sure to donate, you guys. Let's see where we can get the video started. And more donations means more. We went to a children's hospital to take a look at the distraction therapy and gaming needs that they had. And we had an event where kids could come down, play games, and be kids, and just escape for a little bit. And we had Super Smash Brothers on this really big screen, and this little boy, Drew, comes in, and uh, he started playing Smash with us, played for hours. And he actually stayed until it was time to, uh, to go, and the Child Life team came, came in and said, Hey, Drew, it's time to go, buddy. And he said, Oh, man, all right. And uh, so we gave him a gift bag, and as he was going out, he stopped for a second and paused, and then he turned around, and then what he said changed our lives. He said, you know, this is just what I needed. And everybody just kind of looked around at each other and just melted, and just, oh, well, hey man, well, have a good rest of your day. And uh, the Child Life team told us later that that was the first time in over a week that they had seen him smile. And that was the moment that we knew that this is why we do what we do. It matters. And welcome back, everyone, to the FIDE candidates in Madrid. The car is still thinking in the current position, but yeah, we see now that the donation, uh, the giveaway is starting right now. We have a little bit more than eight minutes on the clock. So uh, make sure to donate now and your entries are doubled at $25 and up. You're entered into a raffle and you can win a um, you can win a Nintendo Switch, Apple Airports, Apple AirPods, a third generation, and a uh, $250 chess house gift card. And once again, all of this money is going to charity. So make sure to uh, join in, you guys. More, more donations, guys, means more entries. So when you donate over $25, your, uh, your entries are... Uh, your donations are doubled and you will be getting more entries. So um, yeah, good luck with that guys. Let's get those donations in and raise some money for charity. Um, the N Nintendo switch is interesting. The Nintendo, I remember playing with the original Nintendo. Um, right. So yeah, it was pretty amazing. You know, early 1990s, uh, Super Mario brothers. I used to like to play that. Um, all right, guys, and we got oh, now. I just mm -hmm. saw a $100 donation coming through from, I think it was Sharp Dressed Penguin. Thank you so much. Yes, Obey, thank you, ahead. guys. Oh, my gosh. Hikaru found Bishop D7. Oh, Bishop D7. That great is so move awesome. by Hikaru. Yeah. So you, you see, you guys, by donating, you give Hikaru the energy mm -hmm. to find good moves. I mean, it's a... It's, uh, like I said, it's the one thing that makes him the proudest of, of streaming. Um, so yeah, make sure to donate to charity. As you guys saw, it's all going to these kids in hospitals who are suffering from mental uh, um, um, mental health because you know staying in a hospital is not easy. It's as the video showed. You know, all, most of the time, not all of your family members can join, but they're organizing fun activities for them. So it's all going to that, and you guys are entered into a great giveaway. And we will also be giving away a trip to Hawaii later on. So just make sure to donate, you guys. Also make sure to get the extension. If you get the extension, you guys, then um, there will be $10 donated uh, for you automatically. Yeah, thanks to Afro Tonder contributing uh, $25. Bezel uh, Dub for, for his donation. And... Um, yeah, Hikaru is, um, the charity is really an important aspect of the stream to Hikaru, guys. So it means a lot to him. Um, and he wants to be able to use it to help other people. So that is really cool. It is, I think it's a great thing to build up such a powerful platform and use it um, to help others. And 
It's also really good, though, that he's letting us hang out on his stream while he goes and plays the candidates and, you know, plays in the top events of the year while we root for him. M4253Y donated $100. Amazing. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks so much, uh, everyone. Yeah, really do appreciate the support from you guys. Uh, also, Matt Fraser comes in with a $50 donation. Uh, really great stuff from you guys. And I think we have already, we're over $3,500, you guys. So keep up the good work. Let's try to get to, you know, 4,000 really soon. I just uh, keep spending, sending in all the positive energy. And you see, he's finding. Yeah, I think that's how notes. it works. Spending and sending in, you know, it sounds similar. Spending yeah. <laughs> and sending in the positive energy. We really want Hikaru to save this game. It would be, you know, I mean, after this, the difficult course of events, it would be very good uh, for him to be able to get a draw out of this. And he is still in it, right? Things have not gotten beyond repair for him. His opponent mm -hmm. has missed a couple of chances to win. So some of our audience was wondering why this move, Bishop D7, was important. And it's because the bishop is controlling the F5 square. Maybe you can highlight that, Benjamin, not letting the knights just uh, go in there for the attack. Yeah, Bishop D7 was super important, so it was really good that he could have found it. And yeah, if White goes 95 here to jump in F6, we have Queen D4 check. But yeah, we still have a little under four minutes. Uh, in If you donate in these next three minutes and, you know, 40 seconds, you will be entered into the giveaway. Once again, you can win a Switch, AirPods, and $250. Also, that trip to Hawaii can be yours. And uh, if you don't want to go to Hawaii, get that awesome trip. You can uh, claim... Uh, $10,000 instead. So make sure to join in, you guys. All the positive energy is really contributing here. And, you know, we, we appreciate all uh, donations. Yes, thank you. We got Brooklyn Raw, Ra, $100, Woozy, $100, Bagel Blue, 25 I mean, these are really, really generous donations, guys. So we appreciate that a lot. And, uh, okay, so do we have, we don't have any move on the board yet uh from fabi he's still thinking i mean the players have gotten 60 minutes so they have a ton of time to ponder over their moves in the second time control we've got just under three minutes left i remember guys that when you donate over 25 dollars you're getting uh i think double the entries and that is put putting you in the running for winning some Fantastic prizes like the Nintendo Switch, the Apple AirPods, third generation, and a $250 gift card. And we and all this money is going to charity to kids in hospitals. In the yeah, and thanks to uh to Bill for the $25, uh, Bill Konarowski for the $25 donation and the Kuba for the $101 donation. I think that is our top donor of today. So big, uh, big shout out to Kuba. He's a top donor so far. So if you donate 102, you will be the top donor. Hey. That sounds good. You know, I've always, uh, I've, I've seen in kind of my own life. It's good. It's good to give. You know, somehow it works that when you give, like you would, you, you get things back for and back as well. Like whatever the good stuff that you stand out comes back to you in some way. You know, I've just kind of, uh, you know, seen that over the years, you know, of course, that's not the reason to give, but you know, that just, how it works you know when you put out kindness you get kindness back and um yeah that's why we really appreciate guys we've got one and a half more minutes left to uh collect the donations for the kids and um and help out you know hikaru's mission indeed and another 100 dollar donation by jake thank you so much we've raised already over four thousand dollars so let's keep pushing you guys let's try to get to five thousand really quickly and yeah, lots of other awesome donations coming through. And once again, if you donate more than $25, you have a double chance of, uh, of winning the giveaway. You can win a Switch and AirPods and $250. Yes, and we got Nick Ma donated $25. So it keeps increasing, guys. Thanks for coming together to do this. We really appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, let's see what we got going on on the board i mean yes Feruzia, by the way has found the uh the right plan of getting his king back into action and by the way yeah uh the link is events.softgiving.com slash donate slash team hikaru it's in the in, in the chat guys so you got 30 more seconds to get those donations in and then we will move on to the chess 
Yeah, and eventually we will be announcing the winner of this giveaway. Only 15 seconds left, you guys. Get those last donations in, of the giveaway in very, very quickly. Um, so, yeah, let's just keep all the positive energy flowing, you guys. Yes, we got Let's Go Hikaru. Says John Zero, $100 from him. Um, another one from B Squared A2. I kind of like that name. And yeah. are we... Oh, the winner is John Zero. Uh, Zero. Now, what does that he, mean, Benjamin? He jumped in last minute with the one hundred dollar donation. But uh, yeah, big congrats to John Z. Roll. He does win the um, he wins the, the Nintendo Switch, the Apple AirPods, and a two hundred fifty dollar gift card. So big congrats to John. Yeah, congratulations, John, and thank you for participating, guys, in um, in this charitable giving and. Um, now let's go back to supporting Hikaru. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're happy that, you know, he found this move Bishop D7, um, staying alive. So let's go back to this Rook F6 move because we still need to kind of find a convincing move on that, Benjamin. Like, what was your take? Like, do you think he should just give away the pawn? It is hard psychologically to do that. I have to admit, right? Like, right. it's not the simplest move in the world to just be like, okay, here's the Rook trade and you can take my pawn. Right. Um, yeah, we, uh, we have Rook to F8. And you know, John is being very generous in the chat. He's saying, you know, that uh, we can give it to someone else. Well, we'll, we'll see what, uh, uh, what will happen. But yeah, we really appreciate your generosity, John. So yeah, let's have a look. So if Rook F8, we thought that if White takes, we take with the king. And it's still very much uh, a game. Maybe Rook D6 could be annoying because... If you give a check, there's rook d1 to block. Because our idea is that if you go to, let's say, h2, then we always have um, these checks over here, right? The queen can check in the long diagonal. But I don't know. It, it doesn't seem easy to me what Fabiano should do. And he's already spending quite a bit of time here. Yeah, he spent quite a bit of time. And, you know, the move rook f6, like, I mean, uh, it's not obvious the idea of it, is it? I mean, like, I see the computer likes this move. But, I mean, what is the primary idea of rook f6? Like, is it just blocking the diagonal, like not letting the queen activate? It might be, right? I mean, maybe you want to put the queen behind the rook. Maybe you want to go queen f4. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Benjamin? Like, how do you, how do you interpret this move, rook f6, as... Um, Good. Maybe um, you actually want to go knight... Do you want to go knight d5? Not really, because then there's e3. Um, right, because now there's no f6 square to, to jump yeah. to. So it's a good so question. What yeah, if what we does do nothing? Move... Like, what if I go a5? I'm just curious. I don't I mean, I know a5 is not terribly helpful. So yeah, queen f4, right? So that is the idea to just kind of like improve your pieces, put the rook in front of the queen and block off black's queen from being active. That's the primary idea. And then somewhere knight d5, actually. Yeah, they do yeah. want to organize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still, I think the main problem for black is that it's very difficult to do nothing. Like, I'm having a tar hard time making a move here. Uh, like, if b5, it feels like we're just weakening our position. But maybe the idea is to go queen of four to d6 and then rook g6 is a threat, which actually cannot be stopped. Because if you go king h7, there's a win for white. With rook h6, you take and then we take here. And either you block with your queen and you're no longer hitting the knight so we can take. Or you move with your king back, but then we take with a check. So, but given the fact that Fabiano, you know, he played Queen H4 kind of quickly, right? And then he caught responded with Bishop D7. I, I think that's definitely a good sign. I agree. You know, one thing that we have seen is when you don't finish off your opponent, when you have the chance, right? Like it's sort of, um, it doesn't just come back, those chances, right? And we, we saw that in... Um, in Duda's game with reports, right? I mean, he had this huge advantage and kind of like let it get lower and lower. And then it still got big. But in the end, right now, it's looking like a report is going to be able to escape. Although we can we can take a quick take a quick look at that game um, and just check in Duda report. He just played Bishop A5. Um, mm -hmm. So he's not taking the knight, which is basically a sign that he doesn't want a draw. He <laughs> wants to play. Bishop d8, I guess. Right, but there is, of course, still a uh hand. -huh, if f5, you hang this. So it's a it's a nice move, I think, yeah, to get the bishop to d8. 
Hit this pawn over here. Not easy for black to deal with. Um, I mean, you can go bishop c1 to g5, but it seems kind of passive. But maybe it's fine. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a weird move. But, you know, I think the number one priority in this position is like, don't let the bishop on a6 out. Uh, without that, you know, white can't really win, right? And also don't let, you know, the white king... Well, like, don't let the white king go to c3. Let's actually take a quick look at that, because if you go bishop c1, like, let's say you go bishop c1, bishop d8, mm -hmm. and bishop g5, can the white king go to d1 and c2? And c Yeah, that is a good idea. Yeah. Maybe I just go here. You have to go bishop. Yeah, bishop a5, and then you go... Where do you go? And then, and then if king c2, yeah, what happens here? You're still yeah. kind of making me suffer a bit, aren't you? Right. Maybe this idea with f5 again. Because let's say I take, you take with the pawn and you curate another passer. King c3, uh, and then you just go like e4 or something. And I guess it's, oh, wait. If I take there's bishop d2, that is nasty. Oh, wow. What a and trick. You lose both of the bishops. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, Report has played the move bishop to c1, trying to bring this bishop to g5, which is probably the correct move. Yeah, no, it's good that he found that. And he's still, you know, he's holding on. And okay, the other game with a Rajaba Ferruzia, not super exciting. I mean, Rajaba is up a pawn, but it's the kind of rook end game that shouldn't be that hard to hold, especially as the black king is about to improve himself and go to e6 and then to f6, right? And we know these two against ones are not winning. So, um, well, yeah. I had I had one question. Like, let's say we go g4, right? Uh -huh, king e6, and then rook f5. Okay, so what is How your you... plan here? You want to uh, you want to go king g three, king h four, king and king where? Um, yeah, but maybe what you can do is rook a three. So as soon as you go king g three, you have e four. Yeah, let's trade everything off. Because I would think if you don't do this, like let's say you wait, right? Yeah, let's I go king g three. What if I go still... rook h eight? Yeah, rook h eight is important. You're right. Yeah. Right, but then it could, like, let's say I wait, throw right, king g2. You could end up in some sort of zoop swan. Like, let's say you go rook g8, I go king h3, rook h8, king g3, and... But uh, and if I go king g6, you go g5, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and here white wins because we make uh, progress. So you're saying I'm in zoop swan. Ah, but there's, okay, there's rook h1, I guess. So I do have those squares. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think, I think he will go for rook a3, of course, because it's quite a simple move. And, you know, white's, white's winning plan is only one in this position is try to like get the king in somewhere and, uh, it's unlikely that black will even will even allow this position to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's see. I think it's. I, but I think this rook a three move is probably a good way to hold, because black can just sit on the third rank. Mm -hmm. Right. It's tough to make a, a progress now. And I mean, if rook f eight, you always go king e seven. So I think that's probably the way to go for Ferruja. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to try to attack the rook so you can make the crossing. And by the way, just a question. If you don't go king e7 and you just kind of go rook a3, I mean, how, how big of a problem is g5? It seems to be a problem, right? Like, you shouldn't let white do that. Uh, yeah. So let's show that. Um, if we just go rook a3. Instead. Okay, sorry. So mm -hmm. e5. So let's say we go g4, king e6, rook f5. Mm -hmm. right, so what are you saying? So we're in that line with like rook a3, and we looked at, I believe, uh, let's say king g2, rook b3, that line that you already have there, 
rook f8 and now just rook a3 like how big of a problem is it to allow g5 oh but here we have king g3 and if e4 ah, is rook e8. rook e8 so it is a problem yeah. uh -huh. all right so we should play i guess just king e7 hit the rook the rook has to go to let's say a8 and now i mean the king steps over here yeah. and i feel like black should be holding here yeah Right, right. White is not making any any progress because white can't improve the king and he can't get his pawns going. Right. I so, see my good friend Jossum in the chat. Mm -hmm. He's saying spend this dog to give energy to bug. I don't need the energy. We need Hikaru to, to have the energy. Yeah. And, you know, right now, Fabi is thinking. He's in a long think after Bishop D7. Um, and all the games are pretty much in the end game phase. Uh, Hikaru's game is the only one that still has queens on the board. The players are done with their first time control with the first 40 moves. They're on to the second where they get one hour for the next 20 moves. And we are going to go on a short break uh, while the players are thinking. And we will see you guys in a few minutes.
and welcome back everyone to the FIDE Candidates Chess Tournament 2022 in Madrid. We just saw the move Rook to D1 by Fabiano Arena. What do you make of this move? Okay, so he didn't play the Rook F6 move that we were talking about, but of course his move looks totally fine. I mean, doesn't spoil anything. Huh, I guess it is stopping um, queen d4 ideas. So maybe he's actually doing it in order to prepare the move knight d5. So there's no queen d4 check. Maybe he's also doing it in order to put a rook on d6. Mm -hmm. I would say um, it's quite a normal move. And um, it's, you know, what's interesting is like, like on the move bishop e6, knight d5, mm -hmm that somehow we can't take that knight. Cause like normally you'd think we'd like to take it, but you know, unfortunately you're putting the rook in such a good position that, uh, that you can't go for this. And I guess rookie five, there's rook d8 and it's just getting, uh, it's just getting pretty, pretty bad as you lose your queen. Yeah. So rook right. d1, you know, after a long think, you know, I think, you know, it's a very reasonable move. Let's see how Hikaru can react to this threat of knight d5. Yeah, because the move rook d1 does threaten that. Uh, oh, he has just played the move bishop Ooh. six. Okay, so knight d5, and then if he doesn't want to go for the losing line that we considered, how about rook f8? It looks really dangerous to allow a knight e7. Right, but I guess if the king of seven were just hanging on, I mean, rook f1, king e8, and actually this knight will find itself trapped. That's but pretty cool. I was wondering, what happens exactly if white takes this pawn on e4? Mm. You know, what's interesting, I was thinking, uh, well, you don't want to give away too many pawns. I guess you could go bishop f7. Mm -hmm. um, Queen f4. Yeah. And I guess we still have to try to get the queen trade in. Yep. Um, yeah, it's not a fun end game after the queen trade, you know, king f2. It's also not wonderful, you know, with the rook threatening to come to d7. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you said, knight d5 is still quite an unpleasant move, right? Knight f6 is a big threat and we cannot take. So I guess we have to go rook f8. But then what if white takes on, well, if white takes on e4, maybe we go queen g4. Once again, if we get the queens off, we have chances to hold in the end game. Yeah, we have chances to hold. Um, but what? Aha! Uh -huh. So you're threatening the rook on d1 and the queen on e4. So it's pretty hard to avoid the trade. If you go queen d3 here, what can we do? Do we have? I mean, yeah, hmm. something like rook f7, just holding the yeah. checks. Maybe going one day rook g7. Maybe. Um, right, but at least, you know, there's no immediate danger towards the Black King right now. So that is the good thing for Black here, I would say. Yeah, so Knight d5, Rook f8, and what else can White do there? All right, so let's see. So let's say Knight d5, Rook f8. Yeah, as we said, check is not dangerous. White can maybe give a check. Is this an idea? Do we have to go? What are this? Why can't we take the Knight? Yeah, probably we can. Yeah, no, this is C7, getting... Like, yeah, queen c7, we have king of six. Queen d6. Uh, you got to go king of seven, and you got to try to hide your king. It looks really dangerous after queen e6, king h8, but I guess... I guess maybe white just takes the pawn. Although, if you check. Yeah, this is not fun, but you could try to hold. It's, uh, yeah, it's the problem is that none of, none of these lines are fun, right? <laughs> you no, know? no. You're only choosing amongst uh, non-fun lines for black, but he's going to have to do that if he, uh, if he wants to save this game. Um... But, you know, first Caruana has to play knight d5. I mean, I think there's a pretty good likelihood he'll do it because it's sort of the main idea of the move rook d1. Right. He's still thinking, which is interesting, right? That he thought for a long time and now he's thinking again. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, Fabiano, he's getting. Oh, wait, so you were talking about the Rogel game or this game of Fabiano? I'm thinking about Fabiano that, you know, oh. he thought for a long time on Rook D1 and after, you know, fairly obvious move, Bishop E6, like he's still thinking, right? So he hasn't yeah. yet plunged in with a knight. Yeah. And I mean, I would think he still has enough time, but he's got to be careful, right? 28 minutes for another 18 moves. Um, yeah, he could end up in time pressure. But that being said, the position is, of course, fairly simplified, right? Yeah. Uh, so he has 28 minutes for how many? 17 moves? Yeah, I mean, um, the player's getting more tired as the game goes on, of course. Um, it's uh, possible to get into time trouble again. It would be unfortunate to do that before you get the increment, but... Yeah, I wonder what he's thinking about because knight d5 is uh, – maybe he just doesn't really see what he wants to do on rook f8, right? Maybe that's yeah. – but then you just take the pawn. So, I mean, that's not that complicated. Or maybe he's thinking about taking the pawn immediately, right, which right. we also looked at. And actually taking the pawn immediately, I would say, is a very logical thing to look at because it does just look like a free pawn. Yeah, and no, I agree. Um, and, yeah, black doesn't have anything immediate. I mean, maybe – so we said most like bishop f7 or maybe like queen g5. Make sure you do not have this at four square. Yeah, threaten and... bishop d7 or bishop f7. Yeah, bishop f7. Mm -hmm. Right, and the game sort of goes on, right? We're not getting checkmated. We're also not getting immediately into a drawn end game. But, uh, you know, black is, black is fighting. And we have a move. Fabiana just played knight d5. Knight so now d rook f8 is forced, right? We cannot allow this knight jump, knight jump to uh, f6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so rook f8, I mean, only way to stop knight f6. Like Karu is not at the board right now. He just, yeah, you know, he just got back to find mm -hmm. this move played. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Should we take a look at like what's going on in Duda report? Um, White has advanced his pawn one square, so it's a little bit of progress. Mm -hmm. When is GM Crush going to commentate again after this? Well, you're in luck, uh, MC ESL. ESL. I, I mean, I hope, you know, it, it, it feels like luck. Um, but I will be commentating a lot, actually, during the candidates and, like, all for the first part of the tournament. I'm going to be here with you guys and commentating with Benjamin and uh, Fiona and Jennifer and all the other uh, commentators that we've got lined up for you guys. So it's going to be fun. Um, I've commentated with Fiona on like a seven round day at the uh, Holland Grand Chess Tour, you know, Rapid and Blitz. And so we have some some experience working together now. Mm -hmm. Indeed. But yeah, also guys, I just wanted to bring to your attention that uh, we have talked a lot about the donations, but you can also enter into the raffle for free. If you install the app, uh, no, not the app, the extension, my bad, uh, it's really just that, then you, then there will be $10 donated for you. So type in exclamation mark extension, then follow the link that will be provided to you. Follow the link, not only type in exclamation mark extension. And that way you donate money to charity. You will also get the app, the, app, uh, the extension, my bad. The extension will tell you that when you're about to check out of something, uh, it will tell you like, hey, you can get a better deal here. It will notify you of discounts. So it's it's really a win-win a situation. Irene, I think you had experience using the extension, right? Maybe you can tell yeah, a little yeah, bit more I, about I it. Yeah, I downloaded it myself, you know, uh, Capital One Shopping Extension. And uh, it lets me know when I can find best deals or sometimes it does a search and tells me like, this is the best price you have, you know, the price you found is the best one you found. So it's a, it's a useful little tool guys and um this is what you would need to do to be eligible for the really big prize of the day which is the trip to hawaii for two for a week or ten thousand uh, dollars cash and uh we need 2500 i think of you to uh install the capital one uh browser extension um in order to open up that big prize for you guys. So um, we've already, the extension has already made uh, over a thousand dollars donation to our charity. 
So we're making good progress on that, guys. So let's, um, you know, the more of you that install that, uh, that extension, the more they donate to the charity and open up the prizes. So uh, it's not too difficult to do. You can see in the chat, uh, you just go to, uh, to where, Benjamin? Uh, you, you go to, um, uh, well, just type in extension. Wait, I'll, I'm going to show you guys how to do it. I'm going to type in extension. Then there will be a link here, or it will be given to you in a, in a whisper by Mubot. So we'll give you a link, this upstream.im uh, slash Timikaru giveaway. So then you go here, you click on this link, and then you click enter giveaway here. Are we all following you guys? So you click enter giveaway here, then uh, and then it will show you the extension, and then you can add it to and then you can add it to Chrome. It's free. Right, so as Irina said, it will tell you about discounts and a lot of uh, good stuff. Yeah, and you know, you can also win a pineapple shirt, guys, which I think is pretty cool because I don't own any of those, but who wouldn't want to own a pineapple shirt? You would look like you're always, you know, ready for the beach. Right, has, it, has that pineapple shirt been worn by Hikaru before? I don't know, I don't know, uh, but it, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it would be a cool look. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in Hawaii. It's been, yeah, since mm -hmm. 1998. I've only been there once in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, guys, uh, Bach, uh, <laughs> someone said, if I say Bach, Bach, Bach three times, Hikaru will, you know, not lose this game. So, okay, there you go. I did it. Um, but Benjamin has shown you how to do it, how to, you know, click the X clam and, uh, extension write that in you're yeah. going to get the link of how to how to complete the whole installation process so help us out with that to open up those prizes for our our audience indeed and actually a thousand dollar and ninety thousand and ninety dollar donation just came through from um the the extension install so it does it does work you guys we've already raised Five thousand four hundred and ninety dollars. Uh, or wait, let me update it. Maybe we've raised more by now. Yeah, we still we've raised five and a half thousand dollars. So make sure to use that extension, you guys. Once again, ten dollars will be donated on your behalf, and you're just entering the raffle for free to win that trip to Hawaii, or you know to have a chance of winning ten thousand dollars. So just getting an extension to to winning uh, ten thousand dollars. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Yeah. All right. So what do we have? Hikaru is thinking he has lost that pawn. He has played Rook F8 and the pawn is captured. So, okay. White has accomplished something, obviously. Now he has to figure out how to protect that bishop of his. And yeah, that's when you suggested the move queen G4, right? To offer up the queen trade, which I think makes sense, you know? The only thing is like, I honestly feel bad for anyone who has to suffer in these kinds of positions, you know? It's not a lot of fun guys when you only play for one result, right? But okay, professional chess players, they have to do that. You gotta su sometimes suffer out those bad positions and pull out the draws even if it takes you, you know, seven hours. Hopefully he's gonna be able to do that. He does have a little time edge built up on the clock that could be useful. Uh, somewhere down the line. Right now we're in the second time control. And after this, after these, uh, you know, 40 minutes for Hikaru, 27 minutes for Fabi, they're going to go down to 15 minutes. And that will be the final time control of the game uh, where they get 15 minutes, but 50, uh, 30 seconds per move on, on every move. Indeed. So let's see. So Queen C4 has just been played by Fabiano. So we're considering Queen G4, right, to take the queens off the board. But maybe, I mean, there is Queen E1, right? And you still defend everything that might, I mean, and here it's tough. Like, what do we do? Because why does this idea of going Rook D3 to G3? Oh, look at that amazing picture. There's a Hikaru in the pineapple shirt. Did you guys see him on the video? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah, that's a nice video watching Hikaru. Ah, there we go, sitting next to Fabiano. And I wonder what an event that was from. That must have been like some kind of a Grand Swiss. 
that he was in. Right, yeah, and no, I, I think so too. Um... Yeah. By the way, guys, we know you got some concerns there about uh, about the extent uh, the extension on the browser that it's like taking your personal data and sharing it. Um, but we have confirmed that they never sell personal data, um, and you know it's a it's a reputable company that has more than six million downloads, and your data is not sold. So you know that should. Uh, you know, uh, be a little a point that uh, assuages your concerns. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you guys don't have to be worried, worried about that. Uh, yeah, I should mention it has 6 million downloads, so it's very reputable, and you guys can be um, uh, one of those people. Um, and yeah, it will just give you guys a chance to enter the raffle for free and support a, uh, a, and support a charity. Yeah, and the charity is Games for Love, right? Benjamin, mm -hmm. Games for Love. That's what we're supporting yeah. here. Um, so Hikaru has played Queen H6. He hasn't offered up the Queen trade. And well, okay. Um, White certainly has a lot of moves here. He's up a pawn, has a lot of choices about how to go about this. Hmm. I suppose one thing that white can't do is try to win the b7 pawn because if white gets a little too greedy, goes knight e7, tries to take on b7. Um, I think we go king g7 here, yeah. Right. And then you can't take on b7 because there's queen e3. So there is a bit of play against the king. When I say a bit of play, it looks like we actually got checkmate and one coming right, up. Yeah. So that would be a nice outcome, but you know that's not likely to happen. Uh, White's queen is really good centralized on e4, but it does just show that white, you know, really needs that queen in the center and won't be taking it out of there anytime soon. So what about this move rookie one? How are we dealing with that? Yeah, that is a good question. That would hit the bishop. I mean, I don't think we should take, although, yeah, it looks tough, but then what do we do with the bishop, right? Like, Let's say we take, I mean, we can still hide on H8, right? And that's not the end of the world, I would think. Yeah, you can't bring in your rook yet. Uh, but okay, let's say you check. Where do we go? Because the problem is if you go queen f6, this pretty much loses by force. Because white just takes, gives a check, goes rook e7, and is either going to get a winning pawn game or a rook end game up to pawn. So you would have to go, say, king g8 but i don't know if that's really what uh, you want to do yeah um king g8 and so then i was thinking is there rookie three because i was thinking the idea of queen d4 check benjamin is to kind of like allow the rook to go to e3 have it be protected by the queen and then there's no checks and yeah, you know, this seems very annoying because you know not only are you down a pawn but you're also getting attacked Right, yeah, that seems like a nasty move. What if I go, let's say, queen f4? Right, because here, if you're taking rook e8, I still have king f7. I'm mean, barely hang on. Yeah, barely hanging on, but if queen c3 threatening rook g3, then you only have one check on f1, and that kind of ends, right? And mm -hmm. king is like, you're threatening basically mates with rook g3. And with queen f2, you also go king h2, and there's uh, no, yeah, there's no good checks because queen h4 gets met by rook h3. So this rook e3 move is really annoying. Indeed, yeah. Um, I don't know, it's looking tough. Let's see whether Fabiano will go for rook e1. Yeah, the idea is that if white goes here, then we have this check, and all of a sudden we have a perpetual. But white is, of course, not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, he can also just move the knight, right? And this is also not fun. We're just down a pawn. This is under attack. And we don't really have any threats or ideas here. Yeah, they want to go any... rook d6 here, rook d6 after knight e3. But he played, right, he he rookie played rook e1. One. Yeah, he's going for the forcing move. He just, because the problem is the bishop has no good moves, right? Like there's so many issues with knight e7. 
check, so you can't really go to F5. You can't go to C8. Um, can you go to D7? Okay, let's go to D7. I mean, maybe no. Look, E3 to G3 is an idea. Yeah. Man, that's, that is looking miserable. Mm. I'm getting a little sad here. Yeah. I don't like where this is going, you know? Yeah, it's looking tough for uh, Hikaru, I would say. Um, I don't know. I don't really see what he uh, should do. I mean, I guess he has to take the knight, but that feels like it should be lost because I can always take on b7 as well. Yeah, so like, right, like, let's say this happens. You know, King H8. I mean, if white takes here, white should also be winning, right? I mean, it's yep. two clean pawns, just two pawns, and your king is still more open than white's king. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, guys, they're playing a lot of games. They're playing, uh, let's do a trivia question. Do you guys know how many games they're playing in this tournament? Let's see if you're following the format of the event. Um, some of you guys want Hikaru to come on if, in case he loses to explain his, uh, explain his moves. Um, it's very, very kind of you. Yes. 14 games. Very good. It's really a yeah. long tournament guys. You don't have that many chess tournaments these days with 14 games. So the candidates is the only one like that. You know, it's just, you know, because just testifying to its importance, right. That you're getting the eight, uh, some of the best players in the world, top eight, who've qualified and uh, they kind of play 14 games against each other for a right to play. Uh, is it, it's less than, is it, was it 14 game match the last world championship, Benjamin? Yeah. Because it used to be 12, yeah. right. But then they made it a little bit more. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, basically it has the same number of games as the world championship match, right? It's a very long event. Um, and so, okay. One game doesn't mean anything. But, you know, I think Hikaru will definitely feel disappointed, you know, uh, based on the position that he had in this game, because things were, were going very well for him at some point. Um, so he's going to need to recover if things don't go his way. It looks like, it looks like he has lost. Uh, oh, no, he hasn't lost that pawn. That was just our analysis. Yeah. So he's still thinking about what to do after rookie one. Yeah, looks uh, looks tough. Uh, ask. Yeah, I feel like yeah, his problems really started with that short castle. I mean, his king is still wide open, right? That's that's really been the main problem of the entire game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like I me mean, moving the bishop just seems lost. Um, and as we said, I think the easiest way to win here for white is just to take this pawn. I don't know. If rook f7 is even a move or if it loses on the spot, it feels like it should, but I don't see it. Because rook f1, we have check and a draw. So you could give a check. I go king up. Check. I block. Check here. Maybe here. And wherever you go, like if you go here, it's got to be something nasty. And if you go to g6 or rookie six. Yeah. Well, you know, white has some work to do, but basically kind of just looking for ways to hunt down the king. It's um, right. It's the task. People um, are asking, is this resignable? Well, he card would probably like would easily hold a draw against most of the, of the shadows here. It's too early to say that. I mean, I feel like resigning here is too early. Yeah. But uh, white is probably winning. Yeah. No, it doesn't make sense at all to resign at this point. Like, white can still make a mistake. Um, but it's, it's, it's getting into a pretty critical phase for Hikaru. So um, let's take a look at, I'm just laughing because I saw, you know, someone commenting in the chat, like that he, he found this common funny that Hikaru would hold a draw against the chatters. Yeah, I mean, probably in, in most positions, right? Like you can 
give him down a piece that probably he, he would hold. Um, but, and even commentators, well, maybe, I don't know. I think Benjamin, we got a pretty decent chance of winning this position as white, if I, if I do say so. Uh, yeah myself you know but um but yeah no there's still some work to be done so he's not going to be resigning at this point it would be very strange if he did um let's take a look at duda versus report where are they going in that game mm -hmm. uh by the way in the meantime hikaru uh has made a move he played rook to d8 now i mean 97 f Five is an option. You hit this, you hit the queen. But yeah, we'll go to the game shorter. But let's have, like, at the very least, white can take, take, uh, take, and rook b6. And to me, that looks like a completely winning endgame. But that's the one option he has. But maybe he has better in the form of 97 check, king. You have to go king here. Then knight f5. I think if you trade it's probably lost so can we get away with something like queen here or oh there's rook f1 okay so how does white win this one yeah rook f1 looks pretty good yeah it's kind of an obvious move yeah but yeah the problem is the very easy queen takes e6 to me also looks completely winning for white right how, right here, queen takes where we're. Oh, you mean this well, one? This yeah, position, no, I yeah. actually think he. I think he will go for this knight e seven. I think. I mean, you're right that it looks winning, but I think he's actually going to be more maximalist about it. And yeah, yeah. He went knight e seven. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is not he good. He wants to go for the kill. Like he doesn't want some long drawn out rook ends game. Yeah, king of seven only move, and then knight of five just looks crushing. Uh, the Crooked Rook says, tragic, all the prep and build up and to put in this performance in game one, he definitely doesn't care. Okay, I would I would really disagree. I think, guys, you know, you know, it's built into a chess player's blood to care, right? Like, I mean, like when you sit down at the board, like even no matter kind of what you've been doing, like maybe you've been streaming more, whatever, studying less. I'm sure he prepared for this tournament. Um, but there's no way that like these top players – uh, don't care, right? So just because, you know, the game hasn't worked out for you doesn't mean that you're not trying or not taking the event seriously. I, I feel like, you know, just like anyone in this tournament, he, he's going to have the same, you know, desire to win. And so if he didn't care, I mean, he wouldn't even show up there. Why would you, right? Yeah, indeed. So um, I'm sure that Hikar, of course, does, uh, does care about the, about the event. Um, I mean, people are saying that because it's a it's a meme that's literally more than a year old by now, and it's not. I mean, people who keep saying that just don't have any, just have bad humor. I mean, it's already a year old. I mean, come on, come on, chat, come on, chatters. Yeah, he's a streamer first. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I don't understand the meme. That's right. I, I don't understand. Um, well, there's a game. Uh, it was like in I think April 2021 when he played. Uh, Eric Hansen, and towards the end of the game, they got into a time scramble. There was a bit of confusion. Like Eric offered, no, it Hikaru offered a draw. No, it Eric offered a draw. Hikaru missed it because you know they're mo moving pieces fast. And then Eric offered one, and he missed it, or Hikaru offered one, and at the end Hikaru flagged, and then he said uh, that he didn't care. And but it's already a year old. I mean, come on, you guys. Mm hmm. Okay, there we go. I think we've established that Hikaru cares. And, yeah. You know, I would be, I would be like, a uh, sad. You know, <laughs> if like that was the case that there was a player in the candidates tournament that doesn't care about how he does. I mean, just kind of sad for the game of chess. But that's not, that's not the case. Um, all right. So some people were asking if like Hikaru mouse slipped with the move castles. And just to make things clear, guys, this is not an online tournament. I know you're used to seeing Hikaru play online. This is an in-person tournament. You can see it there uh, uh, in the in the video feed. Like he's playing, Hikaru uh, is playing Fabiano in person in Madrid, and they're playing in some really nice venue there. Um, kind of looks mm -hmm. like uh, like some sort of a palace-looking structure, although you can't really tell um, from just seeing them at the board. But yeah, it's a very nice place in Madrid. And what else shall we talk about? 
Benjamin. Um, um. As <laughs> this game is going, yeah. So it's actually gone in that direction. Knight of five, queen of six, and now just rook f1, right? That's what we were talking about. Yeah, and I don't see move here for black because you're devastating, you're threatening a devastating discovery with the knight. I mean, king e8 is definitely not a move. Um, and rook f1 has just been played. And if you go king g8, the win is pretty straightforward. You want to give a discovery with a knight. So first you give a check here, and if the king steps to the h file, you give another check. And then eventually you get knight h6 and just win the entire house. So this position, I would say is resignable. I don't see a move here. Yep. Yeah, it's getting to that part where like the suffering may end. Right, he goes bishop d5. Okay, so how does white win this? So knight h6, you gotta go to g7, queen g4, queen g6, probably like knight f5, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, nasty. Then, and queen H4 if winning. you go uh -huh. here, then yeah. yeah, yeah, you're just losing every single piece here. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, he's and that chick is pretty straightforward, I would say. So it's not looking good. Yeah, it's not. Uh, shall we take a look at like what's going on in the to do the report? I've been trying to steer that way, you know. Um, it actually, white got their bishop out from a6, so there's been some changes. Uh, black is, is up a pawn now. White has the bishops. He managed to escape, although he can't really push a6 so easily. So mm -hmm. how does he get that pawn going? I mean, I guess he wants to go maybe like bishop e3 and then just a6. Yeah, it looks tough. I mean, I guess, yeah, we just draw the bishop back, then go a6, a7, and... Black has this majority over here, but it seems really difficult to get these pawns going, I think. Yeah, you need to be more careful as black, right? Um, yeah. yeah. I like this idea of bishop f4. That's actually pretty smart, like not letting bishop e3 happen. And mm -hmm. also with some ideas of bishop d2. This actually makes sense. Right. Bishop d2, and you make the king go to some kind of worry square. So I think... Um, Yeah, I'm just looking at Hikaru's position and yeah, it's, it's going down, you know, that path that we were talking about. So it's probably going to be over in a couple of moves. Yeah, I would say here after Queen G4, it's it's probably resignable because Queen G6 and out of five is so trivial. Um, yeah. So, and yeah, there is the resignation. So yeah, Fabiano wins the first uh, round against Hikaru. A very tough start, but as you mentioned before, it is a long tournament, so he's still has all the chance in the world to come back. Yep, 13 more games, you know? So hopefully yeah. he will, um, you know, just keep his king more safe in the future games. And yeah. I mean, I like the way he was playing the opening and the middle game. It was all quite good. And then it somehow just started to go downhill after um, he made the wrong decision about about king safety, you know, and it was ironic, but the king was actually going to be safer going into the center than castling in this game. And that was really the, like the key moment of the game. Um, and the game was really promising up until that point. Like he had Fabi under pressure for sure. And then he just let have, let white have too easy of an, of a life, you know, and got into a position without much counterplay. Yeah, no tough. Uh, yeah. It's really, um, yeah, I'm still quite surprised. It looked like he was playing a good game, but it, it was really this move, short castles, that pretty much surprised everyone. We thought, you know, any other move, um, like even King D7 or H4, and Black should be completely fine. But here's really where his problem started, and they never got sold. He, Fabiano never let him uh, off. Uh, uh, um, sorry. He never let him off the hook. And yeah, we will see whether he Hikaru will join us for an interview uh, right now, we, uh, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, we will see. I mean, I know when I lose, I don't like to show up for interviews, Benjamin, uh, just try to like, you know, get out of there and, um, start, start the recovery process, but, you know, let's see if Hikari feels any differently. We would certainly be happy to see him, but it would be, 
very understandable if he decides to join us on a different day. Um, Mm -hmm. Chess players tend to take losing quite hard. How do you deal with losses, Benjamin? Uh, It's tough. It's tough because, like, the tough thing about losing is that uh, the thing is you've not, like, normally, let's say you have a bad day, right? Sometimes you have a bad day because you haven't gotten anything out of a day, right? Like, the day went by, you, you didn't do anything. But now, like, because you lose your, your life in a way, actually becomes worse because you lose rating. And so that is always the very tough part about losing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, I would say, you know, for some people, losing is like a, like a mini death, you know? Right. That's what it is, right? If you, we understand that, like, chess uh, mirrors life, then losing in chess, like, it mirrors uh, kind of like it's the ultimate defeat, right? And I mean, thankfully, chess players have many games, but at the moment that it happens to you, that's what it feels like. And that's why chess players take it so difficult uh, in such a difficult way. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not really exaggerating, guys. And I think I'm, I don't know if I'm telling you anything new. Like most chess players don't just, uh, you know, see chess as a board game or, you know, like, you know, where they play. And if it doesn't work out, oh, well, you know, a lot, a lot of chess players, especially the top players, take chess, uh, losing a chess really hard. And um, and you don't need time for, to recover just psychologically from the blow of like all those hours of effort that eventually don't um, don't uh, pan out. Right. And kind of you have lots of regrets, you know, oh, I should have played that move and had a good position and I spoiled it. Like there's a lot to deal with. Um, so does Hikaru have a mindset coach? Um, I you know recently talked to another top player uh, or maybe not even a top player, a friend of a top player. And they were talking about how they were like trying to convince them to, to get like a psychologist or someone to work with uh, before some important event. But, um, but the, but the player was like resistant to that, you know, that, you know, it's like, it's hard to try something new. I think in the chess world, it's not such a common thing, right. To, for, for the players to work with like, uh, you know, this kind of outside professionals. Right. Yeah, because it's often that people who don't play chess, they don't know anything about it. It's quite rare to find someone that isn't in the chess world, but actually does understand how things work. I would mm-hmm. say. Yeah, it's very hard to find someone who understands how devastating it is to lose at chess. <laughs> if they haven't played, if they haven't played themselves, yeah. Yeah. They just, they don't see, they don't see like why there's so much pain involved. I mean, it's just a loss, right? It's just a, yeah. okay, you lost a game, but yeah, it can feel very bad. Um, and, you know, when you, like someone mentioned, like, you know, that the streaming kind of balances out Hikaru's perspective. I mean, I agree with that. I definitely agree that having another thing, um, another important kind of thing in your life um, will partially take the sting of losing at least it's it's something that can um allow you to trick yourself into not feeling as bad which i think is valuable and certainly i've used that myself right like you know you you got the brain looks for anything you know to make it psychologically easier to accept losing so if you got to tell yourself like well you know everything else in my life is good and i've got my my streaming and my whatever for me it's my coaching and um you know maybe you're personal life is good, you know, your health is good. I mean, you will use any of those things to like get yourself out of that bad feeling of losing. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned at the moment, it, it does it does hurt, right? Because uh, when you play a classical game, you're really putting everything you have for like four or five hours into that game and then you lose, right? So it, it just, it's, uh, it's tough. Yeah. It's interesting. We're getting, we're having like discussion with our chat. Like some of our chat thinks that it's, uh, I mean, maybe they know Hikaru better than we do. I don't know. Like they, they're thinking he's not going to be too upset. You know Um, maybe I'm looking at it too much from like a chess player's perspective. Right. Like, right. I mean, we'll see, we'll ask Hikaru, but uh, one day, hopefully we'll talk to him on a day where he is, uh, is going to be feeling better. Did NYU have a chess team when you were there, Irina? Okay, so NYU had a chess team. And uh, for one semester, I was actually on the chess team with 
my friend Jennifer Shahadi, who's going to be commenting uh, later this week on the tournament. Um, and we went to the like the National College Chess Championship, where we actually performed pretty well, given that we were uh, helped out by like two fairly beginner players. And uh, we did have some matches where we upset stronger teams. But, you know, we didn't we didn't win because our team didn't have enough depth. But I think that was the only time um, I went and played for the team, you know, when when Jennifer was there as well. Oh, wait, sorry. You guys uh, you guys played collegiate chess for what team did you guys yeah, play? NYU and New York University. Like, oh, okay, you know, nice. Jennifer's a bit older than me. And she was like in her final semester when I first started college. And um, yeah, I, I actually delayed going to college for a year, like after high school. Um, so she was about to finish and I was just starting and, you know, at that point we were, um, you know, together there for a short time. Uh huh. So, uh, and you guys did make it to the final four, right? We didn't make that's it to the final said. four. Oh. Yeah, we didn't make it. That's right. The team didn't have enough depth to do that, but we did right. have a pretty decent showing. And I think we enjoyed, uh, playing together. Yeah. So do I take it from a personal or objective standpoint when I lose? Huh? Oh, I mean. I don't take it personal and I don't know. It's just, uh, I don't know. It just hurts. And sometimes you just feel like an idiot because you've done something like after this game, Hikaru is going to be like, why, why the F did I go short castles, right? His position was completely fine. Yeah. His mindset getting into this tournament was not to win, but just to play chess in the first place. Okay. I mean, that's, that's probably what, I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing to say, right? I just want to play chess. Um, you know, it's just hard for a chess player to be any, any different. I mean, I think for a competitive person, and I, and I feel like Hikaru is, uh, you know, he's got that kind of killer instinct, right? Mm -hmm. And so usually when you're of that profile, when you got the killer profile, like, you know, like Kasparov and Carlson, and I would say Hikaru, right? When you're of that type, I don't know how you can take it so calmly, you know, but maybe you, maybe you mellow out with age. Um, so. Yeah, no, that is definitely a thing, I guess. Um, but yeah, someone just said in the, in the chat that, you know, you put so much into it that you expect to get something out of it, but instead you don't gain anything, but you lose. So it's, yeah. 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 Well, you know, I'll tell you my my personal sadness, you know, that Hikaru is not going to be playing in the Olympiad for the U.S. team. You know, I mm -hmm. really wanted I really wanted him, you know, to be there and playing again. I mean, he's played so many Olympiads now, but um, maybe uh, maybe you guys know more about why he decided not to play. Uh, in India, it's coming up next month. Um, well, I will, he's, mm -hmm. he said on one of his streams that playing for the Olympic team would pay less than winning the Rep Chess Championship. And if you win the Rep Chess Championship, yeah, uh, you would get seven and a half thousand dollars. So he was saying it was less than that. Yeah, well, that's true. But, you know, um, I agree that monetarily for someone like Hikaru, it... Um, you know, he doesn't need to play in something like the Olympiad. I totally agree with that. But just for the point of view of playing for the team, I mean, the Olympiad is a special event. You play for your country, try to get a medal. It's, um, you know, um, I mean, the U.S. won a medal in 2016 for the first time in many years. Unfortunately, I can't say that it, you know, did a lot for chess in America, right? Like, you feel like if other countries did it, it would really... Uh, spur the growth of the sport in their country in America is like it made no difference at all I mean chess is pretty popular I would say in America anyway um, but unfortunately the, like these kinds of big things like the, the the team winning the gold medal like it really didn't make much of an impact um, on anyone outside of chess um, which is which is a little sad right because it was like an event that happened for the first time in decades it was a pretty big deal um, mm -hmm. and but, you know, I feel like the main the main point of the Olympiad is really the the team aspect of it, just playing for your country. And it's, it's a it's a also like a kind of reunion of sorts. Right. You like meet all your 
friends and competitors like that you've been playing with and some of them you haven't seen in a long time. So there's definitely a big social element to it as well. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I will, uh, I will also be playing the Olympia, but for me, it's also like not that I'm playing, let's say for the money or anything. It's just, yeah, it's nice to play for your country to play such a prestigious event like the Olympia. And uh, yeah, hopefully maybe we have a chance of, of doing well, and maybe get a medal or something. So who, what is your team going to be like, Benjamin? Uh, so it's probably going to be, uh, so it's not 100% confirmed yet, but it's probably going to be Anish Giri, Jordan Van Verreist, Aaron Lamy, myself, and uh, Max Varmadon. Well, that's a very good team. I mean, certainly, you know, you guys are going to be competitive with the best teams. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I mean, is that like the best Dutch team? Well, I mean, Holland has a strong chess tradition, right? So right. There were other teams, which I'm sure with Timon and, you know, Van Wiele and Jeroen Piquet that must have also been very good. How is Jeroen Piquet these days, by the way? Uh, well, so actually, I believe he, uh, so he was, yeah, really one of the top players, but he completely retired in 2002 when he started to work for, um, I don't know if you know his name, his name is Van Oostrom. Yes. He, um he was the big sponsor of those Amber tournaments in Monaco and a lot of other tournaments in the Netherlands, but he started working for him. And uh, yeah, that's when he retired. And now I think uh, he's not really uh, yeah, connected uh, with, he's not really in the chess world anymore. Yeah, that's, it's always interesting when someone, you know, really leaves the chess world. It's, it's a fairly rare occurrence, you know, guys, for someone to become that high level of a player and then to just completely drop out of the world of chess that they have very limited connections, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not talking about just playing less and becoming a teacher, but like for someone to really just kind of uh, step away from it. You know, there's not that many right. people that have done it. I think because it's hard, you know, you got chess in your blood, you want to stay connected. Um, and Indeed. wow. By the way, guys, we're going on a break and Hikaru is going to be coming to join us. That is big news. He's really being a good sport about it. And we're going to look forward to talking to him, guys, in just a few minutes.
And welcome back, everyone, to the FIDE Candidates Tournament in Madrid. And we are joined here by Hikaru. Hikaru, um, what are your first thoughts after the game? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's very disappointing, to to put it simply. I mean, I played uh, one one really bad move. I mean, maybe not really bad, but I played one bad move. And, uh, I mean, it cost me the game. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not happy about it. Obviously, Castling Kings, I was a big mistake. Um I mean, probably should have gone King D7 or maybe H4, King D7, pretty much anything except castling. Um, but yeah, after that, I mean, maybe, I mean, for a computer, I'm sure it's still probably holdable, but it was just very, very unpleasant to play. Um, and then I played D5, which I knew was a bad move uh, during the game, but I, I didn't really see anything better to do. So I tried to be active. Um, I mean, Fabiano obviously gave me some chances that he probably shouldn't have. I think like, I mean, he should have just traded Queens and won the game, I think, instead of what he did. But um, but at any rate, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it was one move and so obviously, uh, yeah, I'm not, not very happy. Was King D7 on your radar during the game, Hikaru? Yeah, I mean, actually I, I was, when Fabiano played B3, I thought it was very weird. So I thought he would play like A4, or B4 or specifically to stop King D7. Um, and then he played this B3 move and yeah, for some reason, I just got scared that after King D7, there was going to be some Knight C4 with like Queen A7 or like Rook D1. I mean, I think it's probably nothing, nothing special, but I got a little bit scared and then I castled and I just completely underestimated this whole F3 idea with uh, the knight going to G3 or E3. And I mean, yeah, I mean, after Queen G7 takes Rook D1, probably I should like trade Rooks or go Rook F6 or something. Uh, and it's still, I mean, it's still only a little bit worse, but it's still, but it is much easier for white to play nonetheless. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's just uh, unfortunate. Um, you know, I, I think probably, uh, I, I wish I wish I could take it back because ev everything kind of was going my way. I was up a lot of time on the clock, and I mean, I had a pretty decent position. And of course, I had dodged Fabiano's preparation, but yeah, it wasn't meant to be. It happens. Yeah, we yeah. kind of had a feeling you you know you would be disappointed by the game because it really was going quite nicely for you, and you played the opening and middle game quite well to set yourself up for something interesting, and then it just kind of went. Um, went downhill after castles but you know Hikaru oh do you want to say something mm -hmm. no 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 that's fine I mean I, <laughs> I was just gonna say I mean yeah it's it's one move it's, it's one yeah. move I mean ba basically I, I had already been, already been playing very unusual I guess you could say like it wasn't it wasn't standard sort of play and then I decided to try to be normal with castles um as a perfect example of where trying to then go back to doing something that looks fundamentally right was was completely wrong so yeah yeah that's what it is though Nikar, right. we want to thank you, you know, for coming to talk to us after this tough game. You know, your fans really support you and, and love you. And, we, we, you know, we just want to wish you all the best for the rest of the, the games. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't seen anything. Obviously, I literally came right back uh, just just to, to join. Um, like I, I said, I, I said I would. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's, it's very disappointing. Um, at the end of the day, it is a very long tournament, though. Uh, there are 14 rounds. So, you know, at least at least it's a new day tomorrow. And I think, you know, if there's anything I would say is that in the previous one that I played in 2016, uh, I think I lost very early in that one as well. Maybe it was like round two or maybe round three. I, I know it was very early at any rate. Um, but, you know, in the later on in the turn, I had a couple of wins. So again, it's a long turn. Anything can happen. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating because I got pretty much all that I could have asked for uh, from the start, all, all things being considered. But at the end of the day, everyone's very strong here. I do think as, as well, uh, having not played over the board in quite a while, I was a little bit too sort of relaxed in a sense. I felt too much like I thought I could do almost anything and I, I couldn't do anything in, in, the, in the game. So yeah, it's a tough game, but you, you move on. Right, and tomorrow you will you will be playing uh, Rajabov with the white pieces. What is sort of your uh, how are you looking forward to that game? Um, well, I mean, obviously, I'll just try to relax after after this game today. Certainly, um, I mean, I, I didn't see Timur's game. I thought I thought he was going to win at some point, but I guess now it's most likely going to be a draw. Um, I mean, he's a strong player. Also, played him a lot of times. Uh, you just try to go and play a good game, and and that's that. Um, not not much more to it. Hikaru, okay. do you have someone with you in Madrid? I mean, if you if you don't mind telling us, are you? I yeah, I mean, person? of course, of course, I uh, of course I have my my trainer here, obviously. Um, so yeah, he's here helping me. Uh, but yeah, that that's about it. So just just chilling, and uh, we'll 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 see see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Also, Hikaru, I uh, yeah, we've raced uh today like almost five and a half thousand dollars for charity what do you want to say to all the people who've been uh, supportive and donated 
Yeah, I think it's it's amazing. Uh, you know, last year we we did a lot of things charity related uh, in 20, 2021 uh, to sort of get getting back to it. I mean, it's it's great to raise raise money for uh, I think it's Games for Love is what we're raising money for five thousand dollars, a lot of money. Uh, obviously, we're doing this throughout the whole tournament. Um, and you know, I think I was I was gonna say something else. You know, it was funny during the uh, opening ceremony last night. Someone asked me. Uh, they said, "Are you getting tired of this whole streaming thing and and all those other things?" And I think when you look at what we've done with the charity alone, I mean that vastly uh, that vastly outweighs anything anything else that I've done chess wise, frankly. So uh, you know, it's it's great to see the support from the community, and we have a long long way to go. So uh, looking forward to raising a lot more a lot of more money uh, along the way as well. Thanks. Thank you, Hikaru. So we'll uh, we'll wish you a good night and good luck tomorrow. We'll be rooting for you. Thanks. Have a good one, you guys. Thank yep. you. Right. Good luck.